This audio presentation of the Master Key System by Charles F. Hanel is produced by Lost Classics on MP3. Copyright 2008. All rights reserved. Introduction. Nature compels us all to move through life. We could not remain stationary however much we wished. Every right-thinking person wants not merely to move through life like a sound-producing, perambulating plant, but to develop to improve and to continue the development mentally to the close of physical life. This development can occur only through the improvement of the quality of individual thought and the ideals, actions, and conditions that arise as a consequence. Hence, a study of the creative processes of thought and how to apply them is of supreme importance to each one of us. This knowledge is the means whereby the evolution of human life on earth may be hastened and uplifted in the process. Humanity ardently seeks the truth and explores every avenue to it. In this process it has produced a special literature, which ranges the whole gamut of thought from the trivial to the sublime, up from divination through all the philosophies to the final lofty truth of the Master Key. The Master Key is here given to the world as a means of tapping the great cosmic intelligence and attracting from it that which corresponds to the ambitions and aspirations of each reader. Every thing and institution we see around us, created by human agency, had first to exist as a thought in some human mind. Thought, therefore, is constructive. Human thought is the spiritual power of the cosmos operating through its creature man. The master key instructs the reader how to use that power, and use it both constructively and creatively. The things and conditions we desire to become realities we must first create in thought. The master key explains and guides the process. The master key teaching up to this point has been published in the form of a correspondence course of 24 lessons, delivered to students one per week for 24 weeks. The reader who now receives the whole 24 parts at one time is warned not to attempt to read the book like a novel, but to treat it as a course of study, and to conscientiously to imbibe the meaning of each part, reading and rereading one part only per week, before proceeding to the next. Otherwise, the later parts will tend to be misunderstood, and the reader's time and money will be wasted. Used thusly instructed, the master key will make of the reader a greater, better personality, and equipped with a new power to achieve any worthy personal purpose and a new ability to enjoy life's beauty and wonder. F. H. Burgess Forward Some men seem to attract success, power, wealth, attainment, with very little conscious effort. Others conquer with great difficulty. Still others fail altogether to reach their ambitions, desires, and ideals. Why is this so? Why should some men realize their ambitions easily, others with difficulty, and still others not at all? The cause cannot be physical, else the most perfect man physically would be the most successful. The difference, therefore, must be mental, must be in the mind. Hence, mind must be the creative force, must constitute the sole difference between men. It is mind, therefore, which overcomes environment and every other obstacle in the path of men. When the creative power of thought is fully understood, its effect will be seen to be marvelous. But such results cannot be secured without proper application, diligence, and concentration. The student will find that the laws governing in the mental and spiritual world are as fixed and infallible as those in the material world. To secure the desired results, then, it is necessary to know the law and to comply with it. A proper compliance with the law will be found to produce the desired results with invariable exactitude. The student who learns that power comes from within, that he is weak only because he is dependent on help from the outside, and who hesitantly throws himself on his own thought, instantly rights himself, stands erect, assumes a dominant attitude, and works miracles. It is evident, therefore, that he who fails to fully investigate and take advantage of the wonderful progress which is being made in this last and greatest science will soon be as far behind as the man who refused to acknowledge 
and accept the benefits which have accrued to mankind through an understanding of the laws of electricity. Of course, mind creates negative conditions just as readily as favorable conditions. And when we consciously or unconsciously visualize every kind of lack, limitation, and discord, we create these conditions. This is what many are unconsciously doing all the time. This law, as well as every other law, is no respecter of persons, but is in constant operation and is relentlessly bringing to each individual exactly what he has created. In other words, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Abundance, therefore, depends upon a recognition of the laws of abundance, and the fact that mind is not only the creator, but the only creator of all there is. Certainly nothing can be created before we know that it can be created, and then make the proper effort. There is no more electricity in the world today than there was fifty years ago. But until someone recognized the law by which it could be made of service, we received no benefit. Now that the law is understood, practically the whole world is lit by it. So with the law of abundance, it is only those who recognize the law and place themselves in harmony with it who share in its benefits. The scientific spirit now dominates every field of effort. Relations of cause and effect are no longer ignored. The discovery of a region of law marked an epoch in human progress. It eliminated the element of uncertainty and caprice in men's life and substituted law, reason, and certitude. Men now understand that for every result there is an adequate and definite cause, so that when a result is desired, they seek the condition by which alone this result may be obtained. The basis upon which all law rests was discovered by inductive reasoning, which consists in comparing a number of separate instances with one another until the common factor which gives rise to them all is seen. It is this method of study to which the civilized nations owe the greater part of their prosperity and the more valuable part of their knowledge. It has lengthened life, it has mitigated pain, it has spanned rivers, it has brightened the night with the splendor of day, extended the range of vision, accelerated motion, annihilated distance, facilitated intercourse, and enabled men to descend into the sea and into the air. What wonder, then, that men soon endeavored to extend the blessing of this system of study to their method of thinking, so that when it became plainly evident that certain results followed a particular method of thinking, it only remained to classify these results. This method is scientific, and it is the only method by which we shall be permitted retain the degree of liberty and freedom which we have accustomed to look upon as an inalienable right. Because a people is safe at home and in the world only if national preparedness means such things as growing surplus of health, accumulated efficiency in public and private business of whatever sort, continuous advance in science and art of bringing together, and the increasing dominant endeavor to make all of these and all other aspects of national development center and revolve about ascending life, single and collective, for which science, art, and ethics furnish guidance and controlling motives. The master key is based on absolute scientific truth and will unfold the possibilities that lie dormant in the individual and teach them how they be brought into powerful action to increase the person's effective capacity, bringing added energy, discernment, vigor, and mental elasticity. The student who gains an understanding of the mental laws which are unfolded will come into the possession of an ability to secure results hitherto undreamed of, and which has rewards hardly to be expressed in words. It explains the correct use of both the receptive and active elements of the mental nature, and instructs the students in the recognition of opportunity. It strengthens the will and reasoning powers, and teaches the cultivation and best use of imagination, desire, the emotions, and the intuitional faculty. It gives initiative, tenacity of purpose, wisdom of choice, intelligent sympathy, and a thorough enjoyment of life on its higher planes. The master key teaches the use of mind power, true mind power, 
not only of the substitutes and perversions, it has nothing to do with hypnotism, magic, or any of the more or less fascinating deceptions by which many are led to think that something can be had for nothing. The master key cultivates and develops the understanding which will enable you to control the body and thereby the health. It improves and strengthens the memory. It develops insight, the kind of insight which is so rare, the kind which is the distinguishing characteristic of every successful businessman, the kind which enables men to see the possibilities as well as the difficulties in every situation, the kind which enables men to discern opportunity close at hand, for thousands fail to see opportunities almost within their grasp, while they are industriously working with situations which under no possibility can be made to realize any substantial return. The master key develops mental power, which means that others instinctively recognize that you are a person of force, of character, that they want to do what you want them to do. It means that you attract men and things to you, that you are what some people call lucky, that things come your way, that you have come into the understanding of the fundamental laws of nature and have put yourself in harmony with them, that you are in tune with the infinite, that you understand the law of attraction, the natural laws of growth and the psychological laws of which all advantages in the social and business world rest. Mental power is creative power. It gives you the ability to create for yourself. It does not mean the ability to take something away from somewhere else. Nature never does things that way. Nature makes two blades of grass grow where one grew before and mind power enables men to do the same thing. The master key develops insight and sagacity, increased independence, the ability and disposition to be helpful. It destroys distrust, depression, fear, melancholy, and every form of lack, limitation and weakness, including pain and disease. It awakens buried talent, supplies initiative, force, energy, vitality, it awakens an appreciation of the beautiful in art, literature, and science. There is a change in the thought of the world. This change is silently transpiring in our midst, and is more important than any which the world has undergone since the downfall of paganism. The present revolution, in the opinion of all classes of men, the highest and most cultured of men, as well as those of the laboring class, stands unparalleled in the history of the world. Science has of late made such vast discoveries, has revealed such an infinity of resources, has unveiled such enormous possibilities and such unsuspected forces, that scientific men more and more hesitate to affirm certain theories as established and indubitable, or to deny certain other theories as absurd or impossible. And so a new civilization is being born. Customs, creeds, and cruelty are passing, Vision, faith, and service are taking their place. The fetters of tradition are being melted off from humanity, and as the dross of materialism is being consumed, thought is being liberated, and truth is rising full-orbed before an astonished multitude. The whole world is on the eve of a new consciousness, a new power, and a new consciousness, a new power, and a new realization of the resources within the self. It has changed the lives of thousands of men and women by substituting definite principles for uncertain and hazy methods, and principles for the foundation upon which every system of efficiency must rest. Albert Gary, the chairman of United States Steel Corporation, said, The services of advisors, instructors, efficiency experts, and successful management are indispensable to most business enterprises but I deem the recognition and adoption of right principles vastly more important. The master key teaches right principles and suggests methods for making a practical application of the principles. In that it differs from every other course of study, it teaches that the only possible value which can attach to any principle is in its application. Many read books, take home study courses, attend lectures all their lives without ever making any progress in demonstrating the value of the principles involved. The master key suggests methods by which the value of the principles taught may be demonstrated and put into actual practice in the daily experience. The last century saw the most magnificent material progress in history. 
the present century will produce the greatest progress in mental and spiritual power. Physical science has resolved matter into molecules, molecules into atoms, atoms into energy, and it has remained for Sir Ambrose Fleming in an address before the Royal Institution to resolve this energy into mind. He says, in its ultimate essence, energy may be incomprehensible by us except as an exhibition of the direct operation by that which we call mind or will. Let us see what are the most powerful forces in nature. In the mineral world, everything is solid and fixed. In the animal and vegetable kingdom, it is in a state of flux, forever changing, always being created and recreated. In the atmosphere, we find heat, light, and energy. Each realm becomes finer and more spiritual as we pass from the visible to the invisible, from the coarse to the fine, from the low potentiality to high potentiality. When we reach the invisible, we find energy in its purest and most volatile state. And as the most powerful forces of nature are the invisible forces, so we find that the most powerful forces of man are his invisible force, his spiritual force. And the only way in which a spiritual force can manifest is through the process of thinking. Thinking is the only activity which the spirit possesses, and thought is the only product of thinking. Addition and subtraction are therefore spiritual transactions. Reasoning is a spiritual process. Ideas are spiritual conceptions. Questions are spiritual searchlights, and logic, argument, and philosophy is spiritual machinery. Every thought brings into action certain physical tissues, parts of the brain, nerve, or muscle. This produces an actual physical change in the construction of the tissue. Therefore, it is only necessary to have a certain number of thoughts on a given subject in order to bring about a complete change in the physical organization of a man. This is the process by which failure is changed into success. Thoughts of courage, power, inspiration, harmony, are substituted for thoughts of failure, despair, lack, limitation, and discord. And as these thoughts take root, the physical tissue is changed, and the individual sees life in a new light. All things have actually passed away. All things have become new. He is born again, this time born of the Spirit. Life has a new meaning for him. He is reconstructed and is filled with joy, confidence, hope, and energy. He sees opportunities for success to which he was heretofore blind. He recognizes possibilities which before had no meaning for him. The thoughts of success with which he was impregnated are radiated to those around him, and they in turn help him onward and upward. He attracts to him new and successful associates, and this in turn changes his environment, so that by this simple exercise of thought, a man changes not only himself, but his environment circumstances and conditions. You will see, you must see, that we are at the dawn of a new day, that the possibilities are so wonderful, so fascinating, so limitless as to be almost bewildering. A century ago, any man with a Gatling gun could have annihilated a whole army equipped with the implements of warfare then in use. So it is at present. Any man with the knowledge of the possibilities contained in the master key has an inconceivable advantage over the multitude. End of introduction. Introduction to Part 1 It is my privilege to enclose herewith Part 1 of the Master Key System. Would you like to bring into your life more power, obtain the power consciousness, manifest better health, get the health consciousness, more happiness, live the spirit of these things until they become yours by right, it will then become impossible to keep them from you. The things of the world are fluid to a power within man by which he rules them. You need not acquire this power, you already have it. But you want to understand it, and you want to use it. You want to control it. You want to impregnate yourself with it, so that you can go forward and carry the world with you. Day by day as you go on, as you gain momentum, as your inspiration deepens, as your plans crystallize, as you gain understanding, you will come to realize that this world is no dead pile of stones and timber, but that it is a living thing. It is made up of the beating hearts of humanity. It is a thing of life and beauty. It is evident that it requires understanding to work with material of this description. 
But those who come into this understanding are inspired by a new light, a new force. They gain confidence and greater power each day. They realize their hopes and their dreams come true. Life has a deeper, fuller, clearer meaning than ever before. And now, Part 1. Part 1. That much gathers more is true on every plane of existence, and that loss leads to greater loss is equally true. Mind is creative, and conditions, environment, and all experiences in life are the result of our habitual or predominant mental attitude. The attitude of mind necessarily depends upon what we think. Therefore, the secret of all power, all achievement, and all possession depends upon our method of thinking. This is true because we must be before we can do, and we can do only to the extent which we are, and what we are depends upon what we think. We cannot express powers that we do not possess. The only way by which we may secure possession of power is to become conscious of power, and we can never become conscious of power until we learn that all power is from within. There is a world within, a world of thought and feeling and power, of light and life and beauty, and although invisible, its forces are mighty. The world within is governed by mind. When we discover this world, we shall find the solution for every problem, the cause for every effect. And since the world within is subject to our control, all laws of power and possession are also within our control. The world without is a reflection of the world within. What appears without is what has been found within. In the world within may be found infinite wisdom, infinite power, infinite supply of all that is necessary, waiting for unfoldment, development, and expression. If we recognize these potentialities in the world within, they will take form in the world without. Harmony in the world within will be reflected in the world without by harmonious conditions, agreeable surroundings, the best of everything. It is the foundation of health and a necessary essential to all greatness, all power, all attainment, all achievements, and all success. Harmony in the world within means the ability to control our thoughts and to determine for ourselves how any experience is to affect us. Harmony in the world within results in optimism and affluence. Affluence within results in affluence without. The world without reflects the circumstances and the conditions of the consciousness within. If we find wisdom in the world within, we shall have the understanding to discern the marvelous possibilities that are latent in this world within, and we shall be given the power to make these possibilities manifest in the world without. As we become conscious of the wisdom in the world within, we mentally take possession of this wisdom. And by taking mental possession, we come into actual possession of the power and wisdom necessary to bring into manifestation the essentials necessary for our most complete and harmonious development. The world within is the practical world in which the men and women of power generate courage, hope, enthusiasm, confidence, trust, and faith by which they are given the fine intelligence to see the vision and the practical skill to make the vision real. Life is an unfoldment, not accretion. What comes to us in the world without is what we already possess in the world within. All possession is based on consciousness. All gain is the result of an accumulated consciousness. All loss is the result of a scattering consciousness. Mental efficiency is contingent upon harmony. Discord means confusion. Therefore, he who would acquire power must be in harmony with natural law. We are related to the world without by the objective mind. The brain is the organ in this mind, and the cerebral spinal system of nerves puts us in conscious communication with every part of the body. The system of nerves responds to every sensation of light, heat, odor, sound, and taste. When this mind thinks correctly, when it understands the truth, when the thoughts sent through the cerebrospinal nervous system to the body are constructive, these sensations are pleasant and harmonious. The result is that we build strength, 
vitality, and all constructive forces into our body. But it is through this same objective mind that all distress, sickness, lack, limitation, and every form of discord and inharmony is admitted into our lives. It is therefore through the objective mind, by wrong thinking, that we are related to all destructive forces. We are related to the world within by the subconscious mind. The solar plexus is the organ of this mind. The sympathetic system of the nerves presides over all subjective sensations such as joy, fear, love, emotion, respiration, imagination, and all other subconscious phenomena. It is through the subconscious that we are connected with the universal mind and brought into relation with the infinite constructive forces of the universe. It is the coordination of these two centers of our being and the understanding of their functions which is the great secret of life. With this knowledge we can bring the objective and subjective minds into conscious cooperation and thus coordinate the finite and the infinite. Our future is entirely within our own control. It is not at the mercy of any capricious or uncertain external power. All agree that there is but one principle or consciousness pervading the entire universe, occupying all space, and being essentially the same in kind at every point of its presence. It is all powerful, all wisdom, and always present. All thoughts and things are within itself. It is all in all. There is but one consciousness in the universe able to think, and when it thinks, its thoughts become objective things to it. As this consciousness is omnipresent, it must be present with every individual. Each individual must be a manifestation of that omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent consciousness. As there is only one consciousness in the universe that is able to think, it necessarily follows that your consciousness is identical with the universal consciousness. Or, in other words, all mind is one mind. There is no dodging this conclusion. The consciousness that focuses in your brain cells is the same consciousness which focuses in the brain cells of every other individual. Each individual is but the individualization of the universal, the cosmic mind. The universal mind is static or potential energy. It simply is. It can manifest only through the individual, and the individual can manifest only through the universal. They are one. The ability of the individual to think is his ability to act on the universal and bring it into manifestation. Human consciousness consists only in the ability of man to think. Mind in itself is believed to be a subtle form of static energy from which arises the activities called thought, which is the dynamic phase of mind. Mind is static energy. Thought is dynamic energy. The two phases of the same thing. Thought is therefore the vibratory force formed by converting static mind into dynamic mind. As the sum of all attributes are contained in the universal mind, which is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, these attributes must be present at all times in their potential form in every individual. Therefore, when the individual thinks, the thought is compelled by its nature to embody itself in an objectivity or condition which will be correspond with its origin. Every thought, therefore, is a cause and every condition an effect. For this reason, it is absolutely essential that you control your thoughts so as to bring forth only desirable conditions. All power is from within and is absolutely under your control. It comes through exact knowledge and by the voluntary exercises of exact principles. It should be plain that when you acquire a thorough understanding of this law and are able to control your thought processes, you can apply it to any condition. In other words, you will have come into conscious cooperation with omnipotent law, which is the fundamental basis of all things. The universal mind is the life principle of every atom which is in existence. Every atom is continually striving to manifest more life. All are intelligent and all are seeking to carry out the purpose for which they were created. A majority of mankind lives in the world without. Few have found the world within. 
and yet it is the world within that makes the world without. It is therefore creative, and everything which you find in your world without has been created by you in the world within. This system will bring you into a realization of power, which will be yours when you understand this relation between the world without and the world within. The world within is the cause, the world without the effect. To change the effect, you must change the cause. You will at once see that this is a radically new and different idea. Most men try to change effects by working with effects. They fail to see that this is simply changing one form of distress for another. To remove discord, we must remove the cause, and this cause can be found only in the world within. All growth is from within. This is evident in all nature. Every plant, every animal, every human is a living testimony to this great law, and the error of the ages is in looking for strength or power from without. The world within is the universal fountain of supply, and the world without is the outlet to the stream. Our ability to receive depends upon our recognition of this universal fountain, this infinite energy, of which each individual is an outlet, and so is one with every other individual. Recognition is a mental process. Mental action is therefore the interaction of the individual upon the universal mind. And as the universal mind is the intelligence which pervades all space and animates all living things, this mental action and reaction is the law of causation. But the principle of causation does not obtain in the individual but in the universal mind. It is not an objective faculty but a subjective process, and the results are seen in an infinite variety of conditions and experiences. In order to express life, there must be mind. Nothing can exist without mind. Everything which exists is some manifestation of this one basic substance from which and by all things have been created and are continually being recreated. We live in a fathomless sea of plastic mind substance. This substance is ever alive and active. It is sensitive to the highest degree. It takes form according to the mental demand. Thought forms the mold or matrix from which the substance expresses. Remember that it is in the application alone that the value consists, and that a practical understanding of this law will substitute abundance for poverty, wisdom for ignorance, harmony for discord, and freedom for tyranny. And certainly there can be no greater blessing than these from a material and social standpoint. Now make the application. Select a room where you can be alone and undisturbed. Sit erect, comfortably, but do not lounge. Let your thoughts roam where they'll be perfectly still from 15 minutes to a half an hour. Continue this for three or four days or for a week until you secure full control of your physical being. Many will find this extremely difficult. Others will conquer with ease. But it is absolutely essential to secure complete control of the body before you are ready to progress. Next week you will receive instructions for the next step. In the meantime, you must have mastered this one. End of Part 1 Introduction to Part 2 Our difficulties are largely due to confused ideas and ignorance of our true interests. The great task is to discover the laws of nature to which we are to adjust ourselves. Clear thinking and moral insight are, therefore, of incalculable value. All processes, even those of thought, rest on solid foundations. The keener the sensibilities, the more acute the judgment, the more delicate the taste, the more refined the moral feelings, the more subtle the intelligence, the loftier the aspiration, the purer and more intense are the gratifications which existence yields. The powers, uses, and possibilities of the mind under the new interpretations are incomparably more wonderful than the most extravagant accomplishments or even dreams of material progress. Thought is energy. Active thought is active energy. Concentrated thought is a concentrated energy. Thought concentrated on a definite purpose becomes power. This is the power which is being used by those who do not believe in the virtue of poverty or the beauty of self-denial. They perceive that this is the talk of weaklings. 
The ability to receive and manifest this power depends upon the ability to recognize the infinite. Energy ever dwelling in man, constantly creating and recreating his body and mind, and ready at any moment to manifest through him in any needful manner. In exact proportion to the recognition of this truth will be the manifestation in the outer life of the individual. Part 2 explains the method by which this is accomplished. Part 2 The operations of the mind are produced by two parallel modes of activity, the one conscious and the other subconscious. Professor Davidson says, He who thinks to illuminate the whole range of mental action by the light of his own consciousness is not unlike the one who should go about to illuminate the universe with a candle. The subconscious's logical processes are carried on with a certainty and regularity which would be impossible if there existed the possibility of error. Our mind is so designed that it prepares for us the most important foundations of cognition whilst we have not the slightest apprehension of the modus operandi. The subconscious soul, like a benevolent stranger, works and makes provisions for our benefit, pouring only the mature fruit into our lap. Thus, ultimate analysis of thought processes show that the subconscious is the theater of the most important mental phenomena. It is through the subconscious that Shakespeare must have perceived, without effort, great truths which are hidden from the conscious mind of the student, that Phidias fashioned marble and bronze, that Raphael painted Madonnas, and Beethoven composed symphonies. Ease and perfection depend entirely upon the degree in which we cease to depend upon the consciousness. Playing the piano, skating, operating the typewriter, the skill trades, depend for their perfect execution on the process of the subconscious mind. The marvel of playing a brilliant piece on the piano, while at the same time conducting a vigorous conversation, shows the greatness of our subconscious powers. We are all aware how dependent we are upon the subconscious, and the greater, the nobler, the more brilliant our thoughts are, the more it is obvious to ourselves that the origin lies beyond our ken. We find ourselves endowed with tact, instinct, sense of the beautiful in art, music, etc., or whose origin or dwelling place we are wholly unconscious. The value of the subconscious is enormous. It inspires us. It warns us. It furnishes us with names, facts, and scenes from the storehouse of memory. It directs our thoughts, tastes, and accomplishes tasks so intricate that no conscious mind, even if it had the power, has the capacity for. We can walk at will. We can raise the arm whenever we choose to do so. We can give our attention through eye or ear to any subject at pleasure. On the other hand, we cannot stop our heartbeats nor the circulation of the blood, nor the growth of stature, nor the formation of nerve and muscle tissues, nor the building of the bones, nor many other important vital processes. If we compare these two sets of action, the one decreed by the will of the moment, and the other proceeding in a majestic, rhythmic course, subject to no vacillation but constant at every moment, we stand in awe of the latter, and ask to have the mystery explained. We see at once that these are the vital processes of our physical life, and we cannot avoid the inference that these all-important functions are designedly withdrawn from the domain of our outward will with its variations and transitions, and placed under the direction of a permanent and dependable power within us. Of these two powers, the outward and changeable has been termed the conscious mind, or the objective mind, dealing with outward objects. The interior power is called the subconscious mind, or the subjective mind, and besides its work on the mental plane, it controls the regular functions which make physical life possible. It is necessary to have a clear understanding of their respective functions on the mental plane, as well as on certain other basic principles. Perceiving and operating through the five physical senses, the conscious mind deals with the impressions and objects of the outward life. It has the faculty of discrimination, carrying with it the responsibilities of choice. It has the power of reasoning, whether inductive, deductive, analytical, or syllogistic, and this power may be developed to a high degree. It is the seat of the will with all the energies that flow therefrom. Not only can it impress other minds, but it can direct the subconscious mind. 
In this way, the conscious mind becomes the responsible ruler and guardian of the subconscious mind. It is this high function which can completely reverse conditions in your life. It is often true that conditions of fear, worry, poverty, disease, in harmony, and evils of all kinds dominate us by reason of false suggestions accepted by the unguarded subconscious mind. All this the trained conscious mind can entirely prevent by its vigilant protective action. It may properly be called the watchman at the gate of the great subconscious domain. One writer has expressed the chief distinction between the two phases of mind thusly. Conscious mind is reasoning will. Subconscious mind is instinctive desire, the result of past reasoning will. The subconscious mind draws just and accurate inferences from premises furnished from outside sources. Where the premise is true, the subconscious mind reaches a faultless conclusion, but where the premise or suggestion is an error, the whole structure falls. The subconscious mind does not engage in the process of proving. It relies upon the conscious mind, the watchman at the gate, to guard it from mistaken impressions. Receiving any suggestions is true, the subconscious mind at once proceeds to act therein, in the whole domain of its tremendous field of work. The conscious mind can suggest either truth or error. If the latter, it is at the cost of wide-reaching peril to the whole being. The conscious mind ought to be on duty during every waking hour. When the watchman is off guard, or when its calm judgment is suspended under a variety of conditions, then the subconscious mind is unguarded and left open to suggestion from all sources. During the wild excitement of panic, or during the height of anger, or the impulse of the irresponsible mob, or at any other time of unrestrained passion, the conditions are most dangerous. The subconscious mind is then open to the suggestion of fear, hatred, selfishness, greed, self-deprecation, and other negative forces, derived from surrounding persons or circumstances. The result is usually unwholesome in the extreme, with effects that may endure to distress it for a long time. Hence the great importance of guarding the subconscious mind from false impressions. The subconscious mind perceives by intuition. Hence its processes are rapid. It does not wait for the slow methods of conscious reasoning. In fact, it cannot employ them. The subconscious mind never sleeps, never rests, any more than does your heart or your blood. It has been found that by plainly stating to the subconscious mind certain specific things to be accomplished, forces are set into operations that lead to the results desired. Here then is a source of power which places us in touch with omnipotence. Herein is a deep principle which is well worth our most earnest study. The operation of this law is interesting. Those who put it into operation find that when you go out to meet the person with whom they anticipate a difficult interview, something has been there before them and dissolved the supposed differences. Everything is changed. All is harmonious. They find that when some difficult business problem presents itself, they can afford to make delay and something suggests the proper solution. Everything is properly arranged. In fact, those who have learned to trust the subconscious find that they have infinite resources at their command. The subconscious mind is the seat of our principles and our aspirations. It is the fount of our artistic and altruistic ideals. These instincts can only be overthrown by an elaborate and gradual process of undermining the innate principles. The subconscious mind cannot argue controversially. Hence, if it has accepted wrong suggestions, the sure method of overcoming them is by the use of a strong counter-suggestion, frequently repeated, which the mind must accept, thus eventually forming new and healthy habits of thought in life, for the subconscious mind is the seat of habit. That which we do over and over becomes mechanical. It is no longer an act of judgment, but has worn its deep grooves into the subconscious mind. This is favorable for us if the habit be wholesome and right. If it be harmful and wrong, the remedy is to recognize the omnipotence of the subconscious mind and suggest present actual freedom. The subconscious being creative and one with our divine source will at once create the freedom suggested. 
To sum up, the normal functions of the subconscious on the physical side have to do with the regular and vital processes, with the preservation of life and the restoration of health, with the care of offspring which includes an instinctive desire to preserve all life and improve conditions generally. On the mental side, it is a storehouse of memory. It harbors the wonderful thought messengers who work unhampered by time or space. It is the fountain of the practical initiative and constructive forces of life. It is the seat of habit. On the spiritual side, it is the source of ideals, of inspiration, of the imagination, and is the channel through which we recognize our divine source. And in proportion as we recognize this divinity, do we come into an understanding of the source of power. Some may ask, how can the subconscious change conditions? The reply is, because the subconscious is a part of the universal mind, and a part must be the same in kind and quality as a whole. The only difference is one of degree. The whole, as we know, is creative. In fact, it is the only creator there is. Consequently, we find that mind is creative, and as thought is the only activity which the mind possesses, thought must necessarily be creative also. But we shall find that there is a vast difference between simply thinking and directing our thought consciously, systematically, and constructively. When we do this, we place our mind in harmony with the universal mind. We come in tune with the infinite. We set in operation the mightiest force in existence, the creative power of the universal mind. This, as everything else, is governed by natural law, and this law is the law of attraction which is what mind is creative and will automatically correlate with its object and bring it into its manifestation. Last week I gave you an exercise for the purpose of securing control of the physical body. If you have accomplished this you are ready to advance. This time you will begin to control your thought. Always take the same room, the same chair, and the same position if possible. In some cases, it is, if it is not convenient to take the same room, in this case simply make the best use of such conditions as may be available. Now be perfectly still as before, but inhibit all thought. This will give you control over all thoughts of care, worry, and fear, and will enable you to entertain only the kind of thoughts you desire. Continue this exercise until you gain complete mastery. You will not be able to do this for more than a few moments at a time, but the exercise is valuable, because it will be a very practical demonstration of the great number of thoughts which are constantly trying to gain access to your mental world. Next week, you will receive instructions for an exercise which may be a little more interesting, but it is necessary that you master this one first. Quote, Cause and effect is as absolute and undeviating in the hidden realm of thought as in the world of visible and material things. Mind is the master weaver, both of the interior garment of character and the outer garment of circumstances. Unquote. James Allen. End of Part 2 Introduction to Part 3 You have found that the individual may act on the universal and that the result of this action and interaction is cause and effect. Thought, therefore, is the cause, and the experiences with which you meet in life are the effect. Eliminate, therefore, any possible tendency to complain of conditions as they have been, or as they are, because it rests with you to change them and make them what you would like them to be. Direct your effort to a realization of the mental resources, always at your command, from which all real and lasting power comes. Persist in this practice until you have come to a realization of the fact that there can be no failure in the accomplishment of any proper object in life if you but understand your power and persist in your object. Because the mind forces are ever ready to lend themselves to a purposeful will. In the effort to crystallize thought and desire into actions, events, and conditions. Whereas in the beginning of each function of life and each action is the result of conscious thought, the habitual actions become automatic and the thought that controls them passes into the realm of the subconscious. Yet it is just as intelligent as before. It is necessary that it becomes automatic or subconscious in order that the self-conscious mind may attend to other things. The new actions will, however, in their turn become habitual, then automatic, then subconscious, in order that the mind again may be freed from this detail 
and advance to still other activities. When you realize this, you will have found a source of power which will enable you to take care of any situation in life which may develop. Part 3 the necessary interaction of the conscious and subconscious mind requires a similar interaction between the corresponding system of nerves. Judge Troward indicates the very beautiful method in which this interaction is affected. He says, The cerebral spinal system is the organ of the conscious mind, and the sympathetic is the organ of the subconscious. The cerebral spinal is the channel through which we receive conscious perceptions from the physical senses and exercise control over the movements of the body. This system of nerves has its center in the brain. The sympathetic system has its center in a ganglionic mass at the back of the stomach known as the solar plexus and is the channel of that mental action which unconsciously supports the vital actions of the body. The connection between the two systems is made by the vagus nerve which passes out of the cerebral region as the portion of the voluntary system to the thorax, sending out branches to the heart and lungs, and finally passing through the diaphragm. It loses its outer coating and becomes identified with the nerves of the sympathetic system, so forming a connected link between the two and making man physically a single entity. We have seen that every thought is received by the brain, which is the organ of the conscious. It is here subjected to our power of reasoning. When the objective mind has been satisfied that the thought is true, it is sent to the solar plexus, or the brain of the subjective mind, to be made into our flesh, to be brought forth into the world as a reality. It is then no longer susceptible to any argument whatever. The subconscious mind cannot argue, it only acts. It accepts the conclusions of the objective mind as final. The solar plexus has been likened to the sun of the body because it is a central point of distribution for the energy which the body is constantly generating. This energy is very real energy, and this sun is a very real sun, and the energy is being distributed by very real nerves to all parts of the body, and is thrown off in an atmosphere which envelops the body. If this radiation is sufficiently strong, the person is called magnetic. He is said to be filled with personal magnetism. Such a person may wield an immense power for good, his presence alone will often bring comfort to the troubled minds with which he comes into contact. When the solar plexus is in active operation and is radiating life, energy, and vitality to every part of the body and to everyone whom he meets, the sensations are pleasant. The body is filled with health and all with whom he comes in contact experience a pleasant sensation. If there is any interruption of this radiation, the sensations are unpleasant. The flow of life and energy to some part of the body is stopped, and this is the cause of every ill to the human race, physical, mental, or environmental. Physical because the sun of the body is no longer generating sufficient energy to vitalize some part of the body. Mental because the conscious mind is dependent upon the subconscious mind for the vitality necessary to support its thought. And environmental because the connection between the subconscious mind and the universal mind is being interrupted. The solar plexus is the point at which the part meets with the whole, where the finite becomes infinite, where the uncreate becomes create, the universal becomes individualized, the invisible becomes visible. It is the point at which life appears and there is no limit to the amount of life any individual may generate from this solar center. This center of energy is omnipotent because it is the point of contact with all life and all intelligence. It can therefore accomplish whatever it is directed to accomplish, and herein lies the power of the conscious mind. The subconscious can and will carry out such plans and ideas as may be suggested to it by the conscious mind. Conscious thought, then, is the master of this sun center from which the life and energy of the entire body flows and the quality of the thought which we entertain determines the quality of the thought which this sun will radiate. And the character of the thought which our conscious mind entertains will determine the character of the thought which this sun will radiate. And the nature of the thought which our conscious mind entertains will determine the nature of thought which this sun will radiate, and consequently will determine the nature of the experience which will result. 
It is evident, therefore, that all we have to do is to let our light shine. The more energy we can radiate, the more rapidly shall we be enabled to transmute undesirable conditions into sources of pleasure and profit. The important question, then, is how to let this light shine, how to generate this energy. Non-resistant thought expands the solar plexus. Resistant thought contracts it. Pleasant thought expands it. Unpleasant thought contracts it. Thoughts of courage, power, confidence, and hope all produce a corresponding state. But the one arch enemy of the solar plexus which must be absolutely destroyed before there is any possibility of letting any light shine is fear. This enemy must be completely destroyed. He must be eliminated. He must be expelled forever. He is the cloud which hides the sun, which causes a perpetual gloom. It is this personal devil which makes men fear the past, the present, and the future. Fear themselves, their friends, and their enemies. Fear everything and everybody. When fear is effectually and completely destroyed, your light will shine. The clouds will disperse, and you will have found the source of power, energy, and life. When you find that you are really one with the infinite power, and when you can consciously realize this power by a practical demonstration of your ability to overcome any adverse condition by the power of your thought, you will have nothing to fear. Fear will have been destroyed, and you will have come into possession of your birthright. It is our attitude of mind toward life which determines the experiences which we were to meet. If we expect nothing, we shall have nothing. If we demand much, we shall receive the greater portion. The world is harsh only as we fail to assert ourselves. The criticism of the world is bitter only to those who cannot compel room for their ideas. It is fear of this criticism that causes many ideas to fail to see the light of day. But the man who knows that he has a solar plexus will not fear criticism or anything else. He will be too busy radiating courage, confidence, and power. He will anticipate success by his mental attitude. He will pound barriers to pieces and leap over the chasm of doubt and hesitation which fear places in his path. A knowledge of our ability to consciously radiate health, strength, and harmony will bring us into a realization that there is nothing to fear because we are in touch with infinite strength. This knowledge can be gained only by making practical application of this information. We learn by doing. Through practice, the athlete comes powerful. As the following statement is of considerable importance, I will put it in several ways, so that you cannot fail to get the full significance of it. If you are religiously inclined, I would say you can let your light shine. If your mind has a bias towards physical science, I would say you can wake the solar plexus. Or if you prefer the strictly scientific interpretation, I will say that you can impress your subconscious mind. I have already told you what the result of this impression will be. It is the method in which you are now interested. You have already learned that the subconscious is intelligent and that it is creative and responsive to the will of the conscious mind. What, then, is the most natural way of making the desired impression? Mentally concentrate on the object of your desire. When you are concentrating, you are impressing the subconscious. This is not the only way, but it is a simple and effective way and the most direct way, and consequently the way in which the best results are secured. It is the method which is producing such extraordinary results that many think that miracles are being accomplished. It is the method by which every great inventor, every great financier, every great statesman has been enabled to convert the subtle and invisible force of desire, faith, and confidence into actual, tangible, concrete facts in the objective world. The subconscious mind is a part of the universal mind. The universal is the creative principle of the universe. A part must be the same in kind and quality as the whole. This means that this creative power is absolutely unlimited. It is not bound by precedent of any kind, and consequently has no prior existing pattern by which to apply its constructive principle. We have found that the subconscious mind is responsive to our conscious will. 
which means that the unlimited creative power of the universal mind is within control of the conscious mind of the individual. When making a practical application of this principle, in accordance with the exercise given in the subsequent lessons, it is well to remember that it is not necessary to outline the method by which the subconscious will produce the results you desire. The finite cannot inform the infinite. You are simply to say what you desire, not how you are to obtain it. You are the channel by which the undifferentiated is being differentiated, and this differentiation is being accomplished by appropriation. It only requires recognition to set causes in motion which will bring about results in accordance with your desire. And this is accomplished because the universal can act only through the individual, and the individual can act only through the universal. They are one. For your exercise this week, I will ask you to go one step farther. I want you not only to be perfectly still and inhibit all thought as far as possible, but relax, let go. Let the muscles take their normal condition. This will remove all pressure from the nerves and eliminate that tension which so frequently produces physical exhaustion. Physical relaxation is a voluntary exercise of the will, and the exercise will be found to be of great value, as it enables the blood to circulate freely to and from the brain and the body. Tensions lead to mental unrest and abnormal mental activity of the mind. It produces worry, care, fear, and anxiety. Relaxation is therefore an absolute necessity in order to allow the mental faculties to exercise the greatest freedom. Make this exercise as thorough and complete as possible. Mentally determine that you will relax every muscle and nerve until you feel quiet and restful and at peace with yourself and the world. The solar plexus will then be ready to function and you will be surprised at the result. End of part three. Introduction to Part 4 Enclosed herewith, I hand you Part 4. This part will show you why what you think or do or feel is an indication of what you are. Thought is energy, and energy is power, and it is because all the religions, sciences, and philosophies with which the world has heretofore been familiar have been based upon the manifestation of this energy instead of the energy itself that the world has been limited to effects while causes have been ignored or misunderstood. For this reason we have God and the devil in religion, positive and negative in science and good and bad in philosophy. The master key reverses the process. It is interested only in cause, and the letters received from students tell a marvelous story. They indicate conclusively that students are finding the cause whereby they may secure for themselves health harmony, abundance, and whatever else may be necessary for their welfare and happiness. Life is expressive, and it is our business to express ourselves harmoniously and constructively. Sorrow, misery, unhappiness, disease, and poverty are not necessities, and we are constantly eliminating them. But this process of eliminating consists in rising above and beyond limitation of any kind. He who has strengthened and purified his thought need not concern himself about microbes, and he who has come into an understanding of the law of abundance will go at once to the source of supply. It is thus that fate, fortune, and destiny will be controlled as readily as a captain controls a ship, or an engineer his train. Part 4 The eye of you is not the physical body. That is simply an instrument with which the eye uses to carry out its purpose. The eye cannot be the mind, for the mind is simply another instrument which the eye uses with which to think, reason, and plan. The eye must be something which controls and directs both the body and the mind, something which determines what they shall do and how they shall act. When you come into a realization of the true nature of this eye, you will enjoy a sense of power which you have never known before. Your personality is made up of countless individual characteristics, peculiarities, habits, and traits of character. These are the result of your former method of thinking, but they have nothing to do with the real I. When you say, I think, the I tells the mind what it shall think. When you say, I go, the I tells the physical body where it shall go. The real nature of this I is spiritual and is the source of the real power which comes to men and women when they come into a realization of their true nature.
The greatest and most marvelous power which his eye has been given is the power to think. But few people know how to think constructively or correctly. Consequently, they achieve only indifferent results. Most people allow their thoughts to dwell on selfish purposes, the inevitable result of an infantile mind. When a mind becomes mature, it understands that the germ of defeat is in every selfish thought. The trained mind knows that every transaction must benefit every person who is in any way connected with the transaction, and any attempt to profit by the weakness, ignorance, or necessity of another will inevitably operate to his disadvantage. This is because the individual is a part of the universal. A part cannot antagonize any other part, but, on the contrary, the welfare of each part depends upon a recognition of the interest of the whole. Those who recognize this principle have a great advantage in the affairs of life. They do not wear themselves out. They can eliminate vagrant thoughts with faculty. They can readily concentrate to the highest possible degree on any subject. They do not waste time or money upon objects which can be of no possible benefit to them. If you cannot do these things, it is because you have thus far not made the necessary effort. Now is the time to make the effort. The result will be exactly in proportion to the effort expended. One of the strongest affirmations which you can use for this purpose of strengthening the will and realizing your power to accomplish is, I can be what I will to be. Every time you repeat it, realize who and what this I is. Try to come into a thorough understanding of the true nature of the I. If you do, you will become invincible. That is provided that your objects and purposes are constructive and are therefore in harmony with the creative principle of the universe. If you make use of this affirmation, use it continuously, night and morning, and as often during the day as you think of it, and continue to do so until it becomes a part of you, form the habit. Unless you do this, you had better not start at all, because modern psychology tells us that when we start something and do not complete it, or make a resolution and do not keep it, we are forming the habit of failure, absolute ignominious failure. If you do not intend to do a thing, do not start. If you do start, see it through even if the heavens fall. If you make up your mind to do something, do it. Let nothing, no one interfere. The I in you has determined the thing is settled. The die is cast. There is no longer any argument. If you carry out this idea, beginning with small things which you know you can control and gradually increase the effort, but never under any circumstances allow your eye to be overruled, you will find that you can eventually control yourself, and many men and women have found to their sorrow that it is easier to control a kingdom than to control themselves. But when you have learned to control yourself, you will have found the world within, which controls the world without. You will have become irresistible. Men and things will respond to your every wish without any apparent effort on your part. This is not so strange or impossible as it may appear when you remember that the world within is controlled by the I, and that this I is part or one with the infinite I, which is the universal energy or spirit, usually called God. This is not a mere statement or theory made for the purpose of confirming or establishing an idea, but it is a fact which has been accepted by the best religious thought as well as the best scientific thought. Herbert Spender said, Amid all the mysteries by which we are surrounded, nothing is more certain than we are ever in the presence of an infinite and eternal energy from which all things proceed. Lyman Abbott, in an address delivered before the alumni of Bangor Theological Seminary, said, We are coming to think of God as dwelling in man, rather than as operating on men from without. Science goes a little way in its search and stops. Science finds the ever-present eternal energy, but religion finds the power behind this energy and locates it within man. But this is by no means a new discovery. The Bible says exactly the same thing, and the language is just as plain and convincing. Know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God? Here, then, is the secret of the wonderful creative power of the world within. Here is the secret of power, of mastery, 
To overcome does not mean to go without things. Self-denial is not success. We cannot give unless we get. We cannot be helpful unless we are strong. The infinite is not a bankrupt, and we who are the representatives of infinite power should not be bankrupts either. And if we wish to be of service to others, we must have power and more power, but to get it we must give it. We must be of service. The more we give, the more we shall get. We must become a channel whereby the universal can express activity. The universal is constantly seeking to express itself, to be of service, and it seeks the channel whereby it can find the greatest activity, where it can do the most good, where it can be of the greatest service to mankind. The universal cannot express through you as long as you are busy with your plans, your own purposes. Quiet the senses, seek inspiration, focus the mental activity on the within, dwell in the consciousness of your unity with omnipotence. Still water runs deep. Contemplate the multitudinous opportunities to which you have spiritual access by the omnipresence of power. Visualize the events, circumstances, and conditions which these spiritual connections may assist in manifesting. Realize the fact that the essence and soul of all things is spiritual, and that the spiritual is the real, because it is the life of all there is. When the spirit is gone, the life is gone. It is dead. It has ceased to exist. These mental activities pertain to the world within to the world of cause and conditions and circumstances which results are the effect. It is thus that you become a creator. This is important work and the higher, loftier, grander and more noble ideas which you can conceive, the more important the work will become. Overwork or overplay or over bodily activity of any kind produces conditions of mental apathy and stagnation which makes it impossible to do the more important work which results in a realization of conscious power. We should, therefore, seek the silence frequently. Power comes through repose. It is in the silence that we can be still, and when we are still we can think, and thought is the secret of all attainment. Thought is a mode of motion and is carried by the law of vibration the same as light or electricity. It is given vitality by the emotions through the law of love. It takes form and expression by the law of growth. It is a product of the spiritual eye, hence its divine, spiritual, and creative nature. From this it is evident that in order to express power, abundance, or any other constructive purpose, the emotions must be called upon to give feeling to the thought so that it will take form. How may this purpose be accomplished? This is the vital point. How may we develop the faith, the courage, the feeling, which will result in accomplishment? The reply is, by exercise. Mental strength is secured in exactly the same way that physical strength is secured, by exercise. We think something, perhaps with difficulty the first time. We think the same thing again, and it becomes easier this time. We think it again and again. It then becomes a mental habit. We continue to think the same thing. Finally, it becomes automatic. We can no longer help thinking this thing. We are now positive of what we think. There is no longer any doubt about it. We are sure. We know. Last week, I asked you to relax, to let go physically. This week, I am going to ask you to let go mentally. If you practice the exercise given you last week, 15 or 20 minutes a day, in accordance with the instructions, you can no doubt relax physically and anyone who cannot consciously do this quickly and completely is not a master of himself. He has not obtained freedom. He is still a slave to conditions. But I shall assume that you have mastered the exercise and are ready to take the next step, which is mental freedom. This week, after taking your usual position, remove all tension by completely relaxing. Then mentally let go of all adverse conditions, such as hatred, anger, worry, jealousy, envy, sorrow, trouble, or disappointment of any kind. You may say that you cannot let go of these things, but you can. You can do so by mentally determining to do so, by voluntary intention and persistence. The reason that some cannot do this is because they allow themselves to be controlled by the emotions instead of by their intellect. But those who will be guided by the intellect will gain the victory. 
You will not succeed the first time you try, but practice makes perfect in this as in everything else, and you must succeed in dismissing, eliminating, and completely destroying these negative and destructive thoughts because they are the seed which is constantly germinating in discordant conditions of every conceivable kind and description. Quote, there is nothing truer that the quality of thought which we entertain correlates certain externals in the outside world. This is the law from which there is no escape. And it is this law, this correlative of the thought with its object, that from time immemorial has led the people to believe in special providence. Williams. End of Part 4 Introduction to Part 5 Enclosed herewith you will find Part 5. After studying this part carefully, you will see that every conceivable force or object or fact is the result of mind in action. Mind in action is thought, and thought is creative. Men are thinking now as they have never thought before. Therefore, this is a creative age, and the world is awarding its richest prizes to the thinkers. Matter is powerless, passive, inert. Mind is force, energy, power. Mind shapes and controls matter. Every form which matter takes is but the expression of some pre-existing thought. But thought works no magic transformation. It obeys natural laws. It sets in motion natural forces. It releases natural energy. It manifests in your conduct and actions, and thus, in turn, react upon your friends and acquaintances, and eventually upon the whole of your environment. You can originate thought, and since thoughts are creative, you can create for yourself the things you desire. Part 5 At least 90% of our mental life is subconscious, so that those who fail to make use of this mental power live within very narrow limits. The subconscious can and will solve any problem for us if we know how to direct it. The subconscious processes are always at work. The only question is, are we to be simply passive recipients of this activity, or are we to consciously direct the work? Shall we have a vision of the destination to be reached, the dangers to be avoided, or shall we simply drift? We have found that mind pervades every part of the physical body and is always capable of being directed or impressed by authority coming from the objective or the more dominant portion of the mind. The mind which pervades the body is largely the result of heredity, which in turn is simply the result of all the environments of past generations on the responsive and ever-moving life force. An understanding of this fact will enable us to use our authority when we find some undesirable trait of character manifesting. We can consciously use all the desirable characteristics with which we have been provided, and we can repress and refuse to allow the undesirable ones to manifest. Again, this mind which pervades our physical body is not only the result of hereditary tendencies, but is the result of home, business, and social environment, where countless thousands of impressions, ideas, prejudices, and similar thoughts have been received. Much of this has been received from others, the result of opinions, suggestions, or statements. Much of it is the result of our own thinking, but nearly all of it has been accepted with little or no examination or consideration. If either, if either of us were building, building a home for ourselves, ourselves how careful we would be in regard to the plans, how we should study every detail, how we should, how we should watch, watch the material, the material select, select the best of everything, everything. and yet how and careless, how we, are careless we are when it comes to building our mental home, home which is infinitely which more, is important, infinitely than more physical important than any physical home, as everything home. which can possibly enter into our lives depends upon the character of the material which enters into the construction of our mental home. What is the character of this material? 
we have seen that it is the result of the impressions which we have accumulated in the past and stored away in our subconscious mentality. If these impressions have been of fear, of worry, of care, of anxiety, if they have been despondent, negative, doubtful, then the texture of the material which we are weaving today will be the same negative material. Instead of being of any value, it will be mildewed and rotten and will bring us only more toil and care and anxiety. We shall be forever busy trying to patch it up and make it appear at least genteel. But if we have stored away nothing but courageous thought, if we have been optimistic, positive, and have immediately thrown any kind of negative thought on the scrap pile, have refused to have anything to do with it, have refused to associate with it or become identified with it in any way, what then is the result? Our mental material is now the best kind. We can weave any kind of material we want. We can use any color we wish. We know that the texture is firm, that the material is solid, that it will not fade, and we have no fear, no anxiety concerning the future. There is nothing to cover. There are no patches to hide. These are psychological facts. There is no theory or guesswork about these thinking processes. There is nothing secret about them. In fact, they are so plain that everyone can understand them. The thing to do is to have a mental house clean and do this house cleaning every day and keep the house clean. Mental, moral, and physical cleanliness are absolutely indispensable if we are to make progress of any kind. When this mental house cleaning process has been completed, the material which is left will be suitable for making any kind of ideals or mental images which we shall desire to realize. There is a fine estate awaiting a claimant. It's a broad acre with abundant crops, running water, and fine timber. Stretch away as far as the eye can see. There is a mansion, spacious and cheerful, with rare pictures, a well-stocked library, rich hangings, and every comfort and luxury. All the heir has to do is to assert his heirship, take possession, and use the property. He must use it. He must not let it decay. For use is the condition for which he holds it. To neglect it is to lose possession. In the domain of mind and spirit, in the domain of practical power, such an estate is yours. You are the heir. You can assert your heirship and possess and use this rich inheritance. Power over circumstances is one of its fruit. Health, harmony, and prosperity are assets upon its balance sheet. It offers you poise and peace. It costs you only the labor of study and harvesting its great resources. It demands no sacrifice except the loss of your limitation, your servitudes, your weakness. It clothes you with self-honor and puts a scepter in your hands. To gain this estate, three processes are necessary. You must earnestly desire it, you must assert the claim, and you must take possession. You admit that those are not burdensome conditions. You are familiar with the subject of hereditary. Darwin, Huxley, Hackle, and other physical scientists have piled evidence mountain high that hereditary is a law attending progressive creation. It is progressive hereditary which gives man his erect attitude, his power of motion, the organs of digestion, blood circulation, nerve force, muscular force, bone structure, and a host of other faculties on the physical side. There are even more impressive facts concerning hereditary of mind force. All these constitute what may be called your human hereditary. But there is a hereditary which the physical scientists have not compassed. It lies beneath an antecedent to all their researches. At a point where they throw up their hands in despair, saying they cannot account for what they see, this divine hereditary is found in full sway. It is the benignant force which decrees primal creation. It thrills down from the divine, direct into every creative being. It originates life, which the physical scientist has not done, nor ever can do. It stands out among all forces supreme, unapproachable. No human hereditary can approach it. No human hereditary measures up to it. This infinite life flows through you, is you. Its doorways are but the faculties which comprise your consciousness. To keep open these doors is the secret of power. Is it not worth while to make the effort? The great fact is that the source of all life and all power is from within. Persons, circumstances, and events may suggest need and opportunities, but the insight, strength, and power to answer these needs will be found within.
Avoid counterfeits. Build firm foundations for your consciousness upon forces which flow direct from the infinite force, the universal mind of which you are the image and likeness. Those we have come into possession of this inheritance are never quite the same again. They have come into possession of a sense of power heretofore undreamed of. They can never again be timid, weak, vacillating, or fearful. They are indissolubly connected with omnipotence. Something in them has been aroused. They have suddenly discovered that they possess a tremendous, latent ability of which they were heretofore entirely unconscious. This power is from within, but we cannot receive it unless we give it. Use is the condition upon which we hold this inheritance. We are each of us but the channel through which the omnipotent power is being differentiated into form. Unless we give, the channel is obstructed, and we can receive no more. This is true on every plane of existence, in every field of endeavor, in all walks of life. The more we give, the more we get. The athlete who wishes to get strong must make use of the strength he has, and the more he gives, the more he will get. The financier who wishes to make money must make use of the money he has, for only by using it can he get more. The merchant who does not keep his goods going out will soon have none coming in. The corporation which fails to give efficient service will soon lack customers. The attorney who fails to get results will soon lack clients, and so it goes everywhere. Power is contingent upon a proper use of the power already in our possession. What is true in every field of endeavor, every experience in life, is true of the power from which every other power known among men is begotten, spiritual power. Take away the spirit, and what is left? Nothing. If then the spirit is all there is, upon the recognition of this fact must depend the ability to demonstrate all power, whether physical, mental, or spiritual. All possession is the result of the accumulated attitude of mind, or the money consciousness. This is the magic wand which will enable you to receive the idea, and it will formulate plans for you to execute. And you will find as much pleasure in the execution as in the satisfaction of attainment and achievement. Now, go to your room, take the same seat, the same position as before, and mentally select a place which has pleasant associations. Make a complete mental picture of it. See the buildings, the grounds, the trees, friends, associations, everything complete. At first you will find yourself thinking of everything under the sun, except the ideal upon which you desire to concentrate. But do not let that discourage you. Persistence will win. But persistence requires that you practice these exercises every day without fail. End of Part 5 Introduction to Part 6 It is my privilege to enclose Part 6. This part will give you an excellent understanding of the most wonderful piece of mechanism which has ever been created. A mechanism whereby you may create for yourself health, strength, success, prosperity, or any other condition which you desire. Necessities are demands, and demands create action, and actions bring about results. The process of evolution is constantly building our tomorrows out of today's. Individual development, like universal development, must be gradual with an ever-increasing capacity and volume. The knowledge that if we infringe upon the rights of others, we become moral thorns and find ourselves entangled at every turn of the road should be an indication that success is contingent upon the highest moral ideal, which is the greatest good to the greatest number. Aspiration, desire, and harmonious relations constantly and persistently maintained will accomplish results. The greatest hindrance is erroneous and fixed ideas. To be in tune with eternal truth, we must possess poise and harmony within. In order to receive intelligence, the receiver must be in tune with the transmitter. Thought is a product of mind, and mind is creative. But this does not mean that the universal will change its modus operandi to suit us or our ideas, but it does mean that we can come into harmonious relationship with the universal, and when we have accomplished this, we may ask anything to which we are entitled, and the way will be made plain. Part 6 The universal mind is so wonderful that it is difficult to understand its utilitarian powers and possibilities and its unlimited producing effects. We have found that this mind is not only all intelligence, but all substance. How, then, is it to be differentiated in form? 
how are we to secure the effect which we desire? Ask any electrician what the effect of electricity will be, and he will reply that electricity is a form of motion, and its effect will depend upon the mechanism to which it is attached. Upon this mechanism will depend whether we shall have heat, light, power, music, or any of the other marvelous demonstrations of power to which this vital energy has been harnessed. What effect can be produced by thought? The reply is that thought is mind in motion, just as wind is air in motion, and its effect will depend entirely on the mechanism to which it is attached. Here, then, is the secret of all mental power. It depends entirely on the mechanism which we attach. What is this mechanism? You know something of the mechanism which has been invented by Edison, Bell, Marconi, and other electrical wizards, by which place and space and time have become only figures of speech. But did you ever stop to think that the mechanism which has been given you for transforming the universal, omnipresent potential power was invented by a greater inventor than Edison? We are accustomed to examining the mechanism of the implements which we use for tilling the soil, and we try to get an understanding of the mechanism of the automobile which we drive. But most of us are content to remain in absolute ignorance of the greatest piece of mechanism which has ever come into existence, the brain of man. Let us examine the wonders of this mechanism. Perhaps we shall thereby get a better understanding of the various effects of which it is the cause. In the first place, there is the great mental world in which we live, and move, and have our being. This world is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. It will respond to our desire in direct ratio to our purpose and faith. The purpose must be in accordance with the law of our being, that in, it must be creative or constructive. Our faith must be strong enough to generate a current of sufficient strength to bring our purpose into manifestation. As thy faith is, so be it unto thee, bears that stamp of scientific test. The effects which are produced in the world without are the result of the action and reaction of the individual upon the universal. That is the process which we call thinking. The brain is the organ through which this process is accomplished. Think of the wonder of it all. Do you love music, flowers, literature, or are you inspired by the thought of ancient or modern genius? Remember, every beauty to which you respond must have its corresponding outline in your brain before you can appreciate it. There is not a single virtue or principle in the storehouse of nature which the brain cannot express. The brain is an embryonic world, ready to develop at any time as necessity may arise. If you can comprehend that this is a scientific truth and one of the wonderful laws of nature, it will be easier for you to get an understanding of the mechanism by which these extraordinary results are being accomplished. The nervous system has been compared to an electrical circuit with its battery of cells in which force has originated, and its white matter to insulated wires by which the current is conveyed. It is through these channels that every impulse or desire is carried through the mechanism. The spinal cord is the great motor and sensory pathway by which messages are conveyed to and from the brain. Then there is the blood supply, plunging through the veins and arteries, renewing our strength and energy. The perfectly arranged structure upon which the entire physical body rests, and finally the delicate and beautiful skin, clothing the entire mechanism, is a mantle of beauty. This, then, is the temple of the living God, and the individual eye is given control, and upon his understanding of the mechanism which is within his control will the results depend. Every thought sets the brain cells in action. At first, the substance upon which the thought is directed fails to respond, but if the thought is sufficiently refined and concentrated, the substance finally yields and expresses perfectly. This influence of the mind can be exerted upon any part of the body, causing the elimination of any undesired effect. A perfect conception and understanding of the laws governing in the mental world cannot fail to be of inestimable value in the transaction of business, as it develops the power of discernment and gives a clear understanding and appreciation of facts. The man who looks within instead of without cannot fail to make use of the mighty forces which will eventually determine his course in life, and so bring him into vibration with all that is best, strongest, and most desirable. 
Attention or concentration is probably the most important essential in the development of mind culture. The possibilities of attention when properly directed are so startling that they would hardly appear credible to the uninitiated. The cultivation of attention is a distinguishing characteristic of every successful man or woman and is the very highest personal accomplishment which can be acquired. The power of attention can be more readily understood by comparing it with a magnifying glass in which the rays of sunlight are focused. They possess no particular strength as long as the glass is moved about and the rays directed from one place to another. But let the glass be held perfectly still and let the rays be focused on one spot for any length of time. The effect will become immediately apparent. So with the power of thought, let power be dissipated by scattering the thought from one object to another, and no result is apparent. But focus this power through attention or concentration on any single purpose for any length of time, and nothing becomes impossible. A very simple remedy for the very complex situation, some will say. All right, try it. You who have had no experience in concentrating the thought on a definite purpose or object, Choose any single object and concentrate your attention on it for a definite purpose for even ten minutes. You cannot do it. The mind will wander a dozen times and it will be necessary to bring it back to the original purpose. And each time the effect will have been lost and at the end of the ten minutes nothing will be have gained. Because you have not been able to hold your thoughts steadily to the purpose. It is, however, through attention that you will finally be able to overcome obstacles of any kind that appear in your path onward and upward. And the only way to acquire this wonderful power is by practice. Practice makes perfect, in this as in anything else. In order to cultivate the power of attention, bring a photograph with you to the same seat in the same room in the same position as heretofore. Examine it closely at least ten minutes. Note the expression of the eyes, the form of the features, the clothing, the way the hair is arranged. In fact, note every detail shown on the photograph carefully. Now cover it and close your eyes and try and see it mentally. If you can see every detail perfectly and can form a good mental image of the photograph, you are to be congratulated. If not, repeat the process until you can. This step is simply for the purpose of preparing the soil. Next week we shall be ready to sow the seed. It is by such exercises as these that you will finally be able to control your mental moods, your attitude, your consciousness. Great financiers are learning to withdraw from the multitude more and more, that they may have more time for planning, thinking, and generating the right mental moods. Successful businessmen are constantly demonstrating the fact that it pays to keep in touch with the thought of other successful businessmen. A single idea may be worth millions of dollars, and these ideas can only come to those who are receptive, who are prepared to receive them, who are in the successful frame of mind. Men are learning to place themselves in harmony with the universal mind. They are learning the unity of all things. They are learning the basic methods and principles of thinking and this is changing conditions and multiplying results. They are finding that circumstances and environment follow the trend of mental and spiritual progress. They find that growth follows knowledge, action follows inspiration, opportunity follows perception, always the spiritual first, then the transformation into the infinite and illuminable possibilities of achievement. As the individual is but the channel for the differentiation of the universal, these possibilities are necessarily inexhaustible. Thought is the process by which we may absorb the spirit of power and hold the result in our inner consciousness until it becomes a part of our ordinary consciousness. The method of accomplishing this result by the persistent practice of a few fundamental principles as explained in this system is the master key which unlocks the storehouse of universal truth. The two great sources of human suffering at present are both bodily disease and mental anxiety. These may be readily traced to the infringement of some natural law. This is, no doubt, owing to the fact that so far knowledge has largely remained partial, but the clouds of darkness which have accumulated through long ages are beginning to roll away, and with them many of the miseries that attend imperfect information. Quote, that a man can change himself 
improve himself, recreate himself, control his environment, and master his own destiny, is the conclusion of every mind who is wide awake to the power of right thought and constructive action. Unquote. Larson. End of Part 6. Introduction to Part 7. Through all the ages man has believed in an invisible power, through which and by which all things have been created, and are continually being recreated. We may personalize this power and call it God, or we may think of it as the essence or spirit which permeates all things, but in either case the effect is the same. So far as the individual is concerned, the objective, the physical, the visible, is the personal, that which can be cognized by the senses. It consists of body, brain, and nerves. The subjective is the spiritual, the invisible, the impersonal. The personal is conscious because it is a personal entity. The impersonal, being the same in kind and quality as all other being, is not conscious of itself, and has therefore been termed the subconscious. The personal or conscious has the power of will and choice, and can therefore exercise discrimination in the selection of methods whereby to bring about the solution of difficulties. The impersonal or spiritual, being a part or one with the source and origin of all power, can necessarily exercise no such choice, but on the contrary, it has an infinite resource at its command. It can and does bring about results by methods concerning which the human or individual mind can have no possible conception. You will therefore see that it is your privilege to depend upon the human will with all its limitations and misconceptions, or you may utilize the potentialities of infinity by making use of the subconscious mind. Here, then, is the scientific explanation of the wonderful power which has been put within your control. If you but understand, appreciate it, and recognize it. One method of consciously utilizing this omnipotent power is outlined in Part 7. Part 7. Visualization is the process of making mental images, and the image is the mold or model which will serve as a pattern from which your future will emerge. Make the pattern clear and make it beautiful. Do not be afraid. Make it grand. Remember that no limitation can be placed upon you by anyone but yourself. You are not limited as to cost or material. Draw on the infinite for your supply. Construct it to your imagination. It will have to be there before it will ever appear anywhere else. Make the image clear and clean cut. Hold it firmly in the mind and you will gradually and constantly bring the thing near to you. You can be what you will to be. This is another psychological fact which is well known, but unfortunately reading about it will not bring about any result which you may have in mind. It will not even help you to form the mental image, much less bring it into manifestation. Work is necessary, labor, hard mental labor, the kind of effort which so few are willing to put forth. The first step is idealization. It is likewise the most important step because it is the plan on which you are going to build. It must be solid. It must be permanent. The architect, when he plans a 30-story building, has every line and detail pictured in advance. The engineer, when he spans a chasm, first ascertains the strength requirements of a million separate parts. They see the end before a single step is taken. So you are to picture in your mind what you want. You are sowing the seed. But before sowing any seed, you want to know what the harvest is to be. This is idealization. If you are not sure, return to the chair daily until the picture becomes plain. It will gradually unfold. First the general plan will be dim, but it will take shape. The outline will take form, then the details. And you will gradually develop the power by which you will be enabled to formulate plans which will eventually materialize in the objective world. You will come to know what the future holds for you. Then comes the process of visualization. You must see the picture more and more complete. See the detail. And, as the details begin to unfold, the ways and means for bringing it into manifestation will develop. One thing will lead to another. Thought will lead to action. Action will develop methods. Methods will develop friends, and friends will bring about circumstances. And finally, the third step, or materialization, will have been accomplished. We all recognize the universe must have been thought into shape before it ever could have become a material fact. And if we are willing to follow along the lines of the great architect of the universe, we shall find our thoughts taking form. 
just as the universe took concrete form. It is the same mind operating through the individual. There is no difference in kind or quantity. The only difference is one of degree. The architect visualizes his building. He seizes it as he wishes it to be. His thought becomes a plastic mold from which the building will eventually emerge, a high one or a low one, a beautiful one or a plain one. His vision takes form on paper and eventually the necessary material is utilized and the building stands complete. The inventor visualizes his idea in exactly the same manner. For instance, Nikola Telsa, he with the giant intellect, one of the greatest inventors of all ages, the man who has brought forth the most amazing reality, always visualizes his inventions before attempting to work them out. He did not rush to embody them in form and then spend his time in correcting effects. Having first built up the idea in his imagination, he held it there as a mental picture to be reconstructed and improved by his thought. In this way, he writes in the Electrical Experimenter, I am enabled to rapidly develop and perfect a conception without touching anything. When I have gone so far as to embody in the invention every possible improvement I can think of, and see no fault anywhere, I put into concrete, the product of my brain. Invariably my device works as I conceived it should. In twenty years there has not been a single exception. If you can conscientiously follow these directions, you will develop faith the kind of faith that is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You will develop confidence, the kind of confidence that leads to endurance and courage. You will develop the power of concentration which will enable you to exclude all thoughts except the ones which are associated with your purpose. The law is that thought will manifest in form, and only one who knows how to be the divine thinker of his own thoughts can ever take a master's place and speak with authority. Clearness and accuracy are obtained only by repeatedly having the image in mind. Each repeated action renders the image more clear and accurate than the preceding, and in proportion to the clearness and accuracy of the image will the outward manifestation be. You must build it firmly and securely in your mental world, the world within, before it can take form in the world without and you can build nothing of value even in the mental world unless you have the proper material. When you have the material you can build anything you wish, but make sure of your material. You cannot make broadcloth from shoddy. This material will be brought out by millions of silent mental workers and fashioned into the form of the image which you have in mind. Think of it. You have over five million of these mental workers, ready and in active use. Brain cells, they're called. Besides this, there is another reserve force of at least an equal number, ready to be called into action at the slightest need. Your power to think, then, is almost unlimited, and this means that your power to create the kind of material which is necessary to build for yourself any kind of environment which you desire is practically unlimited. In addition to these millions of mental workers, you have billions of mental workers in the body every one of them which is endowed with sufficient intelligence to understand and act upon any message or suggestion given. These cells are all busy creating and recreating the body, but in addition to this they are endowed with psychic activity whereby they can attract themselves the substance necessary for perfect development. They do this by the same law and in the same manner that every form of life attracts to itself the necessary material for growth. The oak, the rose, the lily, all require certain material for their most perfect expression, and they secure it by silent demand, the law of attraction, the most certain way for you to secure what you require for your most complete development. Make the mental image, make it clear, distinct, perfect, hold it firmly, the ways and means will develop, supply will follow the demand, you will be led to do the right thing at the right time and in the right way. Earnest desire will bring about confident expectation, and this in turn must be reinforced by firm demand. These three cannot fail to bring about attainment because the earnest desire is the feeling, the confident expectation is the thought, and the firm demand is the will. And as we have seen, feeling gives vitality to thought, and the will holds it steady until the law of growth brings it into manifestation. Is it not wonderful that man has such tremendous power within himself, such that transcendental faculties concerning which he has had no conception, 
Is it not strange that we have always been taught to look for strength and power without? We have been taught to look everywhere but within, and whenever this power manifested in our lives, we were told that it was something supernatural. There are many who have come to an understanding of this wonderful power, and who make serious and conscientious efforts to realize health, power, and other conditions, and seem to fail. They do not seem able to bring the law into operation. The difficulty in nearly every case is that they are dealing with externals. They want money, power, health, and abundance, but they fail to realize that these are effects and can only come when the cause is found. Those who will give no attention to the world without will seek only to ascertain the truth, will look only for wisdom, will find that this wisdom will unfold and disclose the source of all power, that it will manifest in thought and purpose which will create the external conditions desired. This truth will find expression in noble purposes and courageous action. Create ideals only. Give no thought to external conditions. Make the world within beautiful and opulent, and the world without will express and manifest the condition which you have within. You will come into a realization of your power to create ideals, and these ideals will be projected into the world of effect. For instance, a man is in debt. He will be continually thinking about the debt, concentrating on it, and his thoughts are causes the result is that he not only fastens the debt closer to him, but actually creates more debt. He is putting the great law of attraction into operation with the usual and inevitable result. Loss leads to greater loss. What then is the correct principle? Concentrate on the things you want, not on the things you do not want. Think of abundance. Idealize the methods and plans for putting the laws of abundance into operation. Visualize the condition which the law of abundance creates. This will result in manifestation. If the law operates perfectly to bring about poverty, lack, and every form of limitation for those who are continually entertaining thoughts of lack and fear, it will operate with the same certainty to bring about conditions of abundance and opulence for those who entertain thoughts of courage and power. This is a difficult problem for many. We are too anxious. We manifest anxiety, fear, distress. We want to do something. We want to help. We are like a child who just planted a seed and every 15 minutes goes and stirs up the earth to see if it is growing. Of course, under such circumstances, the seed will never germinate, and yet this is exactly what many of us do in the mental world. We must plant the seed and leave it undisturbed. This does not mean that we are to sit down and do nothing, by no means. We will do more and better work than we have ever done before. New channels will constantly be provided. New doors will open. All that is necessary is to have an open mind. Be ready to act when the time comes. Thought force is the most powerful means of obtaining knowledge, and if concentrated on any subject will solve the problem. Nothing is beyond the power of human comprehension, but in order to harness thought force and make it do your bidding, work is required. Remember that thought is the fire that creates the steam that turns the wheel of fortune upon which your experiences depend. Ask yourselves a few questions and then reverently await the response. Do you not now and then feel the self with you? Do you assert this self or do you follow the majority? Remember that majorities are always led. They never lead. It was the majority that fought tooth and nail against the steam engine, the power loom, and every other advance or improvement ever suggested. For your exercise this week, visualize your friend. See him exactly as you last saw him. See the room the furniture, recall the conversation. Now see his face, see it distinctly. Now talk to him about some subject of mutual interest. See his expression change, watch him smile. Can you do this? All right, you can. Then arouse his interest, tell him a story of adventure. See his eyes light up with the spirit of fun or excitement. Can you do all of this? If so, your imagination is good. You are making excellent progress. End of Part 7 Introduction to Part 8 In this part you will find that you may freely choose what you think, but the result of your thought is governed by an immutable law. Is not this a wonderful thought? Is it not wonderful to know that our lives are not subject to caprice or variability of any kind, that they are governed by law? This stability is our opportunity, because by complying with the law we can secure the desired effect with invariable precision. 
It is the law which makes the universe one grand pain of harmony. If it were not for the law, the universe would be chaos instead of a cosmos. Here, then, is a secret of the origin of both good and evil. This is all the good and evil there ever was or ever will be. Let me illustrate. Thought results in action. If your thought is constructive and harmonious, the result will be good. If your thought is destructive or inharmonious, the result will be evil. There is therefore but one law, one principle, one cause, one source of power. And good and evil are simply words which have been coined to indicate the result of our action, or our compliance or non-compliance with this law. The importance of this is well illustrated in the lives of Emerson and Carlyle. Emerson loved the good, and his life was a symphony of peace and harmony. Carlyle hated the bad, and his life was a record of perpetual discord and inharmony. Here we have two grand men, each intent upon achieving the same ideal, but one makes use of the constructive thought, and is therefore in harmony with natural law. The other makes use of destructive thought, and therefore brings upon himself discord of every kind and character. It is evident, therefore, that we are to hate nothing, not even the bad, because hatred is destructive, and we shall soon find that by entertaining destructive thought we are sowing the wind, and in turn shall reap the whirlwind. Part 8. Thought contains a vital principle, because it is the creative principle of the universe, and by its nature will combine with other similar thoughts. As the one purpose of life is growth, all principles underlying existence must contribute to give it effect. Thought, therefore, takes form, and the law of growth eventually brings it into manifestation. You may freely choose what you think, but the result of your thought is governed by an immutable law. Any line of thought persisted in cannot fail to produce its result in the character, health, and circumstance of the individual. Methods whereby we can substitute habits of constructive thought for those which we have found produce only undesirable effects are therefore of primary importance. We all know that this is by no means easy. Mental habits are difficult to control, but it can be done and the way to do it is to begin at once to substitute constructive thoughts for destructive thoughts. Form the habit of analyzing every thought. If it is necessary, if its manifestation in the objective will be the benefit not only to yourself but to all whom it may affect in any way, keep it, treasure it. It is of value. It is in tune with the infinite. It will grow and develop and produce fruit an hundredfold. On the other hand, it will be well for you to keep this quotation from George Matthews Adam in mind. Learn to keep the door shut. Keep out of your mind, out of your office, and out of your world every element that seeks admittance with no definite helpful end in view. If your thought has been critical or destructive, and has resulted in any condition of discord or inharmony in your environment, it may be necessary for you to cultivate a mental attitude which would be more conducive to constructive thought. The imagination will be found to be a great assistance in this direction. The cultivation of the imagination leads to the development of an ideal out of which your future will emerge. The imagination gathers up the material by which the mind weaves the fabric in which the future is to be clothed. Imagination is a light by which we can penetrate new worlds of thought and experience. Imagination is the mighty instrument by which every discoverer, every inventor opened the way from precedent to experience. Precedent said, it cannot be done. Experience said, it is done. Imagination is a plastic power, molding the things of sense into new forms and ideal. Imagination is the constructive form of thought, which must precede every constructive form of action. A builder cannot build a structure of any kind until he first received the plans from the architect, and the architect must get them from his imagination. The captain of industry cannot build a giant corporation which may coordinate hundreds of smaller companies and thousands of employees and utilize millions of dollars in capital until he first created the entire work in his imagination. Objects in the material world are as clay in the potter's hand. It is in the master mind that the real things are created, and it is by the use of the imagination that the work is done. 
In order to cultivate the imagination, it must be exercised. Exercise is necessary to cultivate mental muscle as well as the physical muscle. It must be supplied with nourishment or it cannot grow. Do not confuse imagination with fancy or that form of daydreaming in which some people like to indulge. Daydreaming is a form of mental dissipation which may lead to mental disaster. Constructive imagination means mental labor, by some considered to be the hardest kind of labor, but if so, it yields the greatest returns, for all the great things in life have come to men and women who had the capacity to think, to imagine, and to make their dreams come true. When you have become thoroughly conscious of the fact that mind is the only creative principle, that it is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, and that you can consciously come into harmony with this omnipotent, through your power of thought, you will have taken a long step in the right direction. The next step is to place yourself in position to receive this power. As it is omnipresent, it must be within you. We know that this is so because we know that all power is from within, but it must be developed, unfolded, cultivated. In order to do this, we must be receptive. And this receptivity is acquired just as physical strength is required by exercise. The law of attraction will certainly and unerringly bring to you the conditions, environment, and experiences in life corresponding with your habitual, characteristic, predominant mental attitude. Not what you think once in a while when you are in church or you have just read a good book, but your predominant mental attitude is what counts. You cannot entertain weak, harmful, negative thoughts ten hours a day and expect to bring about beautiful, strong, and harmonious conditions by ten minutes of strong, positive, creative thought. Real power comes from within. All power that anyone can possibly use is within man. Only waiting to be brought into visibility by his first recognizing it and then affirming it as his, working it into his consciousness until he becomes one with it. People say that they desire abundant life, and so they do. But so many interpret this to mean that if they will exercise their muscles or breathe scientifically, eat certain foods in certain ways, drink so many glasses of water every day or just a certain temperature, keep out the drafts, they will attain the abundant life they seek. The result of such methods is but indifferent. However, when man awakens to the truth and affirms his oneness with all life, he finds that he takes on the clear eye the elastic step, the vigor of youth, he finds that he has discovered the source of all power. All mistakes are but the mistakes of ignorance. Knowledge gaining in consequent power is what determines growth and evolution. The recognition and demonstration of knowledge is what constitutes power, and this power is spiritual power. And this spiritual power is the power which lies at the heart of all things. It is the soul of the universe. This knowledge is the result of man's ability to think. Thought is therefore the germ of man's conscious evolution. When man ceases to advance in his thoughts and ideals, his forces immediately begin to disintegrate, and his countenance gradually registers these changing conditions. Successful men make it their business to hold ideals of the conditions which they wish to realize. They constantly hold in mind the next step necessary to the ideal for which they are striving. Thoughts are the materials with which they build, and the imagination is their mental workshop. Mind is the ever-moving force with which they secure the persons and circumstances necessary to build their success structure, and imagination is the matrix in which all great things are fashioned. If you have been faithful to your ideal, you will hear the call where circumstances are ready to materialize your plans, and results will correspond in the exact ratio of your fidelity to your ideal. The ideal steadily held is what predetermines and attracts the necessary conditions for its fulfillment. It is thus that you may weave a garment of spirit and power into the web of your entire existence. It is thus that you may lead a charmed life and be forever protected from all harm. It is thus that you may become a positive force whereby conditions of opulence and harmony may be attracted to you. This is the leaven which is gradually permeating the general consciousness and is largely responsible for the conditions of unrest which are everywhere evident. 
In the last part, you created a mental image. You brought it from the invisible into the visible. This week, I want you to take an object and follow it back to its origination. See of it what it really consists. If you do this, you will develop imagination, insight, perception, and sagacity. These come not by the superficial observation of the multitude, but by a keen analytical observation which sees below the surface. It is the few who know that the things which they see are only effects and understand the causes by which these effects were brought into existence. Take the same position as heretofore and visualize a battleship. See the grim monster floating on the surface of the water. There appears to be no life anywhere about. All is silence. You know that by far the largest part of the vessel is under water, out of sight. You know that the ship is as large and as heavy as a twenty-story skyscraper. You know that there are hundreds of men ready to spring to their appointed task instantly. You know that every department is in charge of able, trained, skilled officials who have proven themselves competent to take charge of this marvelous piece of mechanism. You know that although it lies apparently oblivious to everything else, it has eyes which sees everything for miles around, and nothing is permitted to escape its watchful vision. You know that while it appears quiet, submissive, and innocent, it is prepared to hurl a steel projectile weighing thousands of pounds at an enemy many miles away. This and much more you can bring to mind, which comparatively no effort whatsoever. But how did the battleship come to be where it is? How did it come into existence in the first place? All of this you want to know if you are a careful observer. Follow the great steel plates through the foundries. See the thousands of men employed in their production. Go still further back and see the ore as it comes from the mine. See it loaded on barges or cars. See it melted and properly treated. Go back still further and see the architect and engineers who plan the vessel. Let the thought carry you back still further in order to determine why they plan the vessel. You will see that you are now so far back that the vessel is something intangible. It no longer exists. It is now only a thought existing in the brain of the architect. But from where did the order come to plan the vessel? Probably from the Secretary of Defense. But probably this vessel was planned long before the war was thought of, and that Congress had to pass a bill appropriating the money. Possibly there was opposition and speeches for or against the bill. Whom do these congressmen represent? They represent you and me, so that our line of thought begins with the battleship and ends with ourselves, and we find in the last analysis that our thoughts are responsible for this and many other things, or which we seldom think. And a little further reflection will develop the most important fact of all, and that is, if someone had not discovered the law by which this tremendous mass of steel and iron could be made to float upon the water, instead of immediately going to the bottom, the battleship could not have come into an existence at all. This law is that the specific gravity of any substance is the weight of any volume of it, compared with the equal volume of water. The discovery of this law revolutionized every kind of ocean travel, commerce and warfare, and made the existence of battleship, aircraft carriers, and cruise ships possible. You will find exercise of this kind invaluable. When the thought has been trained to look below the surface, everything takes on a different appearance. The insignificant becomes significant. The uninteresting, interesting. The things which we suppose to be of no importance are seen to be the only really vital things in existence. Quote, look to this day for its life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty, for yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. But today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. Unquote. From the Sanskrit. End of Part 8 Introduction to Part 9 In this part you may learn to fashion the tools by which you may build for yourself any condition you desire. If you wish to change conditions, you must change yourself. Your whims, your wishes, your fancies, your ambitions may be thwarted at every step, but your inmost thoughts will find expression, just as certainly as the plant springs from the seed. Suppose, then, we desire to change conditions. How are we to bring this about? The reply is simple, by the law of growth. 
Cause and effect are as absolute and undeviating in the hidden realm of thought as in the world of material things. Hold in mind the condition desired. Affirm it as an already existing fact. This indicates the value of a powerful affirmation. By constant repetition it becomes a part of ourselves. We are actually changing ourselves, are making ourselves what we want to be. Character is not a thing of chance, but it is the result of continued effort. If you are timid, vacillating, self-conscious, or if you are over-anxious or harassed by thoughts of fear or impending danger, remember this axiomatic that two things cannot exist in the same place at the same time. Exactly the same thing is true in the mental and spiritual world, so that your remedy is plainly to substitute thoughts of courage, power, self-reliance, and confidence for those of fear, lack, and limitation. The easiest and most natural way to do this is to select an affirmation which seems to fit your particular case. The positive thought will destroy the negative as certainly as light destroys darkness, and the result will be just as effectual. Act is the blossom of thought, and conditions are the result of action, so that you can constantly have in your possession the tools by which you will certainly and inevitably make or unmake yourself. Part 9 there are only three things which can possibly be desired in the world without, and each of them can be found in the world within. The secret of finding them is simply to apply the proper mechanism of attachment to the omnipotent power to which each individual has access. The three things which all mankind desires and which are necessary for its highest expression and complete development are health, wealth, and love. All will admit that health is absolutely essential no one can be happy if the physical body is in pain. All will not so readily admit that wealth is necessary, but all must admit that a sufficient supply at least is necessary. And what would be considered sufficient for one would be considered absolute and painful lack for another. And as nature provides not only enough but abundantly, wastefully, lavishly, we realize that any lack or limitation is only the limitation which has been made by an artificial method of distribution. All will admit that love is the third, or maybe some will say the first essential necessary to the happiness of mankind. At any rate, those who possess all three, health, wealth, and love, find nothing else which can be added to their cup of happiness. We have found the universal substance is all health, all substance, and all love, and that the mechanism of attachment whereby we can consciously connect with this infinite supply is in our method of thinking. To think correctly is therefore to enter into the secret place of the Most High. What shall we think? If we know this, we shall have found the proper mechanism of attachment which will relate us to whatsoever things we desire. This mechanism may seem very simple when I give it to you, but read on. You will find that it is in reality the master key, the Aladdin's lamp, if you please. You will find that it is the foundation, the imperative condition, the absolute law of well-doing, which means well-being. To think correctly, accurately, we must know the truth. The truth, then, is the underlying principle in every business or social relation. It is a condition precedent to every right action. To know the truth, to be sure, to be confident, affords a satisfaction besides which no other is at all comparable. It is the only solid ground in the world of doubt, conflict, and danger. To know the truth is to be in harmony with the infinite and omnipotent power. To know the truth is, therefore, to connect yourself with a power which is irresistible and which will sweep away every kind of discord in harmony, doubt, or error of any kind, because the truth is mighty and will prevail. The humblest intellect can readily foretell the result of any action when he knows that it was based on truth. But the mightiest intellect, the most profound and penetrating mind, loses its way hopelessly and can form no conception of the result which may ensue when his hopes are based on a premise which he knows to be false. Every action which is not in harmony with truth, whether through ignorance or design, will result in discord and an eventual loss in proportion to its extent and character. How, then, are we to know the truth in order to attach this mechanism which will relate us to the infinite? 
We can make no mistake about this if we realize that truth is the vital principle of the universal mind and is omnipresent. For instance, if you require health, a realization of the fact that the I in you is spiritual and that all spirit is one, that wherever a part is the whole must be, will bring about a condition of health, because every cell in the body must manifest the truth as you see it. If you see sickness, they will manifest sickness. If you see perfection, they must manifest perfection. The affirmation, I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy, will bring about harmonious conditions. The reason for this is because the affirmation is in strict accordance with the truth, and when truth appears, every form of error or discord must necessarily disappear. You have found that the eye is spiritual. It must necessarily then always be no less than perfect. The affirmation, I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy, is therefore an exact scientific statement. Thought is a spiritual activity, and spirit is creative. Therefore, the result of holding this thought in mind must necessarily bring about conditions in harmony with the thought. If you require wealth, a realization of the fact that the I in you is one with the universal mind, which is all substance and is omnipotent, will assist you in bringing into operation the law of attraction, which will bring you into vibration with those forces which make for success and bring about conditions of power and affluence in direct proportion with the character and purpose of your affirmation. Visualization is the mechanism of the attachment which you require. Visualization is a very different process from seeing. Seeing is physical and is therefore related to the objective world, the world without. But visualization is a product of the imagination and is therefore a product of the subjective mind, the world within. It therefore possesses vitality. It will grow. The only visualized will manifests itself to form. The mechanism is perfect. It was created by the master architect who doeth all things well. But unfortunately sometimes the operator is inexperienced or inefficient. But practice and determination will overcome this defect. If you require love, try to realize that the only way to get love is by giving it. That the more you give, the more you will get. And the only way in which you can give it is to fill yourself with it until you become a magnet. The method was explained in another lesson. He who has learned to bring the greatest spiritual truths into touch with the so-called lesser things of life has discovered the secret of the solution of his problem. One is always quickened, made more thoughtful by his nearness of approach to great ideas, great events, great natural objects, and great men. Lincoln is said to have begotten in all who came near him the feeling awakened when one approaches a mountain and this sense asserts itself most keenly when one comes to realize that he has laid hold upon things that are eternal, the power of truth. It is sometimes an inspiration to hear from someone who has actually put these principles to test, someone who has demonstrated them in their own life. A letter from Frederick Andrews offers the following insight. I was about 13 years old when Dr. T. W. Marseille, since passed over, said to my mother, there is no possible chance, Mrs. Andrews. I lost my little boy the same way, after doing everything for him that it was possible to do. I have made a special study of these cases, and I know there is no possible chance for him to get well. She turned to him and said, Doctor, what would you do if he were your boy? And he answered, I would fight, fight as long as there is any breath of life to fight for. That was the beginning of a long, drawn-out battle with many ups and downs. The doctors all agreeing that there was no chance for a cure, though they encouraged and cheered us the best they could. But at last the victory came, and I have grown from a little, crooked, twisted cripple, going about on my hands and knees, to a strong, straight, well-formed man. Now I know you want the formula, and I will give it to you as briefly and quickly as I can. I built up an affirmation for myself, taking the qualities I most needed and affirming for myself over and over again. I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy. I kept this affirmation always the same, never varying till I could wake up in the night and find myself repeating, I am whole, perfect, 
strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy. It was the last thing on my lips at night and the first thing in the morning. Not only did I affirm it for myself, but for others that I knew needed it. I want to emphasize this point. Whatever you desire for yourself, affirm it for others, and it will help you both. We reap what we sow. If we send out thoughts of love and health, they return to us like bread cast upon the waters. But if we send out thoughts of fear, worry, jealousy, anger, hate, etc., we will reap the results in our own lives. It used to be said that man is completely built over every seven years, but some scientists now declare that we build ourselves over entirely every eleven months. So we are really only eleven months old. If we build the defects back into our bodies year after year, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Man is the sum total of his own thoughts. So the question is, how are we going to entertain only the good thoughts and reject the evil ones? At first we can't keep the evil thoughts from coming, but we can keep from entertaining them. The only way to do this is to forget them, which means get something for them. This is where the ready-made affirmation comes into play. When a thought of anger, jealousy, fear, or worry creeps in, just start your affirmation going. The way to fight darkness is with light. The way to fight cold is with heat. The way to overcome evils is with good. For myself, I never could find any help in denials. Affirm the good and the bad will vanish. Frederick Elias Anders If there is anything you require, it will be well for you to make this use of this affirmation. It cannot be improved upon. Use it just as it is. Take it into the silence with you until it sinks into your subconscious so that you can use it anywhere, in your car, in the office, at home. This is an advantage of spiritual methods. They are always available. Spirit is omnipresent, ever ready. All that is required is the proper recognition of its omnipotence and a willingness or desire to become the recipient of its beneficent effects. If our predominant mental attitude is one of power, courage, kindliness, and sympathy, we shall find that our environment will reject conditions in correspondence with these thoughts. If it is weak, critical, envious, and destructive, we shall find our environment reflecting conditions corresponding to these thoughts. Thoughts are causes and conditions are effects. Herein is the explanation of the origin of both good and evil. Thought is creative and will automatically correlate with its object. This is a cosmological law, a universal law. The law of attraction, the law of cause and effect. The recognition and application of this law will determine both beginning and end. It is the law by which in all ages and in all times the people were led to believe in the power of prayer. As thy faith is, so be it unto thee is simply another shorter and better way of stating it. This week, visualize a plant. Take a flower, the one you most admire. Bring it from the unseen into the seen. Plant the teeny seed, water it, care for it. Place it where it will get the direct rays of the morning sun. See the seed burst. It is now a living thing, something which is alive and beginning to search for the means of sustenance. See the roots penetrating the earth. Watch them shoot out in all directions. And remember that they are living cells dividing and subdividing, and that they will soon number millions. That each cell is intelligent, that it knows what it wants and knows how to get it. See the stem shoot forward and upward. Watch it burst through the surface of the earth. See it divide and form branches. See how perfect and symmetrical each branch is formed. See the leaves begin to form, and then the tiny stems each one holding aloft a bud. And as you watch, you see the bud begin to unfold, and your favorite flower comes to view. And now if you will concentrate intently, you will become conscious of a fragrance. It is the fragrance of the flower as the breeze gently sways the beautiful creation which you have visualized. When you are enabled to make your vision clear and complete, you will be enabled to learn and enter into the spirit of the thing. It will become very real to you. You will be learning to concentrate, and the process is the same. Whether you are concentrating on health, a favorite flower, an ideal, a complicated business proposition, or any other problem in life, 
every success has been accomplished by persistent concentration upon the object in view. End of Part 9 Introduction to Part 10 If you get a thorough understanding of the thought contained in Part 10, you will have learned that nothing happens without a definite cause. You will be enabled to formulate your plans in accordance with exact knowledge. You will know how to control any situation by bringing adequate causes into play. When you win, as you will, you will know exactly why. The ordinary man who has no definite knowledge of cause and effect is governed by his feelings or emotions. He thinks chiefly to justify his actions. If he fails as a businessman, he says that luck is against him. If he dislikes music, he says that music is an expensive luxury. If he is a poor office man, he says that he could have succeeded better at some outdoor work. If he lacks friends, he says his individuality is too fine to be appreciated. He never thinks his problem through to the end. In short, he does not know that every effect is the result of a certain definite cause, but he seeks to console himself with explanations and excuses. He thinks only in self-defense. On the contrary, the man who understands that there is no effect without an adequate cause thinks impersonally. He gets down to bedrock facts regardless of consequences. He is free to follow the trail of truth wherever it may lead. He sees the issue clear to the end, and he meets the requirements fully and fairly, and the result is that the world gives him all that it has to give in friendship, honor, love, and approval. Part 10 Abundance is a natural law of the universe. The evidence of this law is conclusive. We see it on every hand. Everywhere nature is lavish, wasteful, extravagant. Nowhere is economy observed in any created thing. Profusion is manifested in everything. The millions and millions of trees and flowers and plants and animals in the vast scheme of reproduction, where the process of creating and recreating is forever going on, all indicates the lavishness with which nature has made provision for man. That there is an abundance for everyone is evident, but the many fail to participate in this abundance is also evident, that they have not yet come into the realization of the universality of all substance, and that mind is the active principle whereby we are related to the things we desire. All wealth is the offspring of power. Possessions are of value only as they confer power, Events are significant only as they affect power. All things represent certain forms and degrees of power. Knowledge of cause and effect, as shown by the laws governing electricity, chemical affinity, and gravitation, enables man to plan courageously and execute fearlessly. These laws are called natural laws because they govern in the physical world. But all power is not physical power. There is also mental power and there is moral and spiritual power. Spiritual power is superior because it exists on a higher plane. It has enabled man to discover the law by which these wonderful forces of nature could be harnessed and made to do the work of hundreds and thousands of men. It has enabled man to discover laws whereby time and space have been annihilated and the law of gravitation to be overcome. The operation of this law is dependent upon spiritual contact, as Henry Drummond well says. In the physical world as we know it, there exists the organic and the inorganic. The inorganic of the mineral world is absolutely cut off from the plant or animal world. The passage is hermetically sealed. These barriers have never yet been crossed. No change of substance, no modification of environment, no chemistry, no electricity, no form of energy, no evolution of any kind can ever endow a single atom of the mineral world with the attribute of life. Only by bending down into this dead world of some living form can those dead atoms be gifted with the properties of vitality. Without this contact with life, they remain fixed in the inorganic sphere forever. Huxley says that the doctrine of biogenesis, or life only from life, is victorious all along the line. And Tyndall is compelled to say, I affirm that no shred of trustworthy evidence exists to prove that life in our day has ever appeared independent of antecedent life. Physical laws may explain the inorganic. Biology explains and accounts for the development of the organic, but of the point of contact, science is silent. 
A similar passage exists between the natural world and the spiritual world. This passage is hermetically sealed on the natural side. The door is closed, no man can open it, no organic change, no mental activity, no moral effort, no progress of any kind can enable any human being to enter the spiritual world. But as the plant reaches down into the mineral world and touches it with the mystery of life, so the universal mind reaches down into the human mind and endows it with new, strange, wonderful, and even marvelous qualities. All men or women who have ever accomplished anything in the world of industry, commerce, or art have accomplished because of this process. Thought is the connecting link between the infinite and the finite, between the universal and the individual. We have seen that there is an impassable barrier between the organic and the inorganic, and that the only way that matter can unfold is to be impregnated with life as a seed reaches down into the mineral world and begins to unfold and reach out. The dead matter begins to live. A thousand invisible fingers begin to weave a suitable environment for the new arrival. And as the law of growth begins to take effect, we see the process continue until the lily finally appears, and even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Even so, a thought is dropped into the invisible substance of the universal mind, that substance from which all things are created, and it takes root. The law of growth begins to take effect, and we find that conditions and environment are all but the objective form of our thought. The law is that thought is an active, vital form of dynamic energy, which has the power to correlate with, it, with its object and bring it out of the invisible substance from which all things are created into the visible or objective world. This is the law by which and through which all things come into manifestation. It is the master key by which you are admitted into the secret place of the Most High and are given dominion over all things. With an understanding of this law you may decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. It could not be otherwise. If the soul of the universe as we know it is the universal spirit, then the universe is simply the condition which the universal spirit has made for itself. We are simply individualized spirit and we are creating the conditions for our growth in exactly the same way. This creative power depends upon our recognition of the potential power of spirit or mind and must not be confused with evolution. Creation is the calling into existence of that which does not exist in the objective world. Evolution is simply the unfolding of potentialities involved in things which already exist. In taking advantage of the wonderful possibilities opened up to us through the operation of this law, we must remember that we ourselves contribute nothing to its efficacy, as the great teachers said. It is not I that doeth the works, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. We must take exactly the same position. We can do nothing to assist in the manifestation. We simply comply with the law, and the all-originating mind will bring about the result. The great error of the present day is the idea that man has to originate the intelligence whereby the infinite can proceed to bring about a specific purpose or result. Nothing of this kind is necessary. The universal mind can be depended upon to find the ways and means for bringing about any necessary manifestation. We must, however, create the ideal, and this ideal should be perfect. We know that the laws governing electricity have been formulated in such a way that this invisible power can be controlled and used for our benefit and comfort in thousands of ways. We know that messages are carried around the world, that ponderous machinery does its bidding, that it now illuminates practically the whole world. But we know, too, that if we consciously or ignorantly violate its laws by touching a live wire, when it is not properly insulated, the result will be unpleasant and possibly disastrous. A lack of understanding of the laws governing in the invisible world has the same result, and many are suffering the consequences all the time. It has been explained that the law of causation depends upon polarity. A circuit must be formed. This circuit cannot be formed unless we operate in harmony with the law. How shall we operate in harmony with the law unless we know what the law is? How shall we know what the law is? Uh, by study or observation. We see the law in operation everywhere. All nature testifies to the operation of the law by silently, constantly expressing itself in the law of growth. 
Where there is growth, there must be life. Where there is life, there must be harmony, so that everything that has life is constantly attracting to itself the conditions and supply which is necessary for its most complete expression. If your thought is in harmony with the creative principle of nature, it is in tune with the infinite mind, and it will form the circuit. It will not return to you void, but it is possible for you to think thoughts that are not in tune with the infinite. And when there is no polarity, the circuit is not formed. What, then, is the result? What is the result when a dynamo is generating electricity? The circuit is cut off and there is no outlet. The dynamo stops. It will be exactly the same with you. If you entertain thoughts which are not in accordance with the infinite and cannot therefore be polarized, there is no circuit. You are isolated. The thoughts cling to you, harass you, worry you, and finally bring about disease and possibly death. The physician may not diagnose the case exactly in this way. He may give it some fancy name which has been manufactured for the various ills which are a result of wrong thinking, but the cause is the same nevertheless. Constructive thought must necessarily be creative, but creative thought must be harmonious, and this eliminates all destructive or competitive thought. Wisdom, strength, courage, and all harmonious conditions are the lack of power, and when we have seen that all power is from within, likewise every lack, limitation, or adverse circumstances is the result of weakness, and weakness is simply absence of power. It comes from nowhere. It is nothing. The remedy, then, is simply to develop power, and this is accomplished in exactly the same manner that all power is developed, by exercise. This exercise consists in making an application of your knowledge. Knowledge will not apply itself. You must make the application. Abundance will not come to you out of the sky, neither will it drop into your lap, but a conscious realization of the law of attraction and the intention to bring it into operation for a certain definite and specific purpose, and the will to carry out this purpose will bring about the materialization of your desire by the natural law of transference. If you are in business, it will increase and develop along regular channels, possibly new or unusual channels of distribution will be opened, and when the law finally becomes operative, you will find that the things you seek are seeking you. This week, select a blank space on the wall or any other convenient spot from where you usually sit. Mentally draw a black horizontal line about six inches long. Try to see the line as plainly as though it were painted on the wall. Now mentally draw two vertical lines connecting with this horizontal line at either end. Now draw another horizontal line connecting with the two vertical lines. Now you have a square. Try to see the square perfectly. When you can do so, draw a circle within the square. Now place a point in the center of the circle. Now draw the point toward you about 10 inches. Now you have a cone on a square base. You will remember that your work was all in black. Change it to white, to red, to yellow. If you can do this, you are making excellent progress and you will soon be enabled to concentrate on any problem you may have in mind. Quote, when any object or purpose is clearly held in thought, its precipitation in tangible and visible form is merely a question of time. The vision always proceeds and itself determines the realization. Unquote. Lillian Whiting End of Part 10 Introduction to Part 11 Your life is governed by law, by actual immutable principles that never vary. Law is in operation at all times and all places. Fixed laws underlie all human actions. For this reason, men who control giant industries are enabled to determine with absolute precision just what percentage of every hundred thousand people will respond to any given set of conditions. It is well, however, to remember that while every effect is the result of a cause, the effect in turn becomes a cause, which creates other effects, which in turn create still other causes so that when you put the law of attraction into operation you must remember that you are starting a train of causation for good or otherwise which may have endless possibilities. We frequently hear it said, 41 very distressing situations came into my life, which could not have been the result of my thought, as I certainly never entertained any thought which could have had such a result. 
we fail to remember that like attracts like in the mental world and that the thought which we entertain brings to us certain friendships companionships of a particular kind and these in turn bring about conditions and environment which in turn are responsible for the conditions of which we complain part eleven inductive reasoning is the process of the objective mind by which we compare a number of separate instances with one another until we see the common factor that gives rise to them all induction proceeds by a comparison of facts it is this method of studying nature which has resulted in the discovery of a reign of law which has marked an epoch in human progress it is the dividing line between superstition and intelligence it has eliminated the elements of uncertainty and caprice for men's lives and substituted law reason and certitude it is the watchman at the gate mentioned in a former lesson when by virtue of this principle the world to which the senses are, were accustomed had been revolutionized when the sun had been arrested in this course the apparently flat earth had been shaped into a ball and set whirling around him when the inert matter had been resolved into active elements and the universe presented itself where we directed the telescope and microscope full of force motion and life we are constrained to ask by what possible means the delicate forms of organization in the midst of it are kept in order and repair like poles and like forces repel themselves or remain impenetrable to each other and this cause seems in general sufficient to assign a proper place and distance to stars men and forces as men of different virtues enter into partnership so do opposite poles attract each other elements that have no property in common like acids and gases cling to each other in performance and our general exchange is kept up between the surplus and the demand as the eye seeks and receives satisfaction from colors complementary to those which are given so does need want and desire in the largest sense induce guide and determine action it is our privilege to become conscious of the principle and act in accordance with it cuvet sees a tooth belonging to an extinct race of animals this tooth wants a body for the performance of its function and it defines the peculiar body it stands in need of with such provision that cuvet is able to reconstruct the frame of this animal perturbations are observed in the motion of uranus levier needs another star at a certain place to keep the solar system in order and Neptune appears in the place and hour appointed. The instinctive wants of the animal and the intellectual wants of Cuvet, the wants of nature and of the mind of Levier were alike, and thus the results. Here the thoughts of an existence, there an existence. A well-defined lawful want, therefore, furnishes the reason for the more complex operations of nature. Having recorded correctly the answers furnished by nature and stretched our senses with the growing science over her surface, having joined hands with the levers that move the earth, we become conscious of such a close, varied, and deep contact with the world without, that our wants and purposes become no less identified with the harmonious operations of this vast organization than the life, liberty, and happiness of the citizen is identified with the existence of his government. As the interests of the individual are protected by the arms of the country, added to his own, and his needs may depend upon certain supply in the degree that they are felt more universally and steadily, in the same manner does conscious citizenship in the Republic of Nature secure us from the annoyance of subordinate agents by alliance with supreme powers. And by appeal to the fundamental laws of resistance or inducement offered to mechanical or chemical agents, distribute the labor to be performed between them, and man to the best advantage of the inventor. If Plato could have witnessed the pictures executed by the sun with the assistance of the photographer, or a hundred similar illustrations of what man does by induction, he would perhaps have been reminded of the intellectual midwifery of his master, and his own mind might have arisen the vision of a land where all manual mechanical labor and repetition is assigned to the power of nature, where all wants are satisfied by purely mental operation set in motion by the will, and where the supply is created by the demand. However distant that land may appear, induction has taught men to make strides toward it, and has surrounded him with benefits which are, at the same time, rewards for f past fidelity and incentives for more assiduous devotion. 
It is also an aid in concentrating and strengthening our faculties for the remaining part, giving unerring solution for individuals as well as universal problems by the mere operations of mind in the purest form. Here we find a method, the spirit of which is, to believe that what is sought has been accomplished, in order to accomplish it a method bequeathed upon us by the same Plato who outside of the sphere could never find how the ideas became realities. This conception is also elaborated by Swedenborg in his doctrine of correspondences, and a still greater teacher has said, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11:24. The difference of the tenses in his passage is remarkable. We are first to believe that our desire has already been fulfilled. Its accomplishment will unfollow. This is a concise direction for making use of the creative power of thought by impressing on the universal subjective mind the particular thing which we desire as an already existing fact. We are thus thinking on the plane of the absolute and eliminating all consideration of conditions or limitations and are planting a seed which, if left undisturbed, will finally germinate into external fruition. To review, inductive reasoning is the process of the objective mind, by which we compare a number of separate instances with one another until we see the common factor that gives rise to them all. We see people in every civilized country on the globe securing results by some process which they do not seem to understand themselves and to which they usually attach more or less mystery. Our reason is given to us for the purpose of ascertaining the law by which these results are accomplished. The operation of this thought process is seen in those fortunate natures that possess everything that others might acquire by toil, who never have to struggle with conscience because they always act correctly, and can never conduct themselves otherwise and with tact, learn everything easily, complete everything they begin with a happy knack, live in eternal harmony with themselves without ever reflecting much what they do, or ever experiencing difficulty or toil. The fruit of this thought is, as it were, a gift of the gods, but a gift which few as yet realize, appreciate, or understand. The recognition of the marvelous power which is possessed by the mind under proper conditions, and the fact that this power can be utilized, directed and made available for the solution of every human problem if it is of transcendental importance. All truth is the same, whether stated in modern scientific terms or in the language of apostolic times. There are timid souls who fail to realize that the very completeness of truth requires various statements, that no one human formula will show every side of it. Changing, emphasis, new language, Novel interpretations, unfamiliar perspectives are not, as some suppose, signs of departure from truth, but on the contrary, they are evidence that truth is being apprehended in new relations to human needs, and is becoming more generally understood. The truth must be told to each generation and to every people in new and different terms, so that when the great teacher said, Believe that ye receive, and ye shall receive, or when Paul said, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Or, when modern science says, the law of attraction is the law by which thought correlates with its object, each statement, when subjected to analysis, is found to contain exactly the same truth, the only difference being in the form of presentation. We are standing on the threshold of a new era. The time has arrived when man has learned the secrets of mastery and the way is being prepared for a new social order, more wonderful than anything heretofore dreamed of. The conflict of modern science with theology, the study of comparative religions, the tremendous power of new social movements, all of these are but clearing the way for the new order. They may have destroyed traditional forms which have become antiquated and impotent, but nothing of value has been lost. A new faith has been born, a faith which demands a new form of expression, and this faith is taking form in a deep consciousness of power which is being manifested in the present spiritual activity found on every hand. The spirit which sleeps in the mineral, breathes in the vegetable, moves in the animal, and reaches its highest development in man is the universal mind, and it behooves us to span the gulf between being and doing 
theory and practice by demonstrating our understanding of the dominion which we have been given. By far the greatest discovery of all centuries is the power of thought. The importance of this discovery has been a little slow in reaching the general consciousness, but it has arrived. And already in every field of research the importance of the greatest of the all discoveries is being demonstrated. You ask, in what does the creative power of thought consist? It consists in creating ideas, and these in turn objectify themselves by appropriating, inventing, observing, discerning, discovering, analyzing, ruling, governing, combining, and applying matter and force. It can do this because it is an intelligent creative power. Thought reaches its loftiest activity when plunged into its own mysterious depth. When it breaks through the narrow compass of self and passes from truth to truth to the region of eternal light, where all which is, was, or ever will be, melt into one grand harmony. From this process of self-contemplation comes inspiration which is creative intelligence and which is undeniably superior to every element, force, or law of nature because it can understand, modify, govern, and apply them to its own ends and purposes and therefore possess them. Wisdom begins with the dawn of reason and reason is but an understanding of the knowledge and principles whereby we may know the true meaning of things. Wisdom, then, is illuminated reason, and this wisdom leads to humility, for humility is a large part of wisdom. We all know many who have achieved the seemingly impossible, who have realized lifelong dreams, who have changed everything including themselves. We have sometimes marveled at the demonstration of an apparently irresistible power, which seemed to be ever available just when it was most needed, but it is all clear now. All that is required is an understanding of certain definite fundamental principles and their proper application. For your exercise this week, concentrate on the quotation taken from the Bible. Whatsoever things ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Notice that there is no limitation. Whatsoever things is very definite and implies that the only limitation which is placed upon us is our own ability to think, to be equal to the occasion, to rise to the emergency, to remember that faith is not a shadow but a substance, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Quote, Death is but the natural process whereby all material forms are thrown into the crucible for reproduction in fresh diversity. End, quote. End of part 11. Introduction to Part 12 Part 12 is enclosed herewith. In the fourth paragraph you will find the following statement. You must first have the knowledge of your power. Second, the courage to dare. Third, the faith to do. If you concentrate upon the thoughts given, if you give them your entire intention, you will find a world of meaning in each sentence, and will attract to yourself other thoughts in harmony with them, and you will soon grasp the full significance of the vital knowledge upon which you are concentrating. Knowledge does not apply itself. We as individuals must make the application, and the application consists in fertilizing the thought with a living purpose. The time and thought which most persons waste in aimless effort would accomplish wonders if properly directed with some special object in view. In order to do this, it is necessary to center your mental force upon a specific thought and hold it there, to the exclusion of all other thoughts. If you have ever looked through the viewfinder of a camera, you found that when the object was not in focus, the impression was indistinct and possibly blurred, but when the proper focus was obtained, the picture was clear and distinct. This illustrates the power of concentration. Unless you can concentrate upon the object with which you have in view, you will have but a hazy, indifferent, vague, indistinct, and blurred outline of your ideal, and the result will be in accordance with your mental picture. Part 12 There is no purpose in life that cannot be accomplished through a scientific understanding of the creative power of thought. This power to think is common to all. Man is because he thinks. Man's power to think is infinite. Consequently, his creative power is unlimited. 
We know that thought is building for us the things we think of and actually bringing it near. Yet we find it difficult to banish fear, anxiety, or discouragement, all of which are powerful thought forces and which continually send the things we desire further away, so that it is often one step forward and two steps backward. The only way to keep from going backwards is to keep going forward. Eternal vigilance is the price of success. There are three steps, and each one is absolutely essential. You must first have the knowledge of your power. Second, the courage to dare. Third, the faith to do. With this as a basis, you can construct an ideal business, an ideal home, ideal friends, and an ideal environment. You are not restricted as to material or cost. Thought is omnipotent and has the power to draw on the infinite bank of primary substance for all that it requires. Infinite resources are therefore at your command. But your ideal must be sharp, clear-cut, definite. To have one ideal today, another tomorrow, and a third next week means to scatter your forces and accomplish nothing. Your result will be a meaningless and chaotic combination of wasted material. Unfortunately, this is the result which many are securing, and the cause is self-evident. If a sculptor started out with a piece of marble and a chisel and changed his ideal every 15 minutes, what result could he expect? And why should you expect any different result in molding the greatest and most plastic of all substances, the only real substance? The result of this indecision and negative thought is often found in the loss of material wealth. Supposed independence which required many years of toil and effort suddenly disappears. It is often found then that money and property are not independence at all. On the contrary, the only independence is found to be a practical working knowledge of the creative power of thought. This practical working method cannot come until you learn that the only real power which you have is the power to adjust yourself to divine and unchangeable principles. You cannot change the infinite, but you can come into an understanding of natural laws. The reward of this understanding is a conscious realization of your ability to adjust your thought faculties with the universal thought, which is omnipresent. Your ability to cooperate with this omnipotence will indicate the degree of success with which you meet. The power of thought has many counterfeits which are more or less fascinating, but the results are harmful instead of helpful. Of course, worry, fear, and all negative thoughts produce a crop after their kind. Those who harbor thoughts of this kind must inevitably reap what they have sown. Again, there are phenomena seekers who gormandize on the so-called proofs and demonstration obtained at materializing seances. They throw open their mental doors and soak themselves in the most poisonous currents which can be found in the psychic world. They do not seem to understand that it is the ability to become negative, receptive, and passive, and thus drain themselves of all their vital force, which enables them to bring about these vibratory thought forms. There are also the Hindu worshippers who see in the materializing phenomena which are performed by the so-called adepts a source of power, forgetting or never seeming to realize that as soon as the will is withdrawn, the form wither, and the vibratory forces of which they composed vanish. Telepathy, or thought transference, has received considerable attention, but as it requires a negative mental state on the part of the receiver, the practice is harmful. A thought may be sent with the intention of hearing or seeing, but it will bring the penalty attached to the inversion of the principle involved. In many instances, hypnotism is positively dangerous to the subject as well as the operator. No one familiar with the laws governing in the mental world would think of attempting to dominate the will of another, for by so doing he will gradually but surely divest himself of his own power. All of these perversions have their temporary satisfaction, and for some a keen fascination. But there is an infinitely greater fascination in a true understanding of the world of the power within, a power which increases with use, is permanent instead of fleeting, which not only is potent as a remedial agency to bring about the remedy for past error or results of wrong thinking, but as a prophylactic agency protecting us from all manner and form of danger, and finally is an actual creative force with which we can build new conditions 
and new environment. The law is that thought will correlate with its object and bring forth in the material world the correspondence of the thing thought or produced in the mental world. We then discern the absolute necessity of seeing that every thought has the inherent germ of truth in order that the law of growth will bring into manifestation good, for good alone can confer any permanent power. The principle which gives the thought the dynamic power to correlate with its object and therefore to master every adverse human experience is the law of attraction, which is another name for love. This is an eternal and fundamental principle inherent in all things, in every system of philosophy, in every religion, and in every science. There is no getting away from the law of love. It is feeling that imparts vitality to thought. Feeling is desire, and desire is love. Thought impregnated with love becomes invincible. We find this truth emphasized wherever the power of thought is understood. The universal mind is not only intelligence, but it is substance, and this substance is the attractive force which brings electrons together by the law of attraction, so that they form new atoms. The atoms in turn are brought together by the same law and form molecules. Molecules take objective forms. And so we find that the law of love is the creative force behind every manifestation, not only of atoms, but of worlds, of the universe, of everything of which the imagination can form any conception. It is the operation of this marvelous law of attraction which has caused men in all ages and all times to believe that there must be some personal being who responded to their petitions and desires and manipulated events in order to comply with their requirements. It is the combination of thought and love which forms the irresistible force called the law of attraction. All natural laws are irresistible. The law of gravitation or electricity or any other law operates with mathematical exactitude. There is no variation. It is only the channel of distribution which may be imperfect. If a bridge fails, we do not attribute the collapse to the variation in the law of gravitation. If a light fails us, we do not conclude that the laws governing electricity cannot be depended upon. And if the law of attraction seems to be imperfectly demonstrated by an inexperienced or uninformed person, we are not to conclude that the greatest and most infallible law upon which the entire system of creation depends has been suspended. We should rather conclude that a little more understanding of the law is required for the same reason that a correct solution of a difficult problem in mathematics is not always readily and easily obtained. Things are created in the mental or spiritual world before they appear in the outward act or event. By the simple process of governing our thought forces today, we help create the events which will come into our lives in the future, perhaps even tomorrow. Educated desire is the most potent means of bringing into action the law of attraction. Man is so constituted that he must first create the tools or implements by which he gains the power to think. The mind cannot comprehend an entirely new idea until a corresponding vibratory brain cell has been prepared to receive it. This explains why it is so difficult for us to receive or appreciate an entirely new idea. We have no brain cells capable of receiving it. We are therefore incredulous. We do not believe it. If, therefore, you have not been familiar with the omnipotence of the law of attraction and the scientific method by which it can be put into operation, or if you are not been familiar with the unlimited possibility which it opens to those who are enabled to take advantage of the resources it offers, begin now and create the necessary brain cells which will enable you to comprehend the unlimited powers which may be yours by cooperating with natural law. This is done by concentration or attention. The intention governs the attention. Power comes through repose. It is by concentration of deep thoughts, wise speech, and all forces of high potentiality are accomplished. It is in the silence that you get in touch with the omnipotent power of the subconscious mind from which all power is evolved. He who desires wisdom, power, or permanent success of any kind will find it only within. It is an unfoldment. 
The unthinking may conclude that the silence is very simple and easily attained, but it should be remembered that only in absolute silence may one come into contact with divinity itself, may learn of the unchangeable law, and open for himself the channels by which persistent practice and concentration lead to perfection. This week go to the same room, take the same chair, the same position as previous, be sure to relax, let go, both mentally and physically, always do this. Never try to do any mental work under pressure. See that there are no tense muscles or nerves, that you are entirely comfortable. Now realize your unity with omnipotence. Get into touch with this power. Come into a deep and vital understanding, appreciation and realization of the fact that your ability to think is your ability to act upon the universal mind. Realize that it will meet any and every requirement, that you have exactly the same potential ability which any individual ever did have or ever will have, because each is but an expression or manifestation of the one. All are parts of the whole. There is no difference in kind or quality, the only difference being one of degree. Quote, Thought cannot conceive of anything that may not be brought into expression. He who first uttered it may be only the suggester, but the doer will appear. Wilson, unquote. End of Part 12 Introduction to Part 13 Physical science is responsible for the marvelous age of invention in which we now live, but spiritual science is now setting out on a career whose possibilities no one can foretell. Spiritual science has previously been the football of the uneducated, the superstitious, the mystical, but men are now interested in definite methods and demonstrated facts only. We have come to know that thinking is a spiritual process, that vision and imagination preceded action and event, that the day of the dreamer has come. The following lines by Mr. Herbert Kaufman are interesting in this connection. They are the architects of greatness. Their vision lies within their souls. They peer beyond the veils and mists of doubt and pierce the walls of unborn time. The belted wheel, the trail of steel, the churning screw are shuffles in the loom on which they weave their magic tapestries. Makers of empire, they have fought for bigger things than crowns and higher seats than thrones. Your homes are set upon a land a dreamer found. The picture on its wall are visions from a dreamer's soul. They are the chosen few, the blazers of the way. Walls crumble and empires fall. The tidal wave sweeps from the sea and tears a fortress from its rocks. The rotting nations drop off from time's bow, and only the things the dreamers make live on. Part 13, which follow, tells why the dreams of the dreamer come true. It explains the law of causation by which dreamers, inventors, authors, financiers bring about the realization of their desires. It explains the laws by which the thing pictured upon our mind eventually becomes our own. Part 13. It has been the tendency, and, as might be proved, a necessity for science to seek the explanation of everyday facts by a generalization of those others which are less frequent and form the exception. Thus does the eruption of the volcano manifest the heat which is continually at work in the interior of the earth, and to which the latter owes much of her configuration. Thus does the lightning reveal a subtle power constantly busy to produce changes in an inorganic world. And as a dead language now seldom heard were once ruling among the nations, so does a giant tooth in Siberia, or a fossil in the depth of the earth, not only bear record of the evolution of past ages, but thereby explains to us the origin of the hills and valleys which we inhabit today. In this way, a generalization of facts, which are rare, strange, or form the exception, has been the magnetic needle guiding to all the discoveries of inductive science. This method is founded upon reason and experience, and thereby destroyed superstition, precedent, and conventionality. It is almost three hundred years since Lord Bacon recommended this method of study, to which the civilized nations owe the greater part of their prosperity and the more valuable part of their knowledge, purging the mind from narrow prejudices, denominated theories, more effectually than by the keenest irony, calling the attention of men from heaven to earth more successfully by surprising experience 
than by the most forcible demonstration of their ignorance. Educating the inventive facilities more powerfully by the near prospect of useful discoveries thrown upon to all than by talk of bringing to light the innate laws of our mind. The method of Bacon has seized the spirit and aim of the great philosophers of Greece and carried them into effect by the new means of observation which another age offered, thus gradually revealing a wondrous field of knowledge in the infinite space of astronomy, in the microscopic egg of embryology, disclosing an order of the pulse which the logic of Aristotle could never have unveiled and analyzing into formerly unknown elements the material combination which no dialectic of the scholastics could force apart. It has lengthened life, it has mitigated pain, it has extinguished disease, it has increased the fertility of the soil, it has given new securities to the mariner, it has spanned great rivers with bridges of form unknown to our fathers, it has guided the thunderbolt from heaven to earth, it has lighted up night with the splendor of day, it has extended the range of human vision. It has multiplied the power of the human muscle. It has accelerated motion. It has annihilated distance. It has facilitated intercourse, correspondence, all friendly offices, all dispatch of business. It has enabled men to descend into the depths of the sea, to soar into the air, to penetrate securely into the noxious recesses of the earth. This, then, is the true nature and scope of induction. But the greater the success which men have achieved in the inductive science, the more does the whole tenor of their teaching and examples impress us with the necessity of observing carefully, patiently, accurately, with all the instruments and resources at our command, the individual facts before venturing upon the statement of general laws. To ascertain the bearing of the spark drawn from the electrical machine under every variety of circumstances, that we thus may be emboldened with Franklin to address, in the form of a kite, the question to the cloud about the nature of the lightning. To assure ourselves of the manner in which bodies fall with the exactness of Galileo, that with Newton we may dare to ask the moon about the force that fastens it to the earth. In short, by the value we set upon truth, by our hope in a steady and universal progress, not to permit a tyrannical prejudice to neglect or mutilate unwelcome facts, but to rear the superstructure of science upon the broad and unchangeable basis of full attention paid to the most isolated as well as the most frequent phenomena. An ever-increasing material may be collected by observation, but the accumulated facts are of very different value for the explanation of nature, and as we esteem most highly those useful qualities of men which are the rarest occurrences, so does natural philosophy sift the facts and attach a preeminent importance to that striking class which cannot be accounted for by the usual and daily observation of life. If then we find that certain persons seem to possess unusual power, what are we to conclude? First we may say, it is not so which is simply an acknowledgment of our lack of information, because every honest investigator admits that there are many strange and previously unaccountable phenomena constantly taking place. Those, however, who become acquainted with the creative power of thought will no longer consider themselves unaccountable. Second, we may say that they are the result of supernatural interference, but a scientific understanding of natural laws will convince us that there is nothing supernatural. Every phenomena is the result of an accurate, definite cause, and the cause is an immutable law or principle, which operates with invariable precision, whether the law is put into operation consciously or unconsciously. Third, we may say that we are on forbidden ground, that there are some things that we should not know. This objection was used against every advance in human knowledge. Every individual who ever advanced a new idea, whether a Columbus, Darwin, Galileo, Fulton, or an Emerson, was subjected to ridicule or persecution, so that this objection should receive no serious consideration. But, on the contrary, we should carefully consider every fact which is brought to our attention. By doing this, we will more readily ascertain the law upon which it is based. It will be found that the creative power of thought will explain every possible condition or experience, whether physical, mental, or spiritual. 
Thought will bring about conditions in correspondence with the predominant mental attitude. Therefore, if we fear disaster, as fear is a powerful form of thought, disaster will be the certain result of our thinking. It is this form of thought which frequently sweeps away the result of many years of toil and effort. If we think of some forms of material wealth, we may secure it. By concentrated thought, the required conditions will be brought about and the proper effort put forth, which will result in bringing about the circumstances necessary to realize our desires. But we often find that when we secure the things we thought we wanted, they do not have the effect we expected. That is, the satisfaction is only temporary, or possibly in the reversal of what we expected. What, then, is the proper method of procedure? What are we to think in order to secure what we really desire? What you and I desire, what we all desire, what everyone is seeking, is happiness and harmony. If we can be truly happy, we shall have everything the world can give. If we are happy with ourselves, we can make others happy. But we cannot be happy unless we have health, strength, congenial friends, pleasant environment, sufficient supply, not only to take care of our necessities, but to provide for those comforts and luxuries to which we are entitled. The old orthodox way of thinking was to be a worm, to be satisfied with our portion, whatever it is. But the modern idea is to know that we are entitled to the best of everything, that the Father and I are one, and that the Father is the universal mind, the creator, the original substance from which all things proceed. Now admitting that this is all true in theory, and it has been taught for two thousand years, and is the essence of every system of philosophy or religion, how are we to make it practical in our lives? How are we to get the actual, tangible results here and now? In the first place, we must put our knowledge into practice. Nothing can be accomplished in any other way. The athlete may read books and lessons on physical training all his life, but unless he begins to give out strength by actual work, he will never receive any strength. He will eventually get exactly what he gives, but he will have to give it first. It is exactly the same with us. We will get exactly what we give, but we shall have to give it first. It will then return to us many fold, and the giving is simply a mental process, because thoughts are causes and conditions are effects. Therefore, in giving thoughts of courage, inspiration, health, or help in any kind, we are getting causes in motion which will bring about their effect. Thought is a spiritual activity and is therefore creative. But make no mistake, thought will create nothing unless it is consciously, systematically, and constructively directed. And herein is the difference between idle thinking, which is simply a dissipation of effort, and constructive thinking, which means practically unlimited achievement. We have found that everything we get comes to us by the law of attraction. A happy thought cannot exist in an unhappy consciousness, therefore the consciousness must change. And as the consciousness changes, all conditions necessary to meet the changed consciousness must gradually change in order to meet the requirements of the new situation. In creating a mental image or an ideal, we are projecting a thought into the universal substance from which all things are created. This universal substance is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Are we to inform the omniscient as to the proper channel to be used to materialize our demands? Can the finite advise the infinite? This is the cause of failure, of every failure. We recognize the omnipresence of the universal substance, but we fail to appreciate the fact that this substance is not only omnipresent, but is omnipotent and omniscient, and consequently will set causes in motion concerning which we may be entirely ignorant. We can best conserve our interests by recognizing the infinite power and infinite wisdom of the universal mind and in this way become a channel whereby the infinite can bring about the realization of our desire. This means that recognition brings about realization. Therefore, for your exercise this week, make use of the principle. Recognize the fact that you are a part of the whole, and that a part must be the same in kind and quantity as the whole. The only difference there can possibly be is in degree. When this tremendous fact begins to permeate your consciousness, 
when you really come into a realization of the fact that you, not your body, but the ego, the I, the spirit which thinks is an integral part of the great whole, that it is the same in substance, in quality, in kind, that the Creator could create nothing different from Himself, you will also be able to say, The Father and I are one. And you will come into an understanding of the beauty, the grandeur, the transcendental opportunities which have been placed at your disposal. Quote, Increase in me that wisdom which discovers my truest interest. Strengthen my resolution to perform that which wisdom dictates. Unquote. Franklin. End of Part 13. Introduction to Part 14. You have found from your study thus far that thought is a spiritual activity and is therefore endowed with creative power. This does not mean that some thought is creative, but that all thought is creative. This same principle can be brought into operation in a negative way, through the process of denial. The conscious and subconscious are but two phases of action in connection with one mind. The relation of the subconscious to the conscious is quite analogous to existing between a weather vane and the atmosphere. Just as the least pressure of the atmosphere causes an action on the part of the weather vane, so does the least thought entertained by the conscious mind produce within your subconscious mind action in exact proportion to the depth of feeling, characterizing the thought and the intensity with which that thought is indulged. It follows that if you deny unsatisfactory conditions, you are withdrawing the creative power of your thought from these conditions. You are cutting them away at the root. You are sapping their vitality. Remember that the law of growth necessarily governs every manifestation in the objective, so that a denial of unsatisfactory conditions will not bring about instant change. A plant will remain visible for some time after its roots have been cut but it will gradually fade away and eventually disappear. So the withdrawal of your thought from the contemplation of unsatisfactory conditions will gradually, but surely, terminate these conditions. You will see that this is an exactly opposite course from the one which we would naturally be inclined to adopt. It will therefore have an exactly opposite effect to the one usually secured. Most persons concentrate intently upon unsatisfactory conditions, thereby giving the condition that measures of energy and vitality which is necessary in order to supply a vigorous growth. Part 14 The universal energy in which all motion, light, heat, and color have their origin does not partake of the limitation of the many effects of which it is the cause, but it is supreme over them all. This universal substance is the source of all power, wisdom, and intelligence. To recognize this intelligence is to acquaint yourself with the knowing quality of mind, and through it to move upon the universal substance and bring it into harmonious relations in your affairs. This is something that the most learned physical science teacher has not attempted, a field of discovery upon which he has not yet launched. In fact, but few of the materialistic schools have ever caught the first ray of this light. It does not seem to have dawned upon them that wisdom is just as much present everywhere as our forces and substance. Some will say, if these principles are true, why are we not demonstrating them? As the fundamental principle is obviously correct, why do we not get proper results? Well, we do. We get results in exact accordance with our understanding of the law and our ability to make the proper application. We secured no results from the law governing electricity until someone formulated the law and showed us how to apply it. This puts us in an entirely new relationship to our environment, opening up possibilities previously undreamed of, and this by an orderly sequence of law which is naturally involved in our new mental attitude. Mind is creative and the principle upon which this law is based is sound and legitimate and is inherent in the nature of things. But this creative power does not originate in the individual, but in the universal, which is the source and fountain of all energy and substance. The individual is simply the channel for the distribution of this energy. The individual is the means by which the universal produces the various combinations which result in the formation of the phenomena. We know that scientists have resolved matter into an immense number of molecules. 
These molecules have been resolved into atoms and the atoms into electrons. The discovery of electrons in high vacuum glass tubes containing fused terminals of hard metal indicates conclusively that these electrons fill all space, that they exist everywhere, that they are omnipresent. They fill all material bodies and occupy the whole of what we call empty space. This, then, is the universal substance from which all things proceed. Electrons would forever remain electrons unless directed where to go to be assembled into atoms and molecules, and this director is mind. A number of electrons revolving around a center of force constitute an atom. Atoms unite in absolutely regular mathematical ratios and form molecules, and these unite with each other to form a multitude of compounds which unite to build the universe. The lightest known atom is hydrogen and this is 1,700 times heavier than an electron. An atom of mercury is 300,000 times heavier than an electron. Electrons are pure negative electricity, and as they have the same potential velocity as all other cosmic energy, such as heat, light, electricity, and thought, neither time nor space require consideration. The manner in which the velocity of light was ascertained is interesting. The velocity of light was obtained by the Danish astronomer Romer in 1676 by observing the eclipse of Jupiter's moons. When the Earth was nearest to Jupiter, the eclipse appeared about eight and one-half minutes too soon for the calculations, and when the Earth was most remote from Jupiter, they were about eight and one-half minutes too late. Romer concluded the reason to be that it required 17 minutes for light from the planet to traverse the diameter of the Earth's orbit, which measured the difference of the distance of the Earth from Jupiter. This calculation has been verified and proves that light travels at about 186,000 miles a second. Electrons manifest in the body as cells and possesses mind and intelligence sufficient for them to perform their functions in the human physical anatomy. Every part of the body is composed of cells, some of which operate independently, others in community. Some are busy building tissues, while others are engaged in forming the various secretions necessary for the body. Some act as carriers of material. Others are the surgeons whose work is to repair damage. Others are scavengers carrying off waste. Others are constantly ready to repel invaders or other desirable intruders of the germ family. All these cells are moving for a common purpose, and each one is not only a living organism, but has sufficient intelligence to enable it to perform its necessary duties. It is also endowed with sufficient intelligence to conserve the energies and perpetuate its own life. It must, therefore, secure sufficient nourishment, and it has been found that it exercises choices in the selection of such nourishment. Each cell is born, reproduces itself, dies, and is absorbed. The maintenance of health and life itself depends upon the constant regeneration of these cells. It is therefore apparent that there is mind in every atom of the body. This mind is negative mind, and the power of the individual to think makes him positive, so that he can control his negative mind. This is the scientific explanation for metaphysical healing, and will enable anyone to understand the principle upon which this remarkable phenomena rests. This negative mind, which is contained in every cell of the body, has been called the subconscious mind because it acts without our conscious knowledge. We have found that this subconscious mind is responsive to the will of the conscious mind. All things have their origin in mind, and appearances are the result of thought, so that we see that things in themselves have no origin, permanency, or reality. Since they are produced by thought, they can be erased by thought. In mental, as in natural science, experiments are being made and each discovery lifts man one step higher toward his possible goal. We find that every man is the reflection of the thought he has entertained during his lifetime. This is stamped on his face, his form, his character, and his environment. Back of every effect there is a cause, and if we follow the trail to its starting point, we shall find the creative principle out of which it grew. Proofs of this are now so complete that this truth is generally accepted. 
the objective world is controlled by an unseen and heretofore unexplainable power. We have heretofore personalized this power and called it God. We have now, however, learned to look upon it as the permeating essence or principle of all that exists, the infinite or universal mind. The universal mind, being infinite and omnipotent, has unlimited resources at its command. And when we remember that it is also omnipresent, we cannot escape the conclusion that we must be an expression or manifestation of that mind. A recognition and understanding of the resources of the subconscious mind will indicate that the only difference between the subconscious and the universal is one of degree. They differ only as a drop of water differs from the ocean. They are the same in kind and quality. The difference is only of degree. Do you, can you, appreciate the value of this all-important fact? Do you realize that a recognition of this tremendous fact places you in touch with omnipotence? The subconscious mind being the connecting link between the universal mind and the conscious mind, is it not evident that the conscious mind can consciously suggest thoughts which the subconscious mind will put into action? And as the subconscious is one with the universal, is it not evident that no limit can be placed upon its activities? A scientific understanding of this principle will explain the wonderful results which are secured through the power of prayer. The results which are secured in this way are not brought about by any special dispensation of providence, but on the contrary, they are the result of the operation of a perfectly natural law. There is, therefore, nothing either religious or mysterious about it. Yet there are many who are not ready to enter into the discipline necessary to think correctly, even though it is evident that wrong thinking has brought failure. Thought is the only reality. Conditions are but the outward manifestation. As the thought changes, all outward or material conditions must change in order to be in harmony with their creator, which is thought. But the thought must be clear-cut, steady, fixed, definite, unchangeable. You cannot take one step forward and two steps backward. Neither can you spend twenty or thirty years of your life building up negative conditions as a result of negative thoughts and then expect to see them all melt away as a result of fifteen or twenty minutes of right thinking. If you enter into the discipline necessary to bring about a radical change in your life, you must do so deliberately, after giving the matter careful thought and full consideration, and then you must allow nothing to interfere with your decision. This discipline, this change of thought, this mental attitude will not only bring you the material things which are necessary for your highest and best welfare, but will bring health and harmonious conditions generally. If you wish harmonious conditions in your life, you must develop a harmonious mental attitude. Your world without will be a reflection of your world within. For your exercise this week, concentrate on harmony. And when I say concentrate, I mean all that the word implies. Concentrate so deeply, so earnestly, that you will be conscious of nothing but harmony. Remember, we learn by doing. Reading these lessons will get you nowhere. It is the practical application that the value consists. Quote, Learn to keep the door shut. Keep out of your mind and out of your world every element that seeks admittance with no definite helpful end in view. End quote. George Matthew Adams. End of Part 14. Introduction to Part 15. Experiments with parasites found on plants indicate that even the lowest order of life is enabled to take advantage of natural law. This experiment was made by Jacques Locke, M.D., Ph.D., a member of the Rockefeller Institute. In order to obtain the material, potted rose bushes are brought into a room and placed in front of a closed window. If the plants are allowed to dry out, the aphids, parasites, previously wingless, change to winged insects. And after the metamorphosis, the animals leave the plant, fly to the window, and then creep upward on the glass. It is evident that these tiny insects found that the plants on which they had been thriving were dead and that they could therefore secure nothing more to eat and drink from this source. The only method by which they could save themselves from starvation was to grow temporary wings and fly, which they did. Experiments such as these indicate the omniscience as well as the omnipotence 
is omnipresent and that the teeniest living thing can take advantage of it in an emergency. Part 15 will tell you more about the law under which we live. It will explain that these laws operate to our advantage, that all conditions and experiences that come to us are for our benefit, that we gain strength in proportion to the effort expended, and that our happiness is best obtained through the conscious cooperation with natural laws. Part 15 The laws under which we live are designed solely for our advantage. These laws are immutable, and we cannot escape from their operation. All the great eternal forces act in solemn silence, but it is in our power to place ourselves in harmony with them, and thus express a life of comparative peace and happiness. Difficulties, inharmonies, and obstacles indicate that we are either refusing to give out what we no longer need, or refusing to accept what we require. Growth is attained through an exchange of the old for the new, of the good for the better. It is a conditional or reciprocal action, for each of us is a complete thought entity, and this completeness makes it possible for us to receive only as we give. We cannot obtain what we lack if we tenaciously cling to what we have. We are able to consciously control our conditions as we have come to sense the purpose of what we attract, and are able to extract from each experience only what we require for our further growth. Our ability to do this determines the degree of harmony or happiness we attain. The ability to appropriate what we require for our growth continually increases as we reach higher planes and broader visions, and the greater our abilities to know what we require, the more certain we shall be to discern its presence, to attract it, to absorb it. Nothing may reach us except what is necessary for our growth. All conditions and experiences that come to us do so for our benefit. Difficulties and obstacles will continue to come until we absorb their wisdom and gather from them the essentials of further growth. That we reap what we sow is mathematically exact. We gain permanent strength exactly to the extent of the effort required to overcome difficulties. The inexorable requirements of growth demands that we exert the greatest degree of attraction for what is perfectly in accordance with us. Our highest happiness will be best attained through our understanding of and conscious cooperation with natural laws. In order to possess vitality, thought must be impregnated with love. Love is a product of the emotions. It is therefore essential that the emotions be controlled and guided by the intellect and reason. It is love which imparts vitality to thought and thus enables it to germinate. The law of attraction, or the law of love, for they are one and the same, will bring to it the necessary material for its growth and maturity. The first form which thought will find is language, or words. This determines the importance of words. They are the first manifestation of thought, the vessels in which thought is carried. They take hold of the ether, and by setting it in motion reproduce the thought to others in the form of sound. Thought may lead to action of any kind, but whatever the action, it is simply the thought attempting to express itself in visible form. It is evident, therefore, that if we wish desirable conditions, we can afford to entertain only desirable thoughts. This leads to an inevitable conclusion that if we wish to express abundance in our lives, we can afford to think abundance only. And as words are only the thoughts taking form, we must be especially careful to use nothing but constructive and harmonious language, which will then finally crystallize in an objective form, will prove to our advantage. We cannot escape from the picture we incessantly photograph on the mind, and this photography of erroneous conceptions is exactly what is being done by the use of words, when we use any form of language which is not identified with our welfare. We manifest more and more life as our thought becomes clarified and takes higher planes. This is obtained with greater faculty as we use word pictures that are clearly defined and relieved of the conceptions attached to them on lower planes of thought. It is with words that we must express our thoughts, and if we are to make use of higher forms of truth, we may use only such materials as has been carefully and intelligently selected with this purpose in view. This wonderful power of clothing thoughts in the form of words is what differentiates man from the rest of the animal kingdom. 
By the use of the written word, he has been enabled to look back over the centuries and see the stirring scenes by which he has come into this present inheritance. He has been enabled to come into communion with the greatest writers and thinkers of all time, and the combined record which we possess today is therefore the expression of universal thought, as it has been seeking to take form in the mind of man. We know that the universal thought has for its goal the creation of form. And we know that the individual thought is likewise forever attempting to express itself in form. And we know that the word is a thought form, and a sentence is the combination of thought forms. Therefore, if we wished our ideal to be beautiful or strong, we must see that the words out of which this temple will eventually be created are exact, that they are put together carefully, because accuracy in building words and sentences is the highest form of architecture and civilization and is a passport to success. Words are thoughts and are therefore an invisible and invincible power which will finally objectify themselves in the form they are given. Words may become mental places that will live forever, or they may become shacks which the first breeze will carry away. They may delight the eye as well as the ear. They may contain all knowledge. In them we find the history of the past as well as the hope of the future. They are living messengers from which every human and superhuman activity is born. The beauty of the word consists in the beauty of the thought. The power of the word consists in the power of the thought, and the power of the thought consists in its vitality. How shall we identify a vital thought? What are its distinguishing characteristics? It must have principle. How shall we identify principle? There is a principle of mathematics, but none of error. There is a principle of health, but none of disease. There is a principle of truth, but none of dishonesty. There is a principle of light, but none of darkness. And there is a principle of abundance, but none of poverty. How shall we know that this is true? Because if we apply the principle of mathematics correctly, we shall be certain of our results. Where there is health, there will be no disease. If we know the truth, we cannot be deceived by error. If we let in light, there can be no darkness. And where there is abundance, there can be no poverty. These are self-evident facts. But the all-important truth that a thought-containing principle is vital, and therefore contains life, and consequently takes root, and eventually but surely and certainly displaces the negative thoughts, which by their very nature can contain no vitality, is one which seems to have been overlooked. But this is a fact which shall enable you to destroy every manner of discord, lack, and limitation. There can be no question but that he who is wise enough to understand will readily recognize that the creative power of thought places an invincible weapon in his hand and makes him a master of destiny. In the physical world there is a law of compensation, which is that the appearance of any given amount of energy anywhere means the disappearance of the same amount somewhere else. And so we find that we can get only what we give. If we pledge ourselves to a certain action, we must be prepared to assume the responsibility for the development of that action. The subconscious cannot reason. It takes us at our word. We have asked for something, we are now to receive it. We, are, we have made our bed, we have now to lie in it. The die has been cast. The threads will carry out the pattern we have made. For this reason, insight must be exercised so that the thought which we entertain contains no mental, moral, or physical germ which we do not wish objectified into our lives. Insight is a faculty of the mind whereby we are enabled to examine facts and conditions at a long range, a kind of human telescope. It enables us to understand the difficulties as well as the possibilities in any undertaking. Insight enables us to be prepared for the obstacles which we shall meet. We can therefore overcome them before they have any opportunity of causing difficulty. Insight enables us to plan to advantage and turn our thought and attention in the right direction instead of into channels which can yield no possible return. Insight is therefore absolutely essential for the development of any great achievement but with it we may enter, explore, and possess any mental field. Insight is a product of the world within and is developed in the silence, 
by concentration. For your exercise this week, concentrate on insight. Take your accustomed position and focus the thought on the fact that to have a knowledge of the creative power of thought does not mean to possess the art of thinking. Let the thought dwell on the fact that knowledge does not apply itself, that our actions are not governed by knowledge, but by custom, precedent, and habit, that the only way we can get ourselves to apply knowledge is by a determined, conscious effort. Call to mind the fact that knowledge unused passes from the mind, that the value of the information is in the application of the principle. Continue this line of thought until you gain sufficient insight to formulate a definite program for applying this principle to your own particular problem. Quote, Think truly, and thy thoughts shall the world's famine feed. Speak truly, and each word of thine shall be a fruitful seed. Live truly, and thy shall be a great and noble creed. Unquote. Horatio Bonar. End of Part 15 Introduction to Part 16 The vibratory activities of the planetary universe are governed by the law of periodicity. Everything that lives has periods of birth, growth, fruitage, and decline. These periods are governed by the septimal law. The law of sevens governs the days of the week, the phases of the moon, the harmonies of sound, light, heat, electricity, magnetism, atomic structure. It governs the life of individuals and of nations, and it dominates the activities of the commercial world. Life is growth, and growth is change. Each seven years period takes us into a new cycle. The first seven years is the period of infancy, the next seven the period of childhood, representing the beginning of individual responsibility. The next seven represents the period of adolescence. The fourth period marks the attainment of full growth. The fifth period is the constructive period when men begin to acquire property, possessions, a home and family. The next, from 35 to 42, is a period of reactions and change and this in turn is followed by a period of reconstruction, adjustment and recuperation, so as to be ready for a new cycle of sevens beginning with the fiftieth year. There are many who think that the world is just about to pass out of the sixth period, that it will soon enter into the seventh period, the period of readjustment, reconstruction and harmony, the period which is frequently referred to as the millennium. Those familiar with these cycles will not be disturbed when things seem to go wrong, but can apply the principles outlined in these lessons with the full assurance that a higher law will invariably control all other laws, and that through an understanding and conscious operation of spiritual laws we can convert every seeming difficulty into a blessing. Part 16. Wealth is a product of labor. Capital is an effect, not a cause, a servant, not a master, a means, not an end. The most commonly accepted definition of wealth is that it consists of all useful and agreeable things which possess exchange value. It is this exchange value which is the predominant characteristic of wealth. When we consider the small addition made by wealth to the happiness of the possessor, we find that the true value consists not in its utility, but in its exchange. This exchange value makes it a medium for securing the things of real value whereby our ideals may be realized. Wealth should then never be desired as an end, but simply as a means of accomplishing an end. Success is contingent upon a higher ideal than the mere accumulation of riches, and he who aspires to such success must formulate an ideal for which he is willing to strive. With such an ideal in mind, the ways and means can and will be provided, but the mistake must not be made of substituting the means for the end. There must be a definite fixed purpose, an ideal. Prentice Mulford said, The man of success is the man possessed of the greatest spiritual understanding, and every great fortune comes of superior and truly great spiritual power. Unfortunately, there are those who fail to recognize this power. They forgot that Andrew Carnegie's mother had to help support the family when they came to America, that Harriman's father was a poor clergyman with a salary of only $200 a year, that Sir Thomas Lipton started with only 25 cents, 
These men had no other power to depend upon, but it did not fail them. The power to create depends entirely upon spiritual power. There are three steps, idealization, visualization, and materialization. Every captain of industry depends upon this power exclusively. In an article in Everybody's Magazine, Henry Flager, the Standard Oil multimillionaire, admitted that the secret of his success was his power to see a thing in its completeness. The following conversation with the reporter shows his power of idealization, concentration, and visualization, all spiritual powers. Did you actually vision to yourself the whole thing? I mean, did you or could you really close your eyes and see the tracks and the trains running and hear the whistles blowing? Did you go as far as that? Yes? How clearly? Very clearly. Hence, we have a vision of the law. We see cause and effect. We see that thought necessarily precedes and determines action. If we are wise, we shall come into a realization of the tremendous fact that no arbitrary condition can exist for a moment and that human experience is a result of an orderly and harmonious sequence. The successful businessman is more often than not an idealist and is every striving for higher and higher standards. The subtle forces of thought as they crystallize in our daily moods is what constitutes life. Thought is the plastic material with which we build images of our growing conception of life. Use determines its existence. As in all other things, our ability to recognize it and use it properly is the necessary condition for attainment. Premature wealth is but the forerunner of humiliation and disaster because we cannot permanently retain anything which we do not merit or which we have not earned. The conditions with which we met in the world without correspond to the conditions which we find in the world within. This is brought about by the law of attraction. How then shall we determine what is to enter into the world within? Whatever enters the mind through the senses or the objective mind will impress the mind and result in a mental image which will become a pattern for the creative energies. These experiences are largely the result of environment, chance, past thinking, and other forms of negative thought, and must be subjected to careful analysis before being entertained. On the other hand, we can form our own mental images through our own interior processes of thought regardless of the thoughts of others, regardless of exterior conditions, regardless of environment of every kind, and it is by the exercise of this power that we can control our own destiny, body, mind, and soul. It is by the exercise of this power that we take our fate out of the hands of chance and consciously make for ourselves the experiences which we desire, because when we consciously realize condition, that condition will eventually manifest in our lives. It is therefore evident that in the last analysis, thinking is the one great cause in life. Therefore, to control thought is to control circumstances, conditions, environment, and destiny. How then are we to control thought? What is the process? To think is to create a thought, but the result of the thought will depend upon its form, its quality, and its vitality. The form will depend upon the mental image from which it emanates. This will depend upon the depth of the impression, the predominance of the idea, the clarity of the vision, the boldness of the image. The quality depends upon its substance, and this depends upon the material on which the mind is composed. If this material has been woven from thoughts of vigor, strength, courage, and determination, the thought will possess these qualities. And finally, the vitality depends upon the feeling with which the thought is impregnated. If the thought is constructive, it will possess vitality, it will have life, it will grow, develop, expand, it will be creative. It will attract to itself everything necessary for its complete development. If the thought is destructive, it will have within itself the germ of its own dissolution. It will die. But in the process of dying, it will bring sickness, disease, and every other form of discord. This we call evil. And when we bring it upon ourselves, some of us are disposed to attribute our difficulties to a supreme being. 
but this supreme being is simply mind in equilibrium. It is neither good nor bad, but simply is. Our ability to differentiate it into form is our ability to manifest good or evil. Good and evil, therefore, are not entities. They are simply words which we use to indicate the results of our actions, and these actions are in turn predetermined by the character of our thought. If our thought is constructive and are harmonious, we manifest good. If it is destructive and discordant, we manifest evil. If you desire to visualize a different environment, the process is simply to hold the ideal in mind until your vision has been made real. Give no thought to persons, places, or things. These have no place in the absolute. The environment you desire will contain everything necessary. The right persons and the right things will come at the right time and in the right place. It is sometime not plain how character, ability, attainment, achievement, environment, and destiny can be controlled through the power of visualization, but this is an exact scientific fact. You will readily see that what we think determines the quality of mind, and that the quality of mind in turn determines our ability and mental capacity, and you can readily understand the improvement in our ability will naturally be followed by an increase in attainment and a greater control of circumstances. It will thus be seen that natural laws work in a perfectly natural and harmonious manner. Everything seems to just happen. If you want any evidence of this fact, simply compare results of your efforts in your own life. When your actions were prompted by high ideals and when you had selfish or ulterior motives in mind, you will need no further evidence. If you wish to bring about the realization of any desire, form a mental picture of success in your mind. By consciously visualizing your desire, in this way you will be compelling success. You will be externalizing it, your life, by a scientific method. We can only see what already exists in the objective world, but what we visualize already exists in the spiritual world. And this visualization is a substantial token of what will one day appear in the objective world if we are faithful to our ideal. The reason for this is not difficult. Visualization is a form of imagination. This process of thinking forms impressions on the mind, and these impressions in turn form concepts and ideals. And they in turn are the plans from which the master architect will weave the future. The psychologists have come to the conclusion that there is but one sense, the sense of feeling, and that all other senses are but modifications of this one sense. This being true, we know why feeling is the very fountainhead of power, why the emotions so easily overcome the intellect, and why we must put feeling into our thought if we wish results. Thought and feeling is the irresistible combination. Visualization must, of course, be directed by the will. We are not to visualize exactly what we want. We must be careful not to let the imagination run riot. Imagination is a good servant, but a poor master. And unless it is controlled, it may easily lead us into all kinds of speculations and conclusions which have no basis or foundation of fact whatsoever. Every kind of plausible opinion is liable to be accepted without any analytical examination and the inevitable result is mental chaos. We must therefore construct only such mental images as are known to be scientifically true. Subject every idea to a searching analysis and accept nothing which is not scientifically exact. When you do this, you will attempt nothing but what you know you can carry out, and success will crown your efforts. This is what businessmen call farsightedness. It is much the same as insight and is one of the great secrets of success in an all-important undertaking. For your exercise this week, try to bring yourself to a realization of the important fact that harmony and happiness are states of consciousness and do not depend upon the possession of things, that things are effects and come as a consequence of correct mental states, so that if we desire material possessions of any kind, our chief concern should be to acquire the mental attitude which will bring about the result desired. This mental attitude is brought about by a realization of our spiritual nature 
in our unity with the universal mind, which is the substance of all things. This realization will bring about everything which is necessary for our complete enjoyment. This is a scientific or correct thinking. When we succeed in bringing about this mental attitude, it is comparatively easy to realize our desire as an already accomplished fact. When we can do this, we shall have found the truth which makes us free from every lack or limitation of any kind. Quote, a man might frame and let loose a star to roll in its orbit, and yet not have done so memorable a thing before God as he who lets a golden-orbed thought to roll through the generations of time. Unquote. H. W. Beecher. End of Part 16 Introduction to Part 17 the kind of deity which a man consciously or unconsciously worships indicates the intellectual status of the worshipper. Ask the Indian of God, and he will describe to you a powerful chieftain of a glorious tribe. Ask the pagan of God, and he will tell you of a god of fire, a god of water, a god of this, that, and the other. Ask the Israelite of God, and he will tell you of the god of Moses, who conceived it expedient to rule by coercive measures, hence the Ten Commandments or of Joshua, who led the Israelites into battle, confiscated property, murdered the prisoners, and laid waste to cities. The so-called heathen made graven images of their gods, whom they were accustomed to worship, but among the most intelligent at least, these images were but the visible fulcrums with which they were enabled to mentally concentrate on the qualities which they desired to externalize in their lives. We of the twentieth century worship a god of love and theory, but in practice we make for ourselves graven images of wealth, power, fashion, custom, and conventionality. We fall down before them and worship them. We concentrate on them, and they are thereby externalized in our lives. The student who masters the contents of Part 17 will not mistake the symbols for the reality. He will be interested in causes rather than effects. He will concentrate on the realities of life, and I will not be disappointed in the results. Part 17 We are told that man has dominion over all things. This dominion is established through mind. Thought is the activity which controls every principle beneath it. The highest principle by reason of its superior essence and qualities necessarily determines the circumstances, aspects, and relation of everything with which it comes in contact. The vibrations of mental forces are the finest and consequently the most powerful in existence. To those who perceive the nature and transcendency of mental force, all physical power sinks into insignificance. We are accustomed to look upon the universe with the lens of five senses, and from these experiences our anthropomorphic conceptions originate, but true conceptions are only secured by spiritual insight. This insight requires a quickening of the vibrations of the mind, and is only secured when the mind is continuously concentrated in a given direction. Continuous concentration means an even, unbroken flow of thought, and is a result of patient, persistent, persevering, and well-regulated system. Great discoveries are the result of long-continued investigation. The science of mathematics requires years of concentrated effort to master it, and the greatest science, that of the mind, is revealed only through concentrated effort. Concentration is much misunderstood. There seems to be an idea of effort or activity associated with it, when just the contrary is necessary. The greatness of an actor lies in the fact that he forgets himself in the portrayal of his character, becoming so identified with it that the audience is swayed by the realism of the performance, this will give you a good idea of true concentration. You should be so interested in your thought, so engrossed in your subject, as to become conscious of nothing else. Such concentration leads to intuitive perception and immediate insight into the nature of the object concentrated upon. All knowledge is the result of concentration of this kind. It is thus that the secrets of heaven and earth have been rested. It is thus that the mind becomes a magnet and the desire to know draws the knowledge, irresistibly attracts it, makes it your own. Desire is largely subconscious. Conscious desire rarely realizes its object when the latter is out of immediate reach. Subconscious desire arouses the latent faculties of the mind, and difficult problems seem to solve themselves. 
The subconscious mind may be aroused and brought into action in any direction and made to serve us for any purpose by concentration. The practice of concentration requires the control of the physical, mental, and physical being. All modes of consciousness, whether physical, mental, or physical, must be under control. Spiritual truth is therefore the controlling factor. It is this which will enable you to grow out of limited attainment and reach a point where you will be able to translate modes of thought into character and consciousness. Concentration does not mean thinking of thoughts, but the transmutation of these thoughts into practical values. The average person has no conception of the meaning of concentration. There is always the cry to have, but never the cry to be. They fail to understand that they cannot have one without the other, that they must first find the kingdom before they can have the things added. Momentary enthusiasm is of no value. It is only with unbounded self-confidence that the goal is reached. The mind may place the ideal a little too high and fall short of the mark. It may attempt to soar on untrained wings and instead of flying, fall to earth but that is no reason for not making another attempt. Weakness is the only barrier to mental attainment. Attribute your weakness to physical limitations or mental uncertainties and try again. Ease and perfection are gained by repetition. The astronomer centers his mind on the stars and they give forth their secrets. The geologist centers his mind on the construction of the earth and we have geology. So with all things. Men center their minds in the problems of life, and the result is apparent in the vast and complex social order of the day. All mental discovery and attainment are the result of desire plus concentration. Desire is the strongest mode of action. The more persistent the desire, the more authoritative the revelation. Desire added to concentration will wrench any secret from nature. In realizing great thoughts, in experiencing great emotion that correspond with great thoughts, the mind is in a state where it appreciates the value of higher things. The intensity of one moment's earnest concentration and the intense longing to become and to attain may take you further than years of slow and normal forced effort. It will unfasten the prison bars of unbelief, weakness, impotence, and self-belittlement and you will come into a realization of the joy of overcoming. The spirit of initiative and originality is developed through persistence and continuity of mental effort. Business teaches the value of concentration and encourages decision of character. It develops practical insight and quickness of conclusion. The mental element in every commercial pursuit is dominant as the controlling factor, and desire is the predominating force. All commercial relations are the externalization of desire. Many of the sturdy and substantial virtues are developed in commercial employment. The mind is steadied and directed. It becomes efficient. The principal necessity is the strengthening of the mind so that it rises superior to the distractions and wayward impulses of instinctive life and thus successfully overcomes in the conflict between the higher and lower self. All of us are dynamos, but the dynamo of itself is nothing. The mind must work the dynamo. Then it is useful and its energy can be definitely concentrated. The mind is an engine whose power is undreamed. Thought is an omni-working power. It is the ruler and creator of all form and all events occurring in form. Physical energy is nothing in comparison with the omnipotence of thought, because thought enables man to harness all other natural power. Vibration is the action of thought. It is vibration which reaches out and attracts the material necessary to construct and build. There is nothing mysterious concerning the power of thought. Concentration simply implies that consciousness can be focalized to a point where it becomes identified with the object of its attention. As food absorbed is the essence of the body, so the mind absorbs the object of its attention, gives it life and being. If you concentrate on some matter of importance, the intuitive power will be set in operation, and help will come in the nature of information which will lead to success. Intuition arrives at conclusions without the aid of experience or memory. Intuition often solves problems that are beyond the grasp of the reasoning mind. 
Intuition often comes with a suddenness that is startling. It reveals the truth for which you are searching, so directly that it seems to come from a higher power. Intuition can be cultivated and developed. In order to do this, it must be recognized and appreciated. If the intuitive visitor is given a royal welcome when he comes, he will come again. The more cordial the welcome, the more frequent his visits will become. But if he is ignored or neglected, he will make his visits few and far apart. Intuition usually comes in the silence. Great minds seek solitude frequently. It is here that all the larger problems of life are worked out. For this reason, every businessman who can afford it has a private office, where he will not be disturbed. If you cannot afford a private office, you can at least find somewhere where you can be alone a few minutes each day. To train the thought along lines which will enable you to develop that invincible power which is necessary to achieve. Remember that fundamentally the subconscious is omnipotent. There is no limit to the things that can be done when it is given the power to act. Your degree of success is determined by the nature of your desire. If the nature of your desire is in harmony with natural law or the universal mind, it will gradually emancipate the mind and give you invincible courage. Every obstacle conquered, every victory gained, will give you more faith in your power, and you will have greater ability to win. Your strength is determined by your mental attitude. If this attitude is one of success and is permanently held with an unswerving purpose, you will attract to you from the invisible domain the things you silently demand. By keeping the thought in mind, it will gradually take tangible form. A definite purpose sets causes in motion which go out in the invisible world and find the material necessary to serve your purpose. You may be pursuing the symbols of power instead of power itself. You may be pursuing fame instead of honor, riches instead of wealth, position instead of servitude. In either event, you will find that they turn into ashes just as you overtake them. Premature wealth or position cannot be retained because it has not been earned. We get only what we give, and those who try to get without giving always find that the law of compensation is relentlessly bringing them about an exact equilibrium. The race has usually been for money and other mere symbols of power, but with an understanding of the true source of power we can afford to ignore the symbols. The man with a large bank account finds it unnecessary to load his pockets down with gold. So with the man who has found the true source of power, he is no longer interested in its shams or pretenses. Thought ordinarily leads outwardly in evolutionary directions but it can be turned within where it will take hold on the basic principles of things, the heart of things, the spirit of things. When you get to the heart of things, it is comparatively easy to understand and command them. This is because the spirit of a thing is the thing itself, the vital part of it, the real substance. The form is simply the outward manifestation of the spiritual activity within. For your exercise this week, concentrate as nearly as possible in accordance with the method outlined in this lesson. Let there be no conscious effort or activity associated with your purpose. Relax completely. Avoid any thought of anxiety as to results. Remember that power comes through repose. Let the thought dwell upon your object and until it is completely identified with it, until you are conscious of nothing else. If you wish to eliminate fear, concentrate on courage. If you wish to eliminate lack, concentrate on abundance. If you wish to eliminate disease, concentrate on health. Always concentrate on the ideal as an already existing fact. This is the germ cell, the life principle which goes forth and sets in motion those causes which guide, direct, and bring about the necessary relation which eventually manifest in form. Quote, Thought is the property of those who can only entertain it. Unquote. Emerson. End of part 17. Introduction to part 18. In order to grow, we must obtain what is necessary for our growth. This is brought about through the law of attraction. This principle is the sole means by which the individual is differentiated from the universal. Think for a moment. 
What would a man be if he were not a husband, father, or brother, if he were not interested in the social, economical, political, or religious world? He would be nothing but an abstract theoretical ego. He exists, therefore, only in his relation to the whole, in his relation to other men, in his relation to society. This relation constitutes his environment, and in no other way. It is evident, therefore, that the individual is simply the differentiation of the one universal mind, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, and his so-called individuality or personality consists of nothing but the manner in which he relates with the whole. This we call his environment, and is brought about by the law of attraction. Part 18, which follows, has something more to say concerning this important law. Part 18. There is a change in the thought of the world. This change is silently transpiring in our midst, and is more important than any which the world has undergone since the downfall of paganism. These present revolution in the opinions of all classes of men. The highest and most cultured of men, as well as those of the laboring classes, stands unparalleled in the history of the world. Science has of late made such vast discoveries, has revealed such an infinity of resources, has unveiled such enormous possibilities and such unsuspected forces, that scientific men more and more hesitate to affirm certain theories as established and beyond doubt, or to not deny other theories as absurd or impossible. A new civilization is being born. Customs, creeds, and precedents are passing. Vision, faith, and service are taking their place. The fetters of tradition are being melted off from humanity, and as the impurities of materialism are being consumed, thought is being liberated and truth is rising full-robed before an astonished multitude. The whole world is on the eve of a new consciousness, a new power, and a new realization within the self. Physical science has resolved matter into molecules, molecules into atoms, atoms into energy, and it has remained for Mr. J. A. Fleming in an address before the Royal Institution to resolve this energy into mind. He says, In its ultimate essence, energy may be incomprehensible by us except as an exhibition of the direct operation of that which we will call mind or will. And this mind is the indwelling and ultimate. It is immanent in matter as in spirit. It is the sustaining, energizing, all-pervading spirit of the universe. Every living thing must be sustained by this omnipotent intelligence, and we find the difference in individual lives to be largely measured by the degree of this intelligence which they manifest. It is greater intelligence that places the animal in a higher scale of being than the plant, the man higher than the animal, and we find that this increased intelligence is again indicated by the power of the individual to control modes of action, and thus to consciously adjust himself to his environment. It is this adjustment that occupies the attention of the greatest minds, and this adjustment consists in nothing else than the recognition of an existing order in the universal mind. For it is well known that this mind will obey us precisely in proportion as we first obey it. It is the recognition of natural laws that has enabled us to annihilate time and space, to soar in the air and make iron float, and the greater the degree of intelligence, the greater will be our recognition of these natural laws, and the greater will be the power we can possess. It is the recognition of the self as an individualization of this universal intelligence that enables the individual to control these forms of intelligence which have not yet reached this level of self-recognition. They do not know that this universal intelligence permeates all things ready to be called upon into action. They do not know that it is responsive to every demand, and they are therefore in bondage to the law of their own being. Thought is creative, and the principle on which the law is based is sound and legitimate, and is inherent in the nature of things. But this creative power does not originate in the individual but in the universal, which is the source and foundation of all energy and substance. The individual is simply the channel for the distribution of this energy. The individual is simply the means by which the universal produces the various combinations which result in the formation of phenomena, which depends upon the law of vibration, 
whereby various rates of rapidity of motion in the primary substance form new substances only in certain exact numerical ratios. Thought is the invisible link by which the individual comes into communication with the universal, the finite with the infinite, the seen with the unseen. Thought is the magic by which the human is transformed into a being who thinks and knows and feels and acts. As the proper apparatus has enabled the eye to discover worlds without number millions of miles away, so with the proper understanding, man has been enabled to communicate with the universal mind, the source of all power. The understanding which is usually developed is about as valuable as a VCR without a videotape. In fact, it is usually nothing more than a belief, which means nothing at all. The savages of the cannibal islands believe something, but that proves nothing. The only belief which is of any value to anyone is a belief that has been put to a test and demonstrated to be a fact. It is then no longer a belief, but has become a living faith or truth. And this truth has been put to the test by hundreds of thousands of people, and has been found to be the truth exactly in proportion to the usefulness of the apparatus which they used. A man would not expect to locate stars hundreds of millions of miles away without a sufficiently strong telescope. And for this reason, science is continually engaged in building larger and more powerful telescopes and is continually rewarded by additional knowledge of the heavenly bodies. So with understanding, men are continually making progress in the methods with which they use to come into communication with the universal mind and its infinite possibilities. The universal mind manifests itself in the objective through the principle of attraction that each atom has for every other atom, in infinite degrees of intensity. It is by this principle of combining and attracting that things are brought together. This principle is of universal application and is the sole means whereby the purpose of existence is carried into effect. The expression of growth is met in a most beautiful manner through the instrumentality of this universal principle. In order to grow, we must obtain what is essential for our growth. But as we are at all times a complete thought entity, this completeness makes it possible for us to receive only as we give. Growth is therefore conditioned on reciprocal action, and we find that on a mental plane like attracts like, that mental vibrations respond only to the extent of their vibratory harmony. It is clear, therefore, that thoughts of abundance will respond only to similar thoughts, the wealth of the individual is seen to be what he inherently is. Affluence within is found to be the secret of attraction for affluence without. The ability to produce is found to be the real source of wealth of the individual. It is for this reason that he who has his heart in his work is certain to meet with unbounded success. He will give and continually give, and the more he gives, the more he will receive. What do the great financiers of Wall Street, the captains of industry, the statesmen, the great corporation attorneys, the inventors, the physicians, the authors, what do each of these contribute to the sum of human happiness but the power of their thought? Thought is the energy which the law of abundance is brought into operation, which eventually manifests in abundance. The universal mind is static mind, or substance in equilibrium. It is differentiated into form by our power to think. Thought is the dynamic phase of mind. Power depends upon consciousness of power. Unless we use it, we shall lose it. And unless we are conscious of it, we cannot use it. The use of this power depends upon attention. The degree of attention determines our capacity for the acquirement of knowledge which is another name for power. Attention has been held to be the distinguishing mark of genius. The cultivation of attention depends upon practice. The incentive of attention is interest. The greater the interest, the greater the attention. The greater the attention, the greater the interest. Action and reaction. Begin by paying attention. Before long you will have aroused interest. This interest will attract more attention, and this attention will produce more interest, and so on. This practice will enable you to cultivate the power of attention. This week, concentrate upon your power to create. Seek insight, perception. Try to find a logical basis for the faith which is in you. 
Let the thought dwell on the fact that the physical man lives and moves, and has his being in the sustainer of all organic life air, that he must breathe to live. Then let the thought rest on the fact that the spiritual man also lives and moves, and has his being in a similar but subtler energy upon which he must depend for life, and that as in the physical world no life assumes form until after a seed is sown and no higher fruit than that of the parent stock can be produced. So in the spiritual world no effect can be produced until the seed is sown, and the fruit will depend upon the nature of the seed, so that the result which you secure depend upon your perception of law in the mighty domain of causation, the highest evolution of human consciousness. Quote, there is no thought in my mind, but it quickly tends to convert itself into a power, and organizes a huge instrumentality of means." Unquote. Emerson. End of Part 18 Introduction to Part 19 Fear is a powerful form of thought. It paralyzes the nerve centers, thus affecting the circulation of the blood. This, in turn, paralyzes the muscular system, so that fear affects the entire being, body, brain, and nerve physical, mental, and muscular. Of course, the way to overcome fear is to become conscious of power. What is this mysterious vital force which we call power? We do not know, but then neither do we know what electricity is. But we do know that by conforming to the requirements of the law by which electricity is governed, it will be our obedient servant, that it will light our homes, our cities, run our machinery and service in many useful capacities. And so it is with vital force. Although we do not know what it is, and possibly may never know, we do know that it is a primary force which manifests through living bodies, and that by complying with the laws and principles by which it is governed, we can open ourselves to a more abundant inflow of this vital energy, and thus express the highest possible degree of mental, moral, and spiritual efficiency. This part tells of a very simple way of developing this spiritual force. If you put into practice the information outlined in this lesson, you will soon develop the sense of power which has ever been the distinguishing mark of genius. Part 19 The search for truth is no longer a haphazard adventure, but it is a systematic process and is logical in its operation. Every kind of experience is given a voice in shaping its decision. In seeking the truth, we are seeking ultimate cause. We know that every human experience is an effect. Then, if we may ascertain the cause, and if we shall find that this cause is one which we can consciously control, the effect or the experience will be within our control also. Human experience will then no longer be the football of fate. A man will not be the child of fortune, but destiny. Fate and fortune will be controlled as readily as a captain controls a ship, or an engineer his train. All things are finally resolvable into the same element, and as they are thus translatable one into the other, they must ever be in relation and may never be in opposition to one another. In the physical world there are innumerable contrasts, and these may be for convenience sake be designated by distinctive names. There are sizes, colors, shades, or ends to all things. There is a North Pole and a South Pole, an inside and an outside, a seen and an unseen. But these expressions merely serve to place extremes in contrast. They are names given to two separate parts of one quantity. The two extremes are relative. They are not separate entities. They are two parts or aspects of the whole. In the mental world we find the same law. We speak of knowledge and ignorance, but ignorance is but a lack of knowledge, and is therefore found to be simply a word to express the absence of knowledge. It has no principle in itself. In the moral world we again find the same law. We speak of good and evil, but good is a reality, something tangible, while evil is found to be simply a negative condition, the absence of good. Evil is sometimes thought to be a very real condition but it has no principle, no vitality, no life. We know this because it can always be destroyed by good. Just as truth destroys error and light destroys darkness, so evil vanishes when good appears. There is therefore but one principle in the moral world. 
we find exactly the same law obtaining in the spiritual world. We speak of mind and matter as two separate entities, but clear insight makes it evident that there is but one operative principle, and that is mind. Mind is the real and the eternal. Matter is forever changing. We know that in the eons of time a hundred years is but as a day. If we stand in any large city and let the eye rest on the innumerable large and magnificent buildings, the vast array of modern automobiles, cellular telephones, the electric lights, and all the other conveniences of modern civilization, we re may remember that not one of them was there just over a century ago. And if we could stand on the same spot in a hundred years from now, in all probability we should find that but a few of them remained. In the animal kingdom we find the same law of change. The millions and millions of animals come and go, a few years constituting their span of life. In the plant world the change is still more rapid. Many plants and nearly all grasses come and go in a single year. When we pass to the inorganic we expect to find something more substantial. But as we gaze on the apparently solid continent we are told that it arose from the ocean. We see the giant mountain, and we are told that the place where it now stands was once a lake. And as we stand in awe before the great cliffs in the Yosemite Valley, we can easily trace the path of the glaciers which carried all before them. We are in the presence of continual change, and we know that this change is but the evolution of the universal mind, the grand process whereby all things are continually being created anew. And we come to know that matter is but a form which mind takes, and is therefore simply a condition. Matter has no principle. Mind is the only principle. We have then come to know that mind is the only principle which is operative in the physical, mental, moral, and spiritual world. We also know that this mind is static, mind at rest. We also know that the ability of the individual to think is his ability to act upon the universal mind and convert it into dynamic mind or mind in motion. In order to do this, fuel must be applied in the form of food, for man cannot think without eating. And so we find that even a spiritual activity such as thinking cannot be converted into sources of pleasure and profit except by making use of material means. It requires energy of some kind to collect electricity and convert it into dynamic power. It requires the rays of the sun to give the necessary energy to sustain plant life. So it also requires energy in the form of food to enable the individual to think and thereby act upon the universal mind. You may know that thought constantly, eternally is taking form, is forever seeking expression, or you may not, but the fact remains that if your thought is powerful, constructive, and positive, this will be plainly evident in the state of your health, your business, and your environment. If your thought is weak, critical, destructive, and negative generally, it will manifest in your body as fear, worry, and nervousness, in your finances, lack and limitation, and in discordant conditions in your environment. All wealth is the offspring of power. Possessions are of value only as they confer power. Events are significant only as they affect power. All things represent certain forms and degrees of power. A knowledge of cause and effect is shown by the laws governing steam, electricity, chemical affinity, and gravitation enables men to plan courageously and to execute fearlessly. These laws are called natural laws because they govern the physical world. But all power is not physical power. There is also mental power, and there is moral and spiritual power. What are our schools, our universities, but mental powerhouses, places where mental power is being developed? As there are many mighty powerhouses for the application of power to ponderous machinery, whereby raw material is collected and converted into the necessities and comforts of life, so the mental powerhouses collect the raw material and cultivate and develop it into a power which is infinitely superior to all the forces of nature, marvelous though they may be. What is this raw material which has been collected into these thousands of mental powerhouses all over the world and developed into the power which is evidently controlling every other power? In its static form it is mind. In its dynamic form it is thought. This power is superior because it exists on a higher plane. 
because it has enabled man to discover the law by which these wonderful forces of nature could be harnessed and made to do work of hundreds and thousands of men. It has enabled man to discover laws whereby time and space have been annihilated, and the law of gravitation overcome. Thought is the vital force or energy which has been developed and which has produced such startling results in the last half century as to bring about a world which would be absolutely inconceivable to a man existing only fifty or twenty-five years ago. If such results had been secured by organizing these mental powerhouses in fifty years, what may not be expected in another fifty years? The substance from which all things are created is infinite in quantity. We know that light travels at the rate of 186,000 miles per second, and we know that there are stars so remote that it takes light 2,000 years to reach us, and we know that such stars exist in all parts of the heaven. We know, too, that this light comes in waves, so that if the ether on which these waves travel was not continuous, the light would fail to reach us. We can then only come to the conclusion that this substance or ether or raw material is universally present. How, then, does it manifest in form? In electrical science, a battery is formed by connecting the opposite poles of zinc and copper, which causes the current to flow from one to the other and so provides energy. This same process is repeated in respect to every polarity, and as all form simply depends upon the rate of vibration and consequent relations of atoms to each other, if we wish to change the form of manifestation, we must change the polarity. This is the principle of causation. For your exercise this week, concentrate. And when I use the word concentrate, I mean all that the word implies. Become so absorbed in the object of your thought that you are conscious of nothing else. And do this a few minutes every day. You take the necessary time to eat in order that your body may be nourished. Why not take the time to assimilate your mental food? Let the thought rest on the fact that appearance are deceptive. The earth is not flat, neither is it stationary. The sky is not a dome, the sun does not move, the stars are not small specks of light, and matter which was once supposed to be fixed has been found to be in a state of perpetual flux. Try to realize that the day is fast approaching, its dawn is now at hand, when modes of thought and action must be adjusted to rapidly increasing knowledge of the operation of eternal principles. Quote, Silent thought is, after all, the mightiest agent in human affairs. Unquote. Channing. End of Part 19 Introduction to Part 20 For many years there has been an endless discussion as to the origin of evil. Theologians have told us that God is love, and that God is omnipresent. If this be true, there is no place where God is not. Where, then, is evil, Satan, and hell? Let us see. God is spirit. Spirit is the creative principle of the universe. Man is made in the image and likeness of God. Man is therefore a spiritual being. The only activity which spirit possesses is the power to think. Thinking is therefore a creative process. All form is therefore the result of the thinking process. The destruction of form must also be the result of the thinking process. Fictitious representations of form are the result of the creative power of thought, as in hypnotism. Apparent representation of form are the result of the creative power of thought, as in spiritualism. Invention, organization, and the constructive work of all kinds are the result of the creative power of thought, as in concentration. When the creative power of thought is manifested for the benefit of humanity, we call the result good. When the creative power of thought is manifested in a destructive or evil manner, we call the result evil. This indicates the origin of both good and evil. They are simply words which have been coined in order to indicate the nature of the result of the thinking or creative process. Thought necessarily proceeds and predetermines action. Action proceeds and predetermines condition. Part 20 will throw more light upon this important subject. Part 20. The spirit of a thing is that thing. It is necessarily fixed, changeless, and eternal. The spirit of you is you. Without the spirit you would be nothing. 
It becomes active through your recognition of it and its possibilities. You may have all the wealth in Christendom, but unless you recognize it and make use of it, it will have no value. So with your spiritual wealth, unless you recognize it and use it, it will have no value. The one and only condition of spiritual power is use or recognition. All great things come through recognition. The scepter of power is consciousness, and thought is its messenger. And this messenger is constantly molding the realities of the invisible world into the conditions and environments of your objective world. Thinking is the true business of life. Power is the result. You are at all times dealing with the magical power of thought and consciousness. What results can you expect so long as you remain oblivious to the power which has been placed within your control? So long as you do this, you limit yourself to superficial conditions and make of yourself a beast of burden for those who think, those who recognize their power, those who know that unless we are willing to think, we shall have to work, and the less we think, the more we shall have to work, and the less we shall get for our work. The secret of power is a perfect understanding of the principles, forces, methods, and combinations of mind, and a perfect understanding of our relationship to the universal mind. It is well to remember that this principle is unchangeable. If this were not so, it would not be reliable. All principles are changeless. This stability is your opportunity. You are its active attribute, the channel for its activity. The universal can act only through the individual. When you begin to perceive that the essence of the universal is within yourself, is you, you begin to do things. You begin to feel your power. It is the fuel which fires the imagination, which lights the torch of inspiration, which gives vitality to thought, which enables you to connect with all the invisible forces of the universe. It is this power which will enable you to plan fearlessly, to execute masterfully. But perception will come only in the silence. This seems to be the condition required for all great purposes. You are a visualizing entity. Imagination is your workshop. It is here that your ideal is to be visualized. As a perfect understanding of the nature of this power is a primary condition for its manifestation, visualize the entire method over and over again, so that you may use it whenever occasions re require. The infinity of wisdom is to follow the method whereby we may have the inspiration of the omnipotent universal mind on demand at any time. We can fail to recognize this world within, and so exclude it from our consciousness, but it will still be the basic fact of all existence. And when we learn to recognize it, not only in ourselves, but in all persons, events, things, and circumstances, we shall have found the kingdom of heaven, which we are told is within us. Our failures are the result of the operation of exactly the same principle. The principle is unchangeable. Its operation is exact. There is no deviation. If we think lack, limitation, discord, we shall find their fruits on every hand. If we think poverty, unhappiness, or disease, the thought messengers will carry the summons as readily as any other kind of thought, and the result will be just as certain. If we fear a coming calamity, we shall be able to say with Job, The thing I feared has come upon me. If we think unkindly or ignorantly, we shall thus attract to ourselves the results of our ignorance. This power of thought, if understood and correctly used, is the greatest labor-saving device ever dreamed of. But if not understood or improperly used, the result will in all probability be disastrous. As we have already seen, by the help of this power, you can confidently undertake things that are seemingly impossible, because this power is the secret of all inspiration, all genius. To become inspired means to get out of the beaten path, out of the rut, because extraordinary results require extraordinary means. When we come into a recognition of the unity of all things and at the source of all powers within, we tap the source of inspiration. Inspiration is the art of imbibing, the art of self-realization, the art of adjusting the individual mind to that of the universal mind, the art of attaching the proper mechanism to the source of all power, the art of differentiating the formless into the form, 
the art of becoming a channel for the flow of infinite wisdom, the art of visualizing perfection, the art of realizing the omnipresence of omnipotence, an understanding and appreciation of the fact that the infinite power is omnipresent and is therefore in the infinitely small as well as the infinitely large will enable us to absorb its essence, a further understanding of the fact that this power is spirit and therefore indivisible will enable us to appreciate its present at all points at the same time. An understanding of these facts, first intellectually and then emotionally, will enable us to drink deeply from this ocean of infinite power. An intellectual understanding will be of no assistance. The emotions must be brought into action. Thought without feeling is cold. The required combination is thought and feeling. Inspiration is from within. The silence is necessary. The senses must be stilled. The muscles relaxed. Repose cultivated. When you have thus come into possession of a sense of poise and power, you will be ready to receive the information or inspiration of wisdom which may be necessary for the development of your purpose. Do not confuse these methods with those of the clairvoyant. They have nothing in common. Inspiration is the art of receiving and makes for all that is best in life. Your business in life is to understand and command these invisible forces instead of letting them command and rule you. Power implies service. Inspiration implies power. To understand and apply the method of inspiration is to become a superman. We can live more abundantly every time we breathe if we consciously breathe with that intention. The if is a very important condition in this case, as the intention governs the attention. And without the attention you can secure only the results which everyone else secures, that is, a supply equal to the demand. In order to secure the larger supply, your demand must be increased. And as you consciously increase the demand, the supply will follow. You will find yourself coming into a larger and larger supply of life, energy, and vitality. The reason for this is not difficult to understand, but it is another of the vital mysteries of life which does not seem to be generally appreciated. If you make it your own, you will find it one of the great realities of life. We are told that, in Him we live and move and have our being. And we are told that He is a spirit and again that He is love. So that every time we breathe, we breathe His life, love and spirit. This is pranic energy or pranic ether. We could not exist a moment without it. It is the cosmic energy. It is the life of the solar plexus. Each time we breathe, we fill our lungs with air and at the same time vitalize our body with this pranic ether which is life itself, so that we have the opportunity of making a conscious connection with all life, all intelligence, and all substance. A knowledge of your relation and oneness with this principle that governs the universe, and the simple method whereby you can consciously identify yourself with it, gives you a scientific understanding of a law whereby you may free yourself from disease, from lack of limitation of any kind. In fact, it enables you to breathe the breath of life, into your own nostrils. This breath of life is a superconscious reality. It is the essence of the I am. It is pure being or universal substance and our conscious unity with it enables us to localize it and thus exercise the powers of this creative energy. Thought is a creative vibration and the quality of the conditions created will depend upon the quality of our thought because we cannot express powers which we do not possess. We must be before we can do, and we can do only to the extent to which we are. And so what we do will necessarily coincide with what we are, and what we are depends upon what we think. Every time you think, you start a train of causation which will create a condition in strict accordance with the quality of the thought which originated it. Thought which is in harmony with the universal mind will result in corresponding conditions. Thought which is destructive or discordant will produce corresponding results. You may use thought constructively or destructively, but the immutable law will not allow you to plant a thought of one kind and reap the fruit of another. You are free to use this marvelous creative power as you will, but you must take the consequences. This is the danger from what is called willpower. 
There are those who seem to think that by force of will they can coerce this law, that they can sow seed of one kind and by willpower make it bear fruit of another. But the fundamental principle of creative power is in the universal, and therefore the idea of forcing a compliance with our wishes by the power of the individual will is an inverted conception which may appear to succeed for a while, but is eventually doomed to failure, because it antagonizes the very power which it is seeking to use. It is the individual attempting to coerce the universal, the finite in conflict with the infinite. Our permanent well-being will be best conserved by a conscious cooperation with the continuous forward movement of the great whole. For your exercise this week, go into the silence and concentrate on the fact that in him we live and move and have our being is literally and scientifically exact that you are because he is that if he is omnipresent he must be in you that if he is all in you you must be in him that he is spirit and you are made in his image and likeness and that the only difference between his spirit and your spirit is one of degree that a part must be the same in kind and quality as the whole when you can realize this clearly, you will have found the secret of the creative power of thought. You will have found the origin of both good and evil. You will have found the secret of the wonderful power of concentration. You will have found the key to the solution of every problem, whether physical, financial, or environmental. Quote, the power to think consecutively and deeply and clearly is an avowed and deadly enemy to mistakes and blunders, superstitions, unscientific theories, irrational beliefs, unbridled enthusiasm, fanaticism. Unquote. Haddock. End of Part 20. Introduction to Part 21. It is my privilege to enclose Part 21. In paragraph 7 you will find that one of the secrets of success, one of the methods of organizing victory, one of the accomplishments of the master mind is to think big thoughts. In paragraph 8, you will find that everything which we hold in our consciousness for any length of time becomes impressed upon our subconsciousness, and so becomes a pattern which the creative energy will wave into our life and environment. This is the secret of the wonderful power of prayer. We know that the universe is governed by law, that for every effect there must be a cause, and at that same cause, under the same conditions, will invariably produce the same effect. Consequently, if prayer has ever been answered, it will always be answered, if the proper conditions are complied with. This must necessarily be true, otherwise the universe would be a chaos instead of a cosmos. The answer to prayer is therefore subject to law, and this law is definite, exact, and scientific just as are the laws governing gravitation and electricity. An understanding of this law takes the foundation of Christianity out of the realm of superstition and credulity and places it upon the firm rock of scientific understanding. But unfortunately there are comparatively few people who know how to pray. They understand that there are laws governing electricity, mathematics, and chemistry, but for some inexplicable reason it never seems to occur to them that there are also spiritual laws, and that these laws are also definite, scientific, exact, and operate with immutable precision. Part 21 The real secret of power is consciousness of power. The universal mind is unconditional. Therefore, the more conscious we become of our unity with this mind, the less conscious we shall become of conditions and limitations. And as we become emancipated or freed from conditions, we come to a realization of the unconditional. We have become free. As soon as we become conscious of the inexhaustible power in the world within, we begin to draw on this power and apply and develop the great possibilities which this discernment has realized. Because whatever we become conscious of is invariably manifested in the objective world, is brought forth into tangible expression. This is because the infinite mind, which is the source from which all things proceed, is one and indivisible, and each individual is a channel whereby this eternal energy is being manifested. Our ability to think is our ability to act upon this universal substance, and what we think is what is created or produced in the objective world. 
The result of this discovery is nothing less than marvelous. It means that mind is extraordinary in quality, limitless in quantity, and contains possibilities without number. To become conscious of this power is to become a live wire. It has the same effect as placing an ordinary wire in contact with a wire that is charged. The universal is the live wire. It carries power sufficient to meet every situation which may arise in the life of every individual. When the individual mind touches the universal mind, it receives all the power it requires. This is the world within. All science recognizes the reality of this world, and all power is contingent upon our recognition of this world. The ability to eliminate imperfect conditions depends upon mental action, and mental action depends upon consciousness of power. Therefore, the more conscious we become of our unity with the source of all power, the greater will be our power to control and master every condition. Large ideas have a tendency to eliminate all smaller ideas, so that it is well to hold ideas large enough to counteract and destroy all small and undesirable tendencies. This will remove innumerable petty and annoying obstacles from your path. You also become conscious of a larger world of thought, thereby increasing your mental capacity as well as placing yourself in position to accomplish something of value. This is one of the secrets of success, one of the methods of organizing victory, one of the accomplishments of the master mind. He thinks big thoughts. The creative energies of mind find no more difficulty in handling large situations than small ones. Mind is just as much present in the infinitely large as it is in the infinitely small. When we realize these facts concerning mind, we understand how we may bring ourselves any condition by creating the corresponding conditions in our consciousness, because everything which is held for any length of time in the consciousness eventually becomes impressed upon the subconscious, and thus becomes a pattern which the creative energy will wave into the life and environment of the individual. In this way, conditions are produced, and we find that our lives are simply the reflection of our predominant thoughts, our mental attitudes. We see then that the science of correct thinking is the one science, that it includes all other sciences. From this science, we learn that every thought creates an impression on the brain, that these impressions create mental tendencies, and these tendencies create character, ability, and purpose and that the combined action of character, ability, and purpose determines the experiences with which we shall meet in life. These experiences come to us through the law of attraction. Through the action of this law we meet in the world without the experiences which correspond to our world within. The predominant thought or the mental attitude is the magnet, and the law is that like attracts like. Consequently, the mental attitude will invariably attract such conditions as corresponds to its nature. This mental attitude is our personality, and is composed of the thoughts which we have been creating in our own mind. Therefore, if we wish a change in conditions, all that is necessary is to change our thought. This will in turn change our mental attitude, which will in turn change our personality, which will in turn change the persons, things, and conditions or the experiences with which we meet in life. It is, however, no easy matter to change the mental attitude, but by persistent effort it may be accomplished. The mental attitude is patterned after the mental pictures which have been photographed on the brain. If you do not like the pictures, destroy the negatives and create new pictures. This is the art of visualization. As soon as you have done this, you will begin to attract new things and the new things will correspond to the new pictures. To do this, impress on the mind a perfect picture of the desire which you wish to have objectified, and continue to hold the picture in the mind until the results are obtained. If the desire is one which requires determination, ability, talent, courage, power, or any other spiritual power, these are necessary essentials for your picture. Build them in. They are the vital part of the picture. They are the feeling which combines with thought and creates the irresistible magnetic power which draws the things you require to you. They give your picture life, and life means growth, and as soon as it begins to grow, the result is practically assured. 
Do not hesitate to aspire to the highest possible attainments in anything you may undertake, for the mind forces are ever ready to lend themselves to a purposeful will in the effort to crystallize its highest aspiration into acts, accomplishments, and events. An illustration of how these mind forces operate is suggested by the method in which all our habits are formed. We do a thing, then do it again and again and again until it becomes easy and perhaps almost automatic. And the same rule applies in breaking any and all bad habits. We stop doing a thing and then avoid it again and again until we are entirely free from it. And if we do fail now and then, we should by no means lose hope, for the law is absolute and invincible and gives us credit for every effort and every success, even though our efforts and successes are perhaps intermittent. There is no limit to what this law can do for you. Dare to believe in your own idea. Remember that nature is plastic to the ideal. Think of the ideal as an already accomplished fact. The real battle of life is one of ideas. It is being fought out by the few against the many. On the one side is the constructive and creative thought. On the other side, the destructive and negative thought. The creative thought is dominated by an ideal. The passive thought is dominated by appearances. On both sides are men of science, men of letters, and men of affairs. On the creative side are men who spend their time in laboratories or over microscopes and telescopes, side by side with the men who dominate the commercial, political, and scientific world. On the negative side are men who spend their time investigating law and precedent, men who mistake theology for religion, statesmen who mistake might for right, and all the millions who seem to prefer precedent to progress, who are eternally looking backward instead of forward who see only the world without, but know nothing of the world within. In the last analysis, there are but these two classes, all men who have to take their place on one side or another. They will have to move forward or go back. There is no standing still in the world where all is motion. It is this attempt to stand still that gives sanction and force to arbitrary and, and unequal codes of law. That we are in a period of transition is evidenced by the unrest which is everywhere apparent. The complaint of humanity is as a roll of heaven's artillery, commencing with low and threatening notes and increasing until a sound is sent from cloud to cloud and the lightning splits the air and earth. The sentries who patrol the most advanced outputs of the industrial, political, and religious world are calling anxiously to each other. What of the night? The danger and insecurity of the position they occupy and attempt to hold is becoming more apparent every hour. The dawn of a new era necessarily declares that the existing order of things cannot much longer be. The issue between the old regime and the new, the crux of the social problem, is entirely a question of conviction in the minds of the people as to the nature of the universe. When they realize that the transcendent force of spirit or mind of the cosmos is within each individual, it will be possible to frame laws that shall consider the liberties and rights of the many instead of the privileges of the few. As long as the people regard the cosmic power as a power non-human and alien to humanity, so long will it be comparatively easy for a supposed privileged class to rule by divine right in spite of every protest of social sentiment. The real interest of democracy is therefore to exalt, emancipate, and recognize the divinity of the human spirit, to recognize that all power is from within, that no human being has any more power than any other human being, except such as may willingly be delegated to him. The old regime would have us believe that the law was superior to lawmakers. Herein is the gist of the social crime of every form of privilege and personal inequality the institutionalizing of the fatalistic doctrine of the divine election. The divine mind is the universal mind. It makes no exceptions. It plays no favorites. It does not act through sheer caprice or from anger, jealousy, or wrath. Neither can it be flattered, cajoled, or moved by sympathy or petition to supply man with some need which he thinks necessary for his happiness or even his existence. The divine mind makes no exceptions to favor any individual, but when the individual understands and realizes his unity with the universal principle, he will appear to be favored because he will have found the source of all health, 
all wealth, and all power. For your exercise this week, concentrate on the truth. Try to realize that the truth shall make you free. That is, nothing can permanently stand in the way of your perfect success when you learn to apply the scientifically correct thought methods and principle. Realize that you are externalizing in your environment your inherent soul potencies. Realize that the silence offers an ever-available and almost unlimited opportunity for awakening the highest conception of truth. Try to comprehend that omnipotence itself is absolute silence. All else is change, activity, limitation. Silent thought concentration is therefore the true method of reaching, awakening, and then expressing the wonderful potential power of the world within. Quote, the possibilities of thought training are infinite, its consequence eternal, and yet few take the pains to direct their thinking into channels that will do them good, but instead leave all to chance. Unquote. Martin. End of Part 21 Introduction to Part 22 In Part 22 you will find that thoughts are spiritual seeds, which when planted in the subconscious mind have a tendency to sprout and grow, but unfortunately the fruit is frequently not to our liking. The various forms of inflammation, paralysis, nervousness, and diseased conditions generally are the manifestations of fear, worry, care, anxiety, jealousy, hatred, and similar thought. The life processes are carried on by two distinct methods. First, the taking up and making use of nutritive material necessary for constructing cells. Second, breaking down and excreting the waste material. All life is based upon these constructive and deconstructive activities, and as food, water, and air are the only requisites necessary for the construction of cells, it would seem that the problem of prolonging life indefinitely would not be a very difficult one. However strange it may seem, it is the second or destructive activity that is, with rare exception, the cause of all disease. The waste material accumulates and saturates the tissue, which causes auto-intoxication. This may be partial or general. In the first case, the disturbance will be local. In the second place, it will affect the whole system. The problem, then, before us is the healing of disease is to increase the inflow and distribution of vital energy throughout the system, and this can only be done by eliminating thoughts of fear, worry, care, anxiety, jealousy, hatred, and every other destructive thought which tend to tear down and destroy the nerves and glands which control the excretion and elimination of poisonous and waste matter. Nourishing foods and strengthening tonics cannot bestow life, because these are but secondary manifestations to life. The primary manifestation of life and how you may get in touch with it is explained in the part which I have the privilege of enclosing herewith. Part 22. Knowledge is of priceless value, because by applying knowledge we can make our future what we wish it to be. When we realize that our present character, our present environment, our present ability, our present physical condition are all the result of past methods of thinking, we shall begin to have some conception of the value of knowledge. If the state of our health is not all that could be desired, let us examine our method of thinking. Let us remember that every thought produces an impression on mind. Every impression is a seed which will sink into the subconscious and form a tendency. The tendency will be to attract other similar thoughts, and before we know it, we shall have a crop which we must be harvested. If these thoughts contain disease germs, the harvest will be sickness, decay, weakness, and failure. The question is, what are we thinking? What are we creating? What is the harvest to be? If there is any physical condition which it is necessary to change, the law governing visualization will be found effective. Make a mental image of physical perfection. Hold it in the mind until it is absorbed by the consciousness. Many have eliminated chronic ailments in a few weeks by this method, and thousands have overcome and destroyed all manners of ordinary physical disturbances by this method in a few days sometimes in a few minutes. It is through the law of vibration that the mind exercises this control over the body. 
we know that every mental action is a vibration and we know that all form is simply a mode of motion a rate of vibration therefore any given vibration immediately modifies every atom in that body every life cell is affected and an entire chemical change is made in every group of life cells everything in the universe is what it is by virtue of its rate of vibration change the rate of vibration and you change the nature quality and form the vast panorama of nature both visible and invisible is being constantly changed by simply changing the rate of vibration and as thought is the vibration we can also exercise this power we can change the vibration and thus produce any condition which we desire to manifest in our bodies we are all using this power every minute the trouble is most of us are using it unconsciously and thus producing undesirable results the problem is to use it intelligently and produce only desirable results this should not be difficult because we have all had sufficient experience to know what produces pleasant vibration in the body and we also know the causes which produce the unpleasant and disagreeable sensations all that is necessary is to consult our own experience when our thought has been uplifted progressive constructive courageous noble kind or in any other way desirable we have set in motion vibrations which brought about certain results when our thoughts have been filled with envy hatred jealousy criticism or any other thousand and one forms of discord certain vibrations were set into motion which brought about certain other results of a different nature and each of these rates of vibration if kept up crystallized in form in the first case the result was mental moral and physical health and in the second case discord in harmony and disease we can understand then something of the power which the mind possesses over the body the objective mind has certain effects on the body which are readily recognized someone says something to you which strikes you as ludicrous and you laugh possibly until your whole body shakes which shows that thought has control over the muscles of your body or someone says something which excites your sympathy and your eyes fill with tears which shows that thought controls the glands of your body or someone says something which makes you angry and the blood mounts to your cheek which shows that thought controls the circulation of your blood but as these experiences are all the result of the action of your objective mind over the body the results are of a temporary nature they soon pass away and leave the situation as it was before let us see how the action of the subconscious mind over the body differs you receive a wound thousands of cells begin the work of healing at once in a few days or a few weeks the work is complete you may even break a bone no surgeon on earth can weld the parts together I am not referring to the insertion of rods or other devices to strengthen or replace bones he may set the bone for you and the subjective mind will immediately begin the process of welding the parts together and in a short time the bone is as solid as it ever was you may swallow poison the subjective mind will immediately discover the danger and make violent efforts to eliminate it you may become infected with a dangerous germ the subjective will at once commence to build a wall around the infected area and destroy the infection by absorbing it into the white blood corpuscles which it supplies for the purpose these processes of the subconscious mind usually proceed without our personal knowledge or direction and so long as we do not interfere the result is perfect but as these millions of repair cells are all intelligent and respond to our thought they are often paralyzed and rendered impotent by our thoughts of fear doubt and anxiety they are like an army of workmen ready to start an important piece of work but every time they get started on the undertaking a strike is called or plans change until they finally get discouraged and give up the way to health is founded on the law of vibration which is the basis of all science and this law is brought into operation by the mind the world within it is a matter of individual effort and practice our world of power with, is within if we are wise we shall not waste time and effort in trying to deal with the facts as we find them in the world without which is only an external a reflection we shall always find the cause in the world within by changing the cause we change the effect 
Every cell in your body is intelligent and will respond to your direction. The cells are all creators and will create the exact pattern which you give them. Therefore, when perfect images are placed before the subjective, the creative energies will build a perfect body. Brain cells are constructed in the same way. The quality of the brain is governed by the state of mind, or mental attitude, so that if undesirable mental attitudes are conveyed to the subjective, they will in turn be transformed to the body. We can therefore readily see that if we wish the body to manifest health, strength, and vitality, this must be the predominant thought. We know that every element of the human body is the result of a rate of vibration. We know that mental action is a rate of vibration. We know that a higher rate of vibration governs, modifies, controls, changes, or destroys a lower rate of vibration. We know that the rate of vibration is governed by the character of brain cells, and finally, we know how to create these brain cells. Therefore, we know how to make any physical change in the body we desire. And having secured a working knowledge of the power of mind to this extent, we have come to know that there is practically no limitation which can be placed upon our ability to place ourselves in harmony with natural law, which is omnipotent. This influence or control over the body by mind is coming to be more and more generally understood and many physicians are now giving the matter their earnest attention. Dr. Albert Schofield, who has written several important books on the subject, says, The subject of mental therapeutics is still ignored in medical works generally. In our physiologies, no reference is made to the central controlling power that rules the body for its good, and the power of the mind over the body is seldom spoken of. No doubt many physicians treat nervous diseases of functional origin wisely and well, but what we contend is that the knowledge they display was taught at no school, was learned from no book, but it is intuitive and empirical. This is not as it should be. The power of mental therapeutics should be the subject of careful, special, and scientific teaching in every medical school. We might pursue the subject of maltreatment, or want of treatment, further in detail and describe the disastrous results of neglected cases, but the task is an invidious one. There can be no doubt that few patients are aware how much they can do for themselves. What the patient can do for himself, the forces he can set in motion are as yet unknown. We are inclined to believe that they are far greater than they can imagine, and will undoubtedly be used more and more. Mental therapeutics may be directed by the patient himself to calming the mind in excitement, by arousing feelings of joy, hope, faith, and love, by suggesting motives for exertion, by regular mental work, by diverting the thoughts from the malady. For your exercise this week, concentrate on Tennyson's beautiful lines, Speak to him, thou, for he hears, and spirit with spirit can meet. Closer is he than breathing, and nearer than hands and feet. Then try to realize that when you do speak to him, you are in touch with omnipotence. This realization and recognition of his omnipresent power will quickly destroy any and every form of sickness or suffering and substitute harmony and perfection. Then remember there are those who seem to think that sickness and suffering are sent by God. If so, every physician, every surgeon, and every Red Cross nurse is defying the will of God, and hospitals and sanitariums are places of rebellion instead of houses of mercy. Of course, this quickly reasons itself into an absurdity, but there are many who still cherish the idea. Then let the thought rest on the fact that until recently theology has been trying to teach an impossible creator one who created beings capable of sinning and then allowed them to be eternally punished for such sins. Of course, the necessary outcome of such extraordinary ignorance was to create fear instead of love. And so after 2,000 years of this kind of propaganda, theology is now busily engaged in apologizing for Christendom. You will then more readily appreciate the ideal man, the man made in the image and likeness of God and you will more readily appreciate the all-originating mind that forms, upholds, sustains, originates, and creates all there is. 
quote, All are but parts of one stupendous whole, whose body nature is, and God the soul. Opportunity follows perception. Action follows inspiration. Growth follows knowledge. Eminence flows progress. Always the spiritual first, then the transformation into the infinite and illuminable possibilities of achievement. End of Part 22 Introduction to Part 23 In the part which I have the honor to transmit herewith, you will find that money weaves itself into the entire fabric of our very existence, that the law of success is service, that we get what we give, and for this reason we should consider it a great privilege to be able to give. We have found that thought is the creative activity behind every constructive enterprise. We can therefore give nothing of more practical value than our thought. Creative thought requires attention, and the power of attention is, as we have found, the weapon of the superman. Attention develops concentration, and concentration develops spiritual power, and spiritual power is the mightiest force in existence. This is a science which embraces all sciences. It is the art which, above all arts, is relevant to human life. In the mastery of this science and this art, there is opportunity for unending progression. Perfection in this is not acquired in six days, nor in six weeks, nor in six months. It is the labor of life. Not to go forward is to go backward. It is inevitable that the entertainment of positive, constructive, and unselfish thoughts should have a far-reaching effect for good. Compensation is the keynote of the universe. Nature is constantly seeking to strike an equilibrium. Where something is sent out, something must be received, else there should be a vacuum formed. By observance of this rule, you cannot fail to profit in such measures as to amply justify your effort along this line. Part 23 The money consciousness is an attitude of mind. It is the open door to the arteries of commerce. It is the receptive attitude. Desire is the attractive force which sets the current in motion, and fear is the great obstacle by which the current is stopped or completely reversed, turned away from us. Fear is just the opposite from money consciousness. It is poverty consciousness. And as the law is unchangeable, we get exactly what we give. If we fear, we get what we feared. Money weaves itself into the entire fabric of our very existence. It engages the best thought of the best minds. We make money by making friends, and we enlarge our circle of friends by making money for them, by helping them, by being of service to them. The first law of success, then, is service, and this in turn is built on integrity and justice. The man who at least is not fair in his intention is simply ignorant. He has missed the fundamental law of all exchange. He is impossible. He will lose surely and certainly. He may not know it. He may think he is winning, but he is doomed to certain defeat. He cannot cheat the infinite. The law of compensation will demand of him an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The forces of life are volatile. They are composed of our thoughts and ideals, and these in turn are molded into form. Our problem is to keep an open mind, to constantly reach out for the new, to recognize opportunity, to be interested in the race rather than the goal, for the pleasure is in the pursuit rather than the possession. You can make a money magnet of yourself, but to do so you must first consider how you will make money for other people. If you have the necessary insight to perceive and utilize opportunities and favorable conditions and recognize values, you can put yourself in a position to take advantage of them, but your greatest success will come as you are enabled to assist others. What benefits one must benefit all. A generous thought is filled with strength and vitality. A selfish thought contains the germs of disillusion. It will disintegrate and pass away. Great financiers are simply channels for the distribution of wealth. Enormous amounts come and go but it would be as dangerous to stop the outgo as the income. Both ends must remain open, and so our greatest success will come as we recognize that it is just as essential to give as to get. 
If we recognize the omnipotent power that is the source of all supply, we will adjust our consciousness to this supply in such a way that will be constantly attract all that is necessary to itself, and we shall find that the more we give, the more we get. Giving in this sense implies service. The banker gives his money, the merchant gives his good. The author gives his thought, the workman gives his skill. All have something to give, but the more they can give, the more they get, and the more they get, the more money they are enabled to give. The financier gets much because he gives much. He thinks. He is seldom a man that lets anyone else do his thinking for him. He wants to know how results are to be secured. You must show him. When you can do this, he will furnish the means by which hundreds of thousands may profit, and in proportion as they are successful, will he be successful. Morgan, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and others did not get rich because they lost money for other people. On the contrary, it is because they made money for other people that they became the wealthiest men in the wealthiest country on the globe. The average person is entirely innocent of any deep thinking. He accepts the ideas of others and repeats them, in very much the same way as a parrot. This is readily seen when we understand the method which is used to form public opinion, and this docile attitude on the part of a large majority who seem perfectly willing to let a few persons do all their thinking for them is what enables a few men in great many countries to usurp all the avenues of power and hold the millions in subjugation. Creative thinking requires attention. The power of attention is called concentration. This power is directed by the will. For this reason, we must refuse to concentrate or think of anything except the things we desire. Many are constantly concentrated upon sorrow, loss, and discord of every kind. As thought is creative, it necessarily follows that this concentration inevitably leads to more loss, more sorrow, and more discord. How could it be otherwise? On the other hand, when we meet with success, gain, or any other desirable condition, we naturally concentrate upon the effects of these things, and thereby create more. And so it follows that much leads to more. How an understanding of this principle can be utilized in the business world is well told by an associate of mine. Spirit, whatever else it may or may not be, must be considered as the essence of consciousness, the substance of mind, the reality underlying thought. And as all ideas are phases of the activity of consciousness, mind, or thought, it follows that in spirit and in it alone is to be found the ultimate fact, the real thing or the idea. This being admitted, does it seem reasonable to hold that a true understanding of spirit and its law of manifestation would be about the most practical thing that a practical person could hope for? Does it seem certain that if the practical men of the world could but realize this fact, they would fall all over themselves and get into the place in which they might obtain such knowledge of spiritual things and laws? These men are not fools. They need only to grasp this fundamental fact in order to move in the direction of that which is the essence of all achievement. Let me give you a concrete example. I know a man in Chicago whom I've always considered to be quite materialistic. He had made several successes in life and also several failures. The last time I had a talk with him he was practically down and out as compared with his former business condition. It looked as if he had indeed reached the end of his rope, for he was well advanced into the stage of middle life, and new ideas came more slowly and less frequently to him than in former years. He said to me in substance, I know that all things that work out in business are the result of thought. Any fool knows that. Just now I seem to be short of thoughts and good ideas. But if this all-mind teaching is correct, it should be possible for the individual to attain a direct connection with infinite mind. In an infinite mind there must be the possibility of all kinds of good ideas which a man of my courage and experience could put to practical use in the business world and make a big success thereof. It looks good to me and I'm going to look into it. This was several years ago. The other day I heard of this man again talking to a friend. I said, what has come out of our old friend X? Has he ever gotten on his feet again? The friend looked at me in amazement. Why, he said to me, don't you know about X's great success? 
he is the big man in the X company, naming a concern which is a mad phenomenal success during the last 18 months and is now well known by reason of its advertisements from one end of the country to another and also abroad. He is the man who supplied the big idea for that concern. Why, he is about a half a million to the good and is moving rapidly toward the million mark, all in the space of 18 months. I had not connected with this man with the enterprise mentioned, although I knew of the wonderful success of the company in question. Investigation has shown that the story is true and that the above stated facts are not exaggerated in the slightest. Now, what do you think of that? To me, it seems that this man actually made the direct connection with infinite mind, spirit, and having found it, he set it to work with him. He used it in his business. Does this sound sacrilegious or blasphemous? I hope not. I do not mean it to be so. Take away the implication of personality or magnified human nature from the conception of the infinite, and you have left the conception of an infinite presence power, the quintessence of which is consciousness, in fact, and at last, spirit. As this man also, at the last, must be considered as a manifestation of spirit, there is nothing sacrilegious in the idea that he, being spirit, should so harmonize himself with his origin and source that he would be more able to manifest at least a minor degree of its power. All of us do this, more or less, when we use our minds in the direction of creative thought. This man did more. He went about it in an intensely practical manner. I have not consulted him about his method of procedure, though I intend doing so at the first opportunity. But he not only drew upon the infinite supply for the ideas which he needed and which formed the seed of his success, but that he also used the creative power of thought in building up for himself an idealistic pattern of that which he hoped to manifest in material form, adding hereto changing improving its detail from time to time, proceeding from the general outline to the finished detail. I judge this to be the facts of the case, not alone from my recollection of the conversation a few years ago, but also because I have found the same thing to be true in the cases of other prominent men who have made similar manifestations of creative thought. Those who may shrink from this idea of employing the infinite power to aid one in his work in the material world should remember that if the infinite objected in the least to such a procedure, the thing could never happen. The infinite is quite able to take care of itself. Spirituality is quite practical, very practical, intensely practical. It teaches that spirit is a real thing, the whole thing, and that matter is but plastic stuff, which spirit is able to create, mold, manipulate, and fashion to its will. Spirituality is the most practical thing in the world, the only really and absolutely practical thing that there is. This week, concentrate on the fact that man is not a body with a spirit, but a spirit with a body, and that it is for this reason that his desires are incapable of any permanent satisfaction in anything not spiritual. Money is therefore of no value except to bring about the conditions which we desire, and these conditions are necessarily harmonious. Harmonious conditions necessitate sufficient supply, so that if there appears to be any lack, we should realize that the idea or soul of money is service. And as this thought takes form, channels of supply will be opened, and you will have the satisfaction of knowing that spiritual methods are entirely practical. Quote, we have discovered that premeditated orderly thinking for purpose matures that purpose into fixed form so that we may be absolutely sure of the result of our dynamic experience." Unquote. Francis Larimer Warner End of Part 23 Introduction to Part 24 Enclosed you'll find Part 24, your final lesson of this course. If you have practiced each of the exercises a few minutes every day as suggested, you will have found that you can get out of life exactly what you wish by first putting into life that which you wish. And you will probably agree with the student who said, The thought is almost overwhelming, so vast, so available, so definite, so reasonable, and so usable. The fruit of this knowledge is, as it were, a gift of the gods. It is the truth that makes men free. 
not only free from every lack and limitation, but free from sorrow, worry, and care. And is it not wonderful to realize that this law is no respecter of persons, that it makes no difference what your habit of thought may be? The way has been prepared. If you are inclined to be religious, the great religious teacher the world has ever known made the law so plain that all may follow. If your mental bias is toward physical science, the law will operate with mathematical certainty. If you are inclined to be philosophical, Plato or Emerson may be your teacher, but in either case you may reach degrees of power to which it is impossible to assign any limits. An understanding of this principle, I believe, is a secret for which the ancient alchemist vainly sought, because it explains how gold in the mind may be transmuted into gold in the heart and in the hand. Part 24 When the scientists first put the sun in the center of the solar system and sent the earth spinning around it, there was immense surprise and consternation. The whole idea was self-evidently false. Nothing was more certain than the movement of the sun across the sky, and anyone could see it descend behind the western hills and sink into the sea. Scholars raged and scientists rejected the idea as absurd. Yet the evidence has finally carried conviction in the minds of all. We speak of a bell as the sounding body, yet we know that all the bell can do is to produce vibrations in the air. When these vibrations come at the rate of sixteen per second, they cause a sound to be heard in the mind. It is also possible for the mind to hear vibrations up to the rate of thirty-eight thousand vibrations per second. When the number increases beyond this, all is silence again so that we know the sound is not in the bell, it is in our mind. We speak and even think of the sun as giving light. Yet we know it is simply giving forth energy which produces vibrations in the ether at the rate of 400 trillion a second, causing what are termed light waves, so that we know that we call light is simply a form of energy, and that the only light there is is a sensation caused in the mind by the motion of the waves. When the number increases, the light changes in color, each change in color being caused by shorter and more rapid vibrations, so that although we speak of the rose as being red, the grass as being green, or the sky as being blue, we know that the colors exist only in our minds, and are the sensations experienced by us as the result of the vibrations of light waves. When the vibrations are reduced below 400 trillion a second, they no longer affect us as light but we experience the sensations of heat. It is evident, therefore, that we cannot depend upon the evidence of the senses for our information concerning the reality of things. If we did, we should believe that the sun moved, that the world was indeed flat instead of round, and that the stars were bits of light instead of vast suns. The whole range, then, of the theory and practice of any system of metaphysics consists in knowing the truth concerning yourself, and the world in which you live. In knowing that in order to express harmony you must think harmony, in order to express health you must think health, and in order to express abundance you must think abundance. To do this you must reverse the evidence of the senses. When you come to know that every form of disease, sickness, lack and limitation are simply the results of wrong thinking, you will have come to know the truth which shall make you free. You will see how mountains may be removed if these mountains consist only of doubt, fear, distrust, or any form of discouragement. They are none the less real, and they need not only to be removed, but to be cast into the sea. Your real work consists in convincing yourself of the truth of these statements. When you have succeeded in doing this, you will have no difficulty in thinking the truth, and has been shown the truth contains a vital principle and will manifest itself. Those who heal disease by mental methods have come to know this truth. They demonstrate it in their lives and the lives of others daily. They know that life, health, and abundance are omnipresent, filling all space, and they know that those who allow disease or lack of any kind to manifest have as yet not come into an understanding of this great law. As all conditions are thought creations and therefore entirely mental, Disease and lack are simply mental conditions in which the person fails to perceive the truth. As soon as the error is removed, the condition is removed. 
The method for removing this error is to go into the silence and know the truth. As all mind is one mind, you can do this for yourself or anyone else. If you have learned to form mental images of the conditions desired, this will be the easiest and quickest way to secure results. If not, results can be accomplished by argument, by the process of convincing yourself absolutely of the truth of your statement. Remember, and this is one of the most difficult as well as most wonderful statements to grasp, remember that no matter what the difficulty is, no matter where it is, no matter who is affected, you have no patient but yourself. You have nothing to do but to convince yourself of the truth which you desire to be manifested. This is an exact scientific statement in accordance with every system of metaphysics in existence, and no permanent results are ever secured in any other way. Every form of concentration, forming mental images, argument and auto-suggestion are all simply methods by which you are enabled to realize the truth. If you desire to help someone to destroy some form of lack, limitation or error, the correct method is not to think of the person whom you wish to help. The intention to help them is entirely sufficient as this puts you in mental touch with the person. Then drive out of your own mind any belief of lack, limitation, disease, danger, difficulty or whatever the trouble might be. As soon as you have succeeded in doing this, the result will have been accomplished and the person will be free. But remember that thought is creative and consequently every time you allow your thought to rest on any inharmonious condition, you must realize that such conditions are apparent only. They have no reality. That spirit is the only reality and it can never be less than perfect. All thought is a form of energy, a rate of vibration. But a thought of the truth is the highest rate of vibration known and consequently destroys every form of error in exactly the same way that light destroys darkness. No form of error can exist when the truth appears, so that your entire mental work consists in coming into an understanding of the truth. This will enable you to overcome every form of lack, limitation, or disease of any kind. We can get no understanding of the truth from the world without. The world without is relative only. Truth is absolute. We must therefore find it in the world within. To train the mind to see truth only is to express true conditions only. Our ability to do this will be an indication as to the progress we are making. The absolute truth is that the I is perfect and complete. The real I is spiritual and can therefore never be less than perfect. It can never have any lack, limitation or disease. The flash of genius does not have origin in the molecular motion of the brain. It is inspired by the ego, the spiritual I, which is the one with the universal mind. And it is our ability to recognize this unity which is the cause of all inspiration, all genius. These results are far-reaching and have affected upon generations yet to come. They are the pillars of fire which mark the path that millions follow. Truth is not the result of logical training or an experimentation or even an observation. It is the product of a developed consciousness. Truth within a Caesar manifests in a Caesar's deportment, in his life and his action, his influence upon social forms and progress. Your life and your actions and your influence in the world will depend upon the degree of truth which you are enabled to perceive, for truth will not manifest in creeds but in conduct. Truth manifests in character, and the character of a man should be the interpretation of his religion, or what to him is truth, and this will in turn be evidenced in the character of his possession. If a man complains of the drift of his fortune, he is just as unjust to himself as if he should deny rational truth, though it stand patent and irrefutable. Our environment and the innumerable circumstances and accidents of our lives already exist in the subconscious personality which attracts to itself the mental and physical material which is congenial to its nature. Thus our future being determined from our present, and if there should be apparent injustice in any features or phase of our personal life, we must look within for the cause. Try to discover the mental fact which is responsible for the outward manifestation. 
It is this truth which makes you free, and it is the conscious knowledge of this truth which will enable you to overcome every difficulty. The conditions with which you meet in the world without are invariably the result of the conditions obtaining in the world within. Therefore it follows with scientific accuracy that by holding the perfect ideal in mind, you can bring about ideal conditions in your environment. If you see only the incomplete, the imperfect, the relative, the limited, these conditions will manifest in your life. But if you train your mind to see and realize the spiritual ego, the I which is forever perfect and complete, harmonious, wholesome, and healthful conditions only will be manifested. As thought is creative, and the truth is the highest and most perfect thought which anyone can think, it is self-evident that to think the truth is to create that which is true, and it is again evident that when truth comes into being, that which is false must cease to be. The universal mind is the totality of all mind which is in existence. Spirit is mind. Because spirit is intelligent, the words are, therefore, synonymous. The difficulty with which you have to contend is to realize that mind is not individual. It is omnipresent. It exists everywhere. In other words, there is no place where it is not. It is, therefore, universal. Men have heretofore generally used the word God to indicate this universal, creative principle. But the word God does not convey the right meaning. Most people understand this word to mean something outside of ourselves, while exactly the contrary is the fact. It is our very life. Without it we would be dead, we would cease to exist. The minute the spirit leaves the body, we are as nothing. Therefore, spirit is really all there is of us. Now the only activity which the spirit possesses is the power to think. Therefore thought must be creative, because spirit is creative. This creative power is impersonal, and your ability to think is your ability to control it and make use of it for the benefit of yourself and others. When the truth of the statement is realized, understood, and appreciated, you will have come into the possession of the master key. But remember that only those who are wise enough to understand, broad enough to weigh the evidence, firm enough to follow their own judgment, and strong enough to make the sacrifice exacted, may enter and partake. This week, try to realize that this is truly a wonderful world in which we live, that you are a wonderful being that many are awakening to a knowledge of the truth, and as fast as they awake and come into the knowledge of the things which have been prepared for them, they too realize that I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man, the splendors which exist for those who find themselves in the promised land. They have crossed the river of judgment and have arrived at the point of discrimination between the true and the false, and have found that all they ever willed or dreamed was but a faint concept of the dazzling reality. Quote, Though an inheritance of acres may be bequeathed, an inheritance of knowledge and wisdom cannot. The wealthy man may pay others for doing his work for him, but it is impossible to get his thinking done for him by another, or to purchase any kind of self-culture. End of quote. S. Smiles. End of part 24. The following four chapters, 25, 26, 27, and 28, are the last four lessons that had been added to the Master Key System after the original series was published. They were very difficult to locate, and we sincerely hope you enjoy the additional resources that these lessons provide. Now on to Part 25. 25. We live in a fathomless sea of plastic mind substance. This substance is ever alive and active. It is sensitive to the highest degree. It takes form according to mental demand. Thought forms the mold or matrix from which this substance expresses. Our ideal is the mold from which our future will emerge. The universe is alive. In order to express life, there must be a mind. Nothing can exist without mind. Everything that exists is some manifestation of this one basic substance from which and by all things have been created and are continually being recreated. It is man's capacity to think that makes him a creator instead of a creature.
All things are the result of the thought process. Man has accomplished the seemingly impossible because he has refused to consider it impossible. By concentration, men have made the connection between the finite and the infinite, the limited and the unlimited, the visible and the invisible, the personal and the impersonal. The building up of matter from electrons has been an involuntary process of individualizing intelligent energy. Men have learned a way to cross the ocean on floating palaces, how to fly in the air, how to transmit thought around the world on sensitized wires, how to cushion the earth with rubber and thousands of other things just as remarkable, just as startling, and just as incomprehensible to the people of a generation ago. Men will yet turn to the study of life itself, and with the knowledge thus gained will come peace and joy and length of days. The search for the elixir of life has always been a fascinating study, and has taken hold of many minds of utopian mold. In all times philosophers have dreamed of the day when men will become the master of matter. Old manuscripts contain many, many recipes that have cost their inventors bitter pangs of baffled disillusionment. Thousands of investigators have laid their contributions upon the sacrificial altar for the benefit of mankind. But not through quarantine or disinfectants or boards of health will man reach the long-sought plane of physical well-being, nor by dieting or fasting or suggesting will the elixir of life in the philosopher's stone be found. The mercury of the sages and the hidden mana are not constituents of health foods. When man's mind is made perfect, then and then only will the body be able perfectly to express itself. The physical body is maintained through a process of continuous destruction and reconstruction. Health is but the equilibrium that nature maintains through the process of creating new tissue and eliminating the old or waste tissue. Hate, envy, criticism, jealousy, competition, selfishness, war, suicide, and murder are the causes that produce acid conditions in the blood causing changes that result in irritation of the brain cells, the keys upon which soul plays divine harmonies or fantastic tricks before high heaven, according to the arrangement of chemical molecules in the wondrous laboratory of nature. Birth and death are constantly taking place in the body. New cells are being created by the process of converting food, water, and air into living tissue. Every action of the brain and every movement of the muscle mean destruction and a consequent death of some of these cells. The accumulation of these dead, unused, and waste cells is what causes pain, suffering, and disease. We allow such destructive thoughts as fear, anger, worry, hatred, and jealousy to take possession, and these thoughts influence the various functional activities of the body, the brain, the nerves, the heart, the liver, or the kidneys. They in turn refuse to perform their various functions. The constructive processes cease and the destructive processes begin. Food, water, and air are the three essential elements necessary to sustain life. But there is something still more essential. Every time we breathe, we not only fill our lungs with air, but we fill ourselves with pranic energy, the breath of life replete with every requirement for mind and spirit. This life-giving spirit is far more necessary than air, food, or water. A man can live for forty days without food, for three days without water, and for a few minutes without air, but he cannot live a single second without ether. It is the one prime essential of life, so that the process of breathing furnishes not only food for bodybuilding, but food for mind and spin as well. It is a well-known fact in India, but not so well-known in this country, that a normal rhythmic breathing, exhalation and inhalation take place through one nostril at a time, for about one hour through the right nostril, and then for a like period through the left nostril. The breath entering through the right nostril creates positive electromagnetic currents which pass down the right side of the spine, while the breath entering through the left nostril sends electromagnetic currents down the left side of the spine. These currents are transmitted by way of the nerve centers, or ganglia, of the sympathetic nervous system to all parts of the body. In the normal rhythmic breath, exhalation takes about twice the time of inhalation. For instance, 
If inhalation requires four seconds, exhalation, including the slight natural pause before the new inhalation, requires eight seconds. The balancing of the electromagnetic energies in the system depends to a large extent upon this rhythmic breathing, hence the importance of deep, unobstructed, and rhythmic exhalation and inhalation. The wise men of India knew that with the breath they absorbed not only the physical elements of the air, but life itself. They taught that this primary force of all forces, from which all energy is derived, ebbs and flow in rhythmic vibration through the created universe. Every living thing is alive by the virtue of partaking of this cosmic breath. The more positive the demand, the greater the supply. Therefore, while breathing deeply and rhythmically in harmony with the universal breath, we contact the life force from the source of all life in the innermost parts of our being. Without this intimate connection of the individual soul with the great reservoir of life, existence as we know it would be an impossibility. Freedom does not consist of the disregard of a governing principle, but of conformity to it. The laws of nature are infinitely just. A violation of just law is not an act of freedom. The laws of nature are infinitely beneficent. Exception from the operation of a beneficent law is not freedom. Freedom consists in conscious harmonious relation with the laws of being. Thus only may desire be satisfied, harmony attained, and happiness secured. The mighty river is free only while it is confined within its banks. The banks enable it to perform its appointed function and to answer its beneficent purpose to the best advantage. While it is under the restraint of freedom, it gives out its message of harmony and prosperity. If its bed is raised or its volume greatly increased, it leaves its channel and spreads over the country, carrying a message of ruin and desolation. It is no longer free. It has ceased to be a river. Necessities are demands, and demands create action which result in growth. This process makes for each decade a larger growth. So it is truly said that the last twenty-five years have advanced the world more than any previous century, and the last century has advanced the world more than all ages of the past. Notwithstanding all the different characters, disposition, and idiosyncrasies of different people, there is a certain definite law which dominates and governs all existence. Thought is mind in motion and psychic gravity is the law of the mind what atomic attraction is to physical science. Mind has its chemistry and constituent powers and these powers are as definite as those of any physical potency. Creation is the power of mind by which the thought is turned inward and made to impregnate and conceive new thought. It is for this reason that only the enlightened mind can think for itself. The mind must acquire a certain character of thought which will enable it to reproduce them itself without any seed from without to impregnate it. When the mind has acquired this nature, it is able to spontaneously generate thoughts without outside stimulation. This is done by conceiving thought in the mind as a result of being impregnated and fertilized by the universal. They must not be permitted to go out into space, but on the contrary, must remain within, where they will create psychic states corresponding to their natures. It is this absorption of self-generated thoughts and their conception of corresponding psychic states that is the principle of causation. This is possible owing to the fact that the mental cosmos is perpetually radiated as a unity of mind, and this mind functions in connection with the soul of man as his mind. It being essence, it is identified with the essence of the cosmos and with the essence of all things. The result is that, having attained unto and having become an infinity of thought, the individual is omniscient in mind, omnipotent in will, and omnipresent in soul. The quality of his mind is omniscience, and the quality of his soul is omnipresence. Such a man is possessed with real power in all that he does. He is indeed a master, the creator of his own destiny, the arbitrator of his own fate. There are many flowers of very colored blossoms. Each blossomed stem simply reaches up to the great sun, the god of vegetable life mainstream, without complaining, without doubt, and in all the fullness of plant desire, faith, and expectancy. 
They demand and attract the richest of color and perfume. And so man will, too, in the future, unshackle the great desire forces of mind and soul and turn them to heaven in righteous demand for the highest gift in the universe, life. And life means to live. Age is a prejudice which has been so firmly anchored in your mind that any casual number of years mentioned evokes a precise image on your brain. At twenty years you see a youth or a young girl adorned with all the juvenile graces. At thirty years, young man or young woman is in full development of vital strength and equilibrium, still on the upgrade towards the dazzling heights of maturity. At forty years, the summit has been reached, the effort made having been maintained by the prospect of the vast horizons to be dominated. The road traversed is contemplated with pride, but with emotion you already turn towards the abyss whose dizzying curves wind steeply into ever-increasing darkness. At fifty years you are halfway down the slope, which is still illuminated by the light from the peaks, though already touched by the cliffs of the abyss, an organism weakened and compelled to submit to numerous abdications. Sixty years brings you to the entrance of the cold, melancholy valleys. Resigned to inexorable destiny, you stand on the threshold of old age. You begin preparations for the long journey that must inevitably be undertaken. At seventy years, wrinkled and old, endowed with numerous infirmities, you sit in the waiting room for the last journey, considering it miraculous that you are still alive. If the eightieth year is exceeded, the fact is mentioned as an amazing phenomena, and you are treated with the respect due to antiquities. Is this parallel correct? Is there any connection between age and age value? Let it be emphatically stated that the tyranny of the birth certificate can be abolished. The fact that a year represents one complete revolution of the earth around the sun has nothing in common with the evolution of the human being. To be so many years old means simply that the circling seasons have been observed many times and nothing more. It implies no consideration of the intellectual or physical state. The person who has seen the untiring astronomical phenomena forty times may be much younger in the real meaning of the world than one who has seen it but thirty times. The vibratory activities of the planetary universe are governed by the law of periodicity. Everything that lives has periods of birth, growth, and fruitage. These periods are governed by the septimal law. The law of sevens governs the days of the week, the phases of the moon, the harmonies of sound, light, heat, electricity, magnetism, and atomic structure. It governs the life of individuals and of nations, and it dominates the activities of the commercial world. We can apply the same law to our own lives, and therefore come into an understanding of man experience which would otherwise appear inexplicable. Life is growth, and growth is change. Each seven-year period takes us into a new cycle. The first seven years is the period of infancy. The next seven is the period of childhood, representing the beginning of individual responsibility. The next seven represents the period of adolescence. The fourth period marks the attainment of full growth. The fifth period is the constructive period, when men acquire property, possessions, a home, and a family. The next, from thirty-five to forty-two, is a period of reactions and changes, and this in turn is followed by a period of reconstruction, adjustment, and recuperation, so as to be ready for a new cycle of sevens, beginning with the fiftieth year. The law of periodicity governs cycles of every description. There are cycles of short periods and cycles of long periods. There are periods when the emotions gain the ascendancy and the whole world is absorbed in religious thought. And there are other periods when science and learning take the ascendancy and the patent office is flooded with new inventions. There are other periods when vice and crime rule with a high hand. Periods of strikes and hard times. Times of turmoil, confusion, and disaster and there are periods of reform. What is the cause of these cycles? Are they arbitrary? Have they no basis or foundation in nature, recurring with almost the regularity of clockwork and without any incentive whatsoever? Or are they perhaps due to universal laws and caused by the revolution of the planets in their orbits, having their origin in some principle in nature that man may learn and thus ultimately be able to predict with certainty the recurrence of the same phenomena? 
Let us consider the division of the zodiac into four grand quarters resembling spring, summer, autumn, and winter. The spring quarter corresponds to infancy, childhood, and youth, the irresponsible and educational period from the first to twenty-first year of life, when the personal is being fitted by service and study for the next important stage. It is the time when fidelity and filial reverence, obedient and industry are instilled into the growing mind. The summer quarter of life from twenty-one to forty-two is the practical period of life, and is concerned with the life of the householder, in which wealth becomes an object, responsibility grows, and the duties of life become heavier and filled with business activity. It is the period when the social side of the personality is expressed, and the lesson of unselfishness is learned. Prosperity comes with the fullness of life which abounds in the summer portion. The virtues developed are caution, thrift, charity, magnanimity, diligence, and prudence. This period of life is governed by the sign of Leo, in which the life forces burn at their greatest heat, and love for partner and offspring finds its greatest height in the domestic and social world. The autumn quarter of life is one in which the glory of manhood and the fullness of motherhood are turned to wider interest, and personal claims are sacrificed for the benefit of those outside the narrow circle of the home. The duties of government and the national welfare are taken up with motives that are less limited and more altruistic in their nature. The desire being to help in the ruling and guiding of those who belong to the nation. The virtues to be acquired are equilibrium, justice, strength, courage, vigor, and generosity. The concentrating power of this period is denoted by the sign Scorpio, symbol of self-controlled emotions, fixed feelings, and permanent modes of action. The fluidity and changeable sensations of the watery signs being made stable and reliable and fixed. The next stage of life is the period in which experience is garnered and the lessons of life are stored ready for the enriching of the ego. It is a stage in which the review of life brings wisdom and the tender feelings of sympathy to all. The virtue of the last three signs are made manifest as patience, self-sacrifice, service, purity, wisdom, gentleness, and compassion. The centralizing of the mind in the sign Aquarius brings the climax when the man is complete and the humanized perfection of manhood culminates in the one whose mind is wholly centered in higher states of consciousness. This is the plan of the normal evolution of humanity, when the civilized nations have worked through the infantile, spring-like stage, for nations like individuals are also evolving, and it is the national good and the national perfection that is to be the outcome of this wisely ordained plan, in accordance with the will of the supreme ruler of the universe. Perhaps it was this national good and national perfection which one of the great men saw when he had the wonderful vision which he so beautifully described below. A vision of the future arises. I see a world where thrones have crumbled and where kings are dust. The aristocracy of idleness has perished from the earth. I see a world without a slave. Man at last is free. Nature's forces have by science been enslaved. Lightning and light, wind and waves, frost and flames, and all the subtle powers of the earth and air are the tireless toilers for the human race. I see a world at peace, adorned with every form of art, with music's myriad voices thrilled while lips are rich with words of love and truth, a world in which no exile sighs, no prisoner mourns, a world on which the gibbet's shadows does not fall, a world where labor reaps its full reward, where work and worth go hand in hand. I see a world without the beggar's outstretched palm, the miser's heartless stony stare, the piteous wail of the want, the livid lips of lies, the cruel eyes of scorn. I see a race without disease of flesh or brain, shapely and fair, married harmony of form and function, and, as I look, life lengthens, joy deepens, and love canopies the earth, and over in all the great dome shines the eternal star of faith. End of Part 25 Part 26. Life is not created, it simply is. All nature is animate with this force we call life. 
the phenomena of life on this physical plane with which we chiefly concern are produced by the involution of energy into matter. Matter is itself an involution of energy. Living tissue is organized or organic matter. Dead tissue is unorganized or inorganic matter. When life disappears from an organism, disintegration begins. Organization requires a high rate of vibration, or short wavelengths, moving with great intensity. The molecules of which the tissue is composed are in continuous state of activity. The result is that the tissue manifests what we call life. Senility is a part of the death process. It is caused by an accumulation of earthly salts, or so-called mineral matter. This mineral matter usually consists of lime and chalk that settle upon the walls of the arteries. The arteries then become hardened and calcinatory and lose their elasticity. If the vibrations were sufficiently intense, it would be impossible for these salts to settle in the system. The intense vibration would make the accumulation impossible. The minerals would be expelled in the process of elimination. Old age, decay, and death are therefore simply due to the inability of the individual to keep in tune with the source of all life. Life is a rate of vibration, a mode of motion. Death is the absence of that vibration. Life is a manifestation of activity. Death is the process of disintegration, the absence of activity. The earth is ever seeking to embrace in its bosom all things. It is the tomb or fixed resting place for every form of organized manifestation. The vibration from the earth are therefore the vibrations of destruction and disintegration. Nothing has so far been able to resist the continual pull of these earthly vibrations. Everything has had to finally succumb. All form of whatever nature has thus far been compelled to return to the earth to await the vitalizing vibrations of the sun before being again brought into manifestation. Will this always be true? Not necessarily. It may not always be necessary to contact these disintegrating vibrations. We may be able to insulate ourselves to some extent at least. The universe was built by vibration, that is to say, the specific form that everything has on either a large or a small scale is due absolutely to the specific rate of vibration that gave expression to it. The universe, then, both in general and in particular, is the effect of a system of vibration. In other words, the music of the spheres has expressed itself in that form, which we denominate the cosmos. This vibration expresses intelligence. This is not intelligence as we understand the word, but a cosmic knowledge that is responsible for the growth of fingernails, hair, bones, teeth, and skin, the circulation of blood and breathing. All of these proceed whether we are asleep or awake. Thus consciousness or intelligence abounds in every thing, peculiar to itself only that it differs in character to every other thing, for there is but one universal consciousness or intelligence, while there are multitudinous different expressions of it. The rock, the fish, the animal, the human are all recipients of the one universal intelligence. They are only differently formed manifestations of cosmic substance, differently combined rates of motion or vibration. Mind is a system of vibration. The brain is a vibrator. Thought is the organized effect of each particular vibration when expressed through the requisite combination of cells. It is not the number of cells, but their vibratory adaptability that gives range to the thoughts of which the mind is capable. It is through the universal mind that the seeds of thought enter the brain of men, so that it conceives thought, which becomes a current of energy, centripetal in the mind of man and centrifugal in the universal mind. These seeds of thought have a tendency to germinate, to sprout and grow. They thus form what we call ideas. When a mental picture is formed in the brain, the rate of vibration corresponding to that picture is immediately awakened in the ether. It depends, however, upon whether the will or desire principle is acting as to whether that vibration moves inward or outward. If the will is used, the vibration moves outward and the principle of force is put into operation. 
If the desire nature is awakened, the vibrations move inward, and the law of attraction is put into operation. In either case, the law of causation expresses itself through the embodying or creative principle. The time is not too far distant when man will be able to make the body immune against disease and arrest the ordinary process of old age and physical decay, perpetuate youth even after the body has passed the mark of the centuries. Immortality or perpetual life is the fondest hope, the legitimate goal and the just birthright of every human being. But the majority of people of all religions and those of no religious beliefs at all seem to think that it is to be obtained, if not at all, at some future time and on some other plane of existence. Every human being who is not sick or insane has an innate desire to live as long as possible. If there is an individual person in the world who does not desire to live, it is because he is in some abnormal condition of body or mind, or he expects to be. As a matter of fact, the more highly enlightened and developed the individual, the more intense the desire and longing for life. And it is improbable that there would be a natural desire for something that was impossible for attainment. Professor Jacques Loeb, formerly of the Department of Physiology at the University of California, said several years ago, Man will live forever when he has learned to establish the right protoplasmic reaction in the body. Thomas Edison says, I have many reasons to believe that the time will come when man will not die. Five-sevenths of the flesh and blood are water, while the substance of the body consists of albumin, fibrin, casein, and gelatin. That is, it consists of organic substances composed originally of four essential gases, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and carbonic acid. Water is a combination of two gases. Air is a mixture of three gases. Thus, our bodies are composed of only transformed gases. None of our flesh existed three or four months ago, face, mouth, arms, hair, and even the very nails. The entire organism is but a current of molecules, a ceaselessly renewed flame, a stream in which we may look at all our lives and never see the same water again. These molecules do not touch each other, and we are continuously renewed by means of assimilation, which is directed, governed, and organized by the immaterial force that assimilates it. To this force we may give the name soul, so writes the great French astronomer, physicist, biologist, and metaphysician Camille Flammarion. The bridge of life, a symbol of physical recreation, has been exploited in song, drama, and story. Pericles, Pythagoras, Lysurian, Valentin, Wagner, and a long unbroken line of the Illuminati from time immemorial have chanted their epics in unison with this riddle of the Sphinx, across the scroll of which is written, Solve me or die. This solution may lie in an understanding of the nature of the glands that control physical and mental growth, and all metabolic processes of fundamental importance. These glands dominate all the vital functions and cooperate in an intimate relationship which may be compared to an interlocking directorate. They furnish the internal secretions or hormones that determine whether we are to be fat or short, handsome or homely, brilliant or dull, cross or congenial. Sir William Osler, one of the world's great thinkers, said, for man's body is a humming hive of working cells, each with its own specific function, all under central control of the brain and heart, and all dependent on secretions from the glands which lubricate the wheels of life. For example, remove the thyroid gland, just below the Adam's apple, and you deprive man of the lubricants which enable his thought engines to work, and gradually the stored acquisitions of his mind cease to become available and within a year he sinks into dementia. The normal processes of the skin cease, and the hair falls, the features bloat, and the paragon of animals is transformed into a shapeless caricature of humanity. There are seven major glands, the pituitary, the thyroid, the pancreas, the adrenal, the pineal, the thymus, and the sex glands, all of which control the metabolism of the body and dominate all vital functions. 
The pituitary is a small gland located near the center of the head, directly under the third ventricle of the brain, where it rests in a depression in the front plate of the skull. Its secretions have an important part in the mobilizing of carbohydrates, maintaining blood pressure, stimulating other glands, and maintaining the tonicity of the sympathetic nervous system. The thyroid gland is located at the frontal base of the neck, extending upward in a sort of semicircle on both sides. The thyroid secretion is important in mobilizing both proteins and carbohydrates. It stimulates other glands, helps resist infections, affects the hair growth, and influences the organs of the digestion and elimination. It is a strongly determining factor in the all-around physical development and also in the mental functioning. A well-balanced thyroid will ensure an active, efficient, and smoothly coordinated mind and body. The adrenal glands are located just above the small of the back. These organs have sometimes been called the beauty glands, since one of their functions is to keep the pigments of the body in proper solution and distribution, but of greater importance is the agency of the adrenal secretion in other directions. The secretions contain a most valuable blood pressure agent and are a tonic to the sympathetic nerve system, hence to the involuntary muscles, heart, arteries, and intestines. These glands respond to certain emotional excitements by the immediate increase in the volume of secretion, thus increasing the energy of the whole system and preparing it for effective response. The pineal gland is a small conical structure located behind the third ventricle of the brain. The ancients realized that this gland was of vast importance and was spoken of as a spiritual center, the seat of the soul, and possibly of eternal youth or life everlasting. It is near the top and at the back of the head. The thymus gland is located at or near the bottom of the throat, just below the thyroid gland. It is considered essential for children only, but it is not possible for the degeneration of this gland is one of the causes of premature senility. The pancreas is located just behind the peritoneum, near the stomach. This gland aids digestion, and when not properly functioning, an excess of sugar may be produced, which causes diabetes and other serious troubles. The sex glands are located at the lower part of the abdomen. It is through the functioning of these glands that life is created and the process of reproduction is carried on. When the secretions from these glands are not called upon for procreative purposes, they are poured into the cell life, renewing the energy, strength, and vitality. If they fail to function, there is depression and general debility. It is clear, then, that if we find some way to make these glands continue to function, we can renew our health, strength, and youth indefinitely. This is so because the thyroid develops vital energy. The pituitary controls blood pressure and develops mental energy. The pancreas controls digestion and bodily vigor. The adrenals furnish pep and ambition, and the sex glands control the secretions that manifest as youth, strength, and power. We can better understand the mechanism of glands when we remember that the rays from the sun are differentiated into seven different tones or colors or qualities by the seven different planets, and that they enter the human system by the seven plexuses located along the spinal column. We now find that this light is carried to the seven major glands in the body, where it controls and dominates every function of life. Unfortunately, however, ordinary window glass excludes practically all the ultraviolet rays, which are the most essential in the maintenance of health and vitality. A few sanitariums and hospitals have had special windows or fused quartz constructed which admit these ultraviolet rays. When the glands are supplied with the ultraviolet rays of which we have heretofore been deprived, the result will be a remarkable degree of vitality, mental and physical vigor. In fact, it is already known that cholesterol can be converted into a vitamin by action of the ultraviolet rays, and it is possible that other inert substances may be activated in a like manner. The infrared rays have also been found to be exceedingly valuable therapeutic agent. Fabrics of certain weaves are used to filter these rays. Deductions from the experiments made by several of the world's leading scientists more than 15 years ago are to the effect that it will be possible for the physical body of man to become so purified 
and responsive that it may continue living from age to age without death. The income and outgo of the body can be so perfectly adjusted that the organism will not become old, but will be rebuilt from day to day. The vibratory force of life can be inspired to such a degree and radiated through the tissues to such an extent that this man of clay will really become a temple of the living God, not merely a reservoir of unconscious and unregulated intelligence. By very simple hygienic care we can greatly prolong each life manifestation. Hence we have reason to believe that a complete knowledge of vibratory force and its effect upon the structure of the body will aid the organism in making the life manifestations permanent. Death is not a necessary, inevitable consequence or attribute of life. Death is biologically a relatively new thing, which made its appearance only after living things had advanced a long way on the path of evolution. Single-cell organisms have proved, under critical experimental observation, to be immortal. They reproduce by simple fission of the body, one individual becoming two, this process may go on indefinitely without any permanent slacking of the rate of cell division and without the intervention of a rejuvenating process, provided the environment of the cells is kept favorable. The germ cells of all sexually differentiated organisms are, in a similar sense, immortal. Reduced to a formula, we may say that the fertilized ovum produces a soma and more germ cells. The soma eventually dies. Some of the germ cells prior to that event produced somata and germ cells, and so on in a continuous cycle that has never yet ended since the appearance of multicellular organisms on the earth. So long as reproduction goes on in this way in these multicellular forms, there is no place for death. The successful cultivation of the tissues of higher vertebrates over an indefinitely long period of time demonstrates that death is in no sense a necessary concomitant of cellular life. It may fairly be said that the potential immortality of all essential cellular elements of the body either has been fully demonstrated or has been carried far enough to make the probability very great. Generalizing the results of the tissue culture work in the last two decades, it is highly probable that the cells of all the essential tissues of the metazoan body are potentially immortal, as is shown when placed separately under such condition as to supply appropriate food in the right amount and to remove promptly the deleterious products of the metabolism. A fundamental reason why the higher multicellular animals do not live forever appears to be that in the differentiation and specialization of function of cells and tissues in the body as a whole, any individual part does not find the conditions necessary for its continued existence. In the body, any part is dependent for the necessities of its existence upon other parts, or upon the organization of the body as a whole. It is the differentiation and the specialization of function of the mutually dependent aggregate of cells and tissues that constitute the metazoan body that brings about death, and not any inherent or inevitable mortal process in the individual cells themselves. When cells show characteristic sentient changes, it is probably a consequence of their mutually dependent association in the body as a whole. It does not primarily originate in any particular cell because of the fact that the cell is old. It occurs in the cells when they are removed from the mutually dependent relationship of the organized body as a whole. In short, death does not appear to be a primary attribute of the physiological economy of individual cells as such, but rather of the body as a whole. Recent researches have shown conclusively that tissues and cells in the human body need not necessarily decay. Formerly it was thought that there was no way to ward off senility, and that cells are bound to break down due to old age, which simply means wear and tear. This, however, in the light of modern science is no longer countenanced. The study of gland science has convinced many physicists in that the human cells can be rejuvenated or replaced continuously, and that such a thing as old age can be warded off for several hundred years. It is well known that it takes a lifetime to gain valuable experience. Men at the head of great industries frequently are over 60 years of age, and their advice is sought because they have gained most valuable experience during all these years. 
It would seem, therefore, important to lengthen the span of life, and indeed, pre present indications are that this can and will be done. Some of our best authorities see no reason why a human being should not attain the age of several hundred years, not as some extraordinary feat, but considered as a fair average. There are, of course, people now living who are 125 years old, but these are, of course, exceptions. Medical scientists assert that the goal of 200 years will be reached some day in the future. When we stop to think that the average lifespan used to be 40 years, and that now we consider the man of 50 years to be in the prime of his life, who knows but that in 50 years hence a man in his prime will be 100 or 150 years of age. Dr. Monroe, an eminent physician and scientist of Great Britain, says, the human frame as a machine contains within itself no marks by which we can possibly predict its decay. It is apparently intended to go on forever. The imagination might also conceive that these delicate infinitesimal fibers are strings of the human harp, and that the molecular minerals are the fingers of infinite energy striking the notes of some divine anthem. But of all the multiple adepts or masters that have kept the light burning above the three piers of the magical bridge, none is more clearly and beautifully written thereof than did the great poet Isaiah. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the glowing sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the habitation of jackals, where they lay, shall be grass of reeds and bushes, and a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be used for the redeemed, the wayfaring man, yea, fools shall not err therein. The nerves are fine threads of different colors, each one having a special chemical affinity for certain organic substances, such as oil or albumen, through and by which the organism is material and the process of life carries on. End of Part 26 Part 27 Your emotions will invariably seek to express themselves in action. The emotion of love will therefore seek expression in demonstrations of loving service. Emotions of hate will seek expression in vindictive or hostile actions. Emotions of shame will seek expressions in actions corresponding to the nature of the cause that brought the emotion into being. Emotions of sorrow will bring the tear ducts into violent action. From this you will see that emotions always focalize the energies upon the idea or desire that is seeking an outlet. When the emotions find an outlet through the proper channel and all is well, but if they are forbidden or repressed, then the desire or wish will continue to gather energy, and if for any reason it is finally suppressed, it will pass into the subconscious, where it will remain. Such a suppressed emotion becomes a complex. Such a complex is a living thing. It has a vital power and force, and the vital force retains its intensity undiminished throughout the entire lifetime unless it is released. In fact, it gains in violence with every similar thought, desire, wish, or memory. The emotion of love causes the solar plexus to become active, which in turn influences the action of glands, which produce a vibratory effect on certain organs of the body, which creates passion. The emotion of hate causes an acceleration of certain bodily activities, which changes the chemical organization of the blood, and eventuates in semi-paralysis, or, if long continued, in complete paralysis. Emotions may be expressed through mental, verbal, or physical action, and they usually find expression in one of these three ways, and are therefore released, and this energy is dissipated in a few hours. But when reason of honor, pride, anger, hatred, or bitterness, these emotions are buried from consciousness, they become mental abscesses in the subconscious realm, and cause bitter suffering. Such a complex may find reverse expression. For instance, a man who has been forbidden to express his love for a woman may develop into a woman-hater. He may be irritated and annoyed by the sight of feminine things. He may appear to be bold, independent, and dominant, but this will be but the camouflage by which he is attempting to cover up the craving for love and sympathy that has been denied him. 
Should this man eventually select a mate, he will unconsciously select one of an opposite type to the one who caused him sorrow. The attachment has been reversed. He wants no reminders. Suffering is an emotion and it opens the doors of the subconscious mind. The thought, this is what I get for wrongdoing, produces a conclusion, well, I'll never do it again. This is the reformation suggestion that goes down into the subconscious mind by auto-suggestion of the individual suffering penance. Thus, reformation takes place because it changes the soul's desire and also produces a new desire to avoid the consequence of suffering indicated by the penance. Desire originates in the subconscious mind. It is plainly an emotion. Emotion originates in the soul or subconscious mind. Pleasure emotions are the diversions and rewards for service that the subconscious mind renders the body. You have seen that when any thought, idea, or purpose find its way into the subconscious of the emotions, the sympathetic nervous system takes up the thought, idea, or purpose and carries it to every part of the body thus converting the idea, thought, or purpose into an actual experience in your life. The necessary interaction of the conscious and subconscious mind requires a similar interaction between the corresponding system of nerves. The cerebrospinal system is the channel through which we receive conscious perception from the physical senses and exercise control over the movements of the body. This system of nerves has its center in the brain. Any explanation of the phenomena of life must be based upon the theory of oneness. The psychic element being found within all living substances, this cosmic intelligence must have existed before living substance could have come into existence, and therefore it exists today all around us, flowing in and through us. This cosmic consciousness projects itself in the form of living substance, and it acts with a conscious intelligence in manufacturing its food supply and evolving organizations onto a higher and higher plane of life. This cosmic mind is the creative principle of the universe, the divine essence of all things. It is therefore a subconscious activity, and all subconscious activities are governed by the sympathetic nervous system, which is the organ of the subconscious mind. No human intelligence has ever accomplished the results that the cosmic intelligence produced in developing a chemical laboratory right within the foundation of plant life, and the production of elaborate mechanical devices and harmonious social organization right within our own bodies. In the mineral world, everything is solid and fixed. In the animal and vegetable kingdom, it is in a state of flux, forever changing and always being created and recreated. In the atmosphere we find heat, light, and energy. Each realm becomes finer and more spiritual as we pass from the visible to the invisible, from the coarse to the fine, and from the low potentiality to high potentiality. When we reach the invisible we find energy in its purest and most volatile form. And as the most powerful forces of nature are the invisible forces, so we find that the most powerful forces of man are his invisible forces, his spiritual force. The only way in which the spiritual force can manifest is through the process of thinking. Addition and subtraction are, therefore, spiritual transactions. Reasoning is a spiritual process. Ideas are spiritual conceptions. Questions are spiritual searchlights and logic, argument, and philosophy are spiritual machinery. Every thought brings into action certain physical tissue, parts of the brain, nerve, or muscle. This produces an actual physical change in the construction of the tissue. Therefore, it is only necessary to have a certain number of thoughts on a given subject in order to bring about a complete change in your physical organization. Thoughts of courage, power, and inspiration will eventually take root, and as this takes place, you will see life in a new light. Life will have a new meaning for you. You will be reconstructed and filled with joy, confidence, hope, and energy. You will see opportunities at which you had heretofore blind. You will recognize possibilities that before had no meaning for you. The thoughts with which you have been impregnated are radiated to those around you, and they in turn help you onward and upward. 
you attract to yourself new associates and this in turn changes your environment. By the simple exercise of thought, you change not only yourself, but your environment, circumstances and conditions. These changes are brought about by the psychic element of life. This psychic element is not mechanical. Because of its power of selection, organization and direction, such a power cannot be automatically mechanical. The cosmic intelligence possesses the function of memory for the purpose of recording all the experiences that it encounters and projecting and organizing itself on higher planes of life. It is this function of memory that is the hereditary directing force found within living organisms. This hereditary directing force frequently manifests as fear. Fear is an emotion. It is consequently not amenable to reason. You may therefore fear your friends as well as your enemies, or fear the present and past as well as the future. If fear attacks you, it must be destroyed. You will be interested in knowing how to accomplish this. Reason will not help you at all, because fear is a subconscious thought, a product of the emotion. There must then be some other way. The way is to awaken the solar plexus, get it into action. If you have practiced deep breathing, then you can expand the abdomen to the limit. That is the first thing to do. Hold this breath for a second or two. Then, still holding it, draw in more air and carry it to the upper chest and draw in the abdomen. This effort flushes the face red. Hold this breath also for a second or two and then, still holding your breath, deflate the chest and expand the abdomen again. Do not exhale this breath at all, but still holding it, alternately expand the abdomen and chest rapidly some four or five times, then exhale. The fear is gone. If the fear does not leave you at once, repeat the process until it does. It will not be long before you are feeling entirely normal. Why? Because in the first place, this breathing effort, concentrated at the pit of the stomach, affects the great ganglion of the sympathetic nervous system lying exactly opposite. This is the solar plexus which largely governs circulation. The stimulation of the solar plexus releases the nerve currents and the renewed circulation re-establishes the muscular control. The breath entering through the right nostril creates positive electromagnetic currents which passes down the right side of the spine while the breathing entering the left nostril sends negative electromagnetic currents down the left side of the spine. These currents are transmitted by way of the nerve centers, or ganglion, of the sympathetic nervous system. We may be said to literally live, move, and have our being, in the physical sense, in the sun. This force or energy enters the etheric spleen with every inhalation of the breath, as it enters the spleen, the solar plexus draws it to itself with every exhalation, and from the solar plexus it travels along the nerves to the sacral plexus situated at the extreme end of the spine, and to the cardiac plexus, the core of the heart. These are the three main centers of the body. From the cardiac plexus, this life energy traverses the nerves to the head. Again on a downward path, it passes through to the psychic center, then it traverses the nerves of the face, then the bronchial center, the throat front, the pulmonary center, the upper chest and the lungs, the lower lung center which is seated above the heart and the vital and generative center seated at the base of the stomach. So this life energy makes a circuit of nerves until it gradually works its way out through the pores of the skin. You will therefore readily see why this exercise can and does completely eliminate the arch enemy fear. If you are tired, if you wish to conquer fatigue, then stand still wherever you may be with your feet holding all your weight. Inhale deeply and raise the body to the tiptoes with your hands stretched above the head and the fingers pointed upward. Bring your hands together above the head, inhaling slowly and exhaling violently. Repeat this exercise three times. It will only take a minute or two and you will feel more refreshed than you would if you took a nap. In time you will be able to overcome the tendency to fatigue. The virtue of this exercise is in the intention. The intention governs 
the attention. This in turn acts upon the imagination. The imagination is a form of thought, which in turn is mind in motion. All thought formations interact upon one another until they come to a state of maturity, where they reproduce their kind. This is the law of creation. These are indicated in the characteristics of the individual. If the body is large, the bones heavy, the fingernails thick and the hair coarse, then we know that the physical predominates. If the body is slight, the bones small and the fingernails thin and pliable, then we know that the mental and spiritual characteristics prevail. Coarse hair indicates materialistic tendencies. Fine hair indicates sensitive and discriminating mental qualities. Straight hair indicates directness of character. Curly hair indicates changefulness and uncertainty in thought. Blue eyes indicate light, happy, cheerful, active disposition. Gray eyes indicate a cool, calculating, determined disposition. Black eyes indicate a quick, nervous, venturesome disposition. And brown eyes indicate sincerity, energy, and affection. You are therefore a complete manifestation of your most inward thoughts. The color of your eyes, the texture of your skin, the quality of your hair and every line and curve of your body are indications of the character of the thoughts that you habitually entertain. Not only this, but the letters that you write carry not only the messages that the words can, but they are charged with the energy corresponding with the nature of your thought and therefore often bring a very different message than the one that you intended to send. And finally, even the clothes that you wear eventually take on the mental atmosphere that surrounds you, so that the trained psychometrics finds no difficulty in reading the character of those who have worn a garment for any length of time. End of Part 27 Part 28 In an ordinary bar of iron or steel, the molecules arrange themselves promiscuously in the body. The magnetic circuits are satisfied internally and there is no resulting external magnetism. When the bar is magnetized, the molecules rearrange themselves according to the law of attraction. They turn on their axis and assume positions more nearly in a straight line, with their north ends pointing in the same way. The closed magnetic circuits are thus broken up and external magnetism is made evident. You cannot see the molecules of iron or steel changing their relative positions under the influence of magnetism, but the effect reveals the change that has taken place. When all the molecules have turned on their axis until they are arranged symmetrically, the bar has been completely magnetized. It cannot be further influenced, however strong the force. The bar has now become a magnet and will exert force in every direction. The amount of force that the magnet will exert decreases as the distance from the magnet increases. The magnetic lines complete their circuits independently and never cut, cross, or merge into each other. Another bar of iron or steel placed in the magnetic field of a magnet assumes the properties of that magnet. This phenomena is known as magnetic induction. This is the action and reaction that always precedes the attraction of a magnet for a magnetic body. Electricity is the invisible agent known to us only by its various manifestations. You are a perfect electrical plant. Food, water, and air furnish the fuel, the solar plexus is the storage battery, and the sympathetic nervous system is the medium by which the body is charged with magnetism. Sleep is the process by which the battery is recharged and the vital processes replenished and renewed. The male is the positive or electrical charge and the female is the negative or magnetic charge. The male represents current, force and energy. The female represents capacity, resistance and power. What happens when one of the opposite sex comes into your magnetic field? First the law of attraction is brought into operation. Then by the process of induction you are magnetized and assume the properties of the person whom you are contacting. When another person enters your magnetic field, what is it that passes from one to another? What causes the thrill and tingle over the entire sympathetic nervous system? 
It is the cells rearranging themselves so as to carry the charge of energy, life and vitality that is passing from one to the other, which you are receiving by the process of induction. You are being magnetized, and in this process you are assuming the qualities and characteristics of the person whom you are contacting. In the magnetism that is passing from person to person is all the joy, all the sorrow, all the love, hatred, music, art, fear, suffering, success, defeat, ambition, triumph, reverence, courage, wisdom, the virtue and the beauty that hereditary and environment have stored in the life of your love. For it is nothing less than love. The law of attraction is the law of love, and love is life, and this is the experience by which life is being quickened into action, and by which character, hereditary, and destiny are being determined. When you become impregnated with these thoughts of love, success, ambition, triumph, defeat, sorrow, hatred, fear, or suffering, are you immediately conscious of them? By no means. Why not? The reply is very simple and easily understood. The brain is the organ of the conscious mind, and it has five methods only by which it can contact the conscious world. These methods are the five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and feeling. But love is something that we cannot see, we cannot hear. Nor can we taste, smell, or touch it. It is therefore plainly a subconscious activity or emotion. The subconscious, however, has its own system of nerves whereby it contacts every part of the body and receives sensations from the outer world. The mechanism is complete. It controls all the vital processes. The heart, the lungs, the digestion, the kidneys, the liver, and organs of generation. Nature has evidently taken all these out of the control of the conscious mind and placed them in the control of the more reliable subconscious, where there can be no interference. Where physical contact is made, an entirely different situation is created. In this case, we bring into action the cerebrospinal nervous system also, through the sense of touch. You will remember that the conscious mind has five methods by which it contacts the outer world. The sense of touch is one of these, and actual physical contact brings into action not only the sympathetic nervous system, but the cerebrospinal nervous system. As the brain is the organ of this system of nerves, you immediately become conscious of any such action, so that when both the emotions and the feelings are aroused by both mental and physical contact, we bring into action every nerve in the body. The exchange resultant from these associations should be beneficial, inspiring, and vitalizing, and such is the case when the association is ideal and constructive. Such an association produces an effect in consciousness and life, typified by the increased power and usefulness in the crossing of plants, birds, and animals. This result means added power, utility, beauty, wealth, or worth. The principle of attraction, as it operates through infinite time, evidences itself in the form of growth. The one fundamental and inevitable result of attraction is the bringing together of things that have an affinity for each other with the resultant, eternally advancing growth of life. You have found what happens when one of the opposite sex comes into your magnetic field. Now let us consider what happens when you approach another personality of the same sex. All human intercourse is a matter of accommodation, and you will be a factor in determining what the relationship shall be, and it rests with you to determine whether you shall be the predominant factor in the new relationship. If you give, then you are the positive or predominant factor. If you receive, then you are the negative or receptive factor. Each person is a magnet, having both positive and negative poles, and with tendencies that impel an automatic sympathy with or antipathy toward whatever approaches or is approached. Normally, the positive pole leads the way, and the approach of two positives from opposite directions foreshadows a collision. The fundamental aim of life is harmony. Discords are obstructions that lie in your past. They obscure the reality of peace that lies at the heart of every experience, 
but as you increase in experience, you are enabled to discern the good in apparent evil, and your power of attraction increases proportionately. To the extent that you are magnetized towards saturation point, you may determine your relations to others and their relations to you. Any magnet has the power to induce harmonious conjunction with one that is less powerful. This is accomplished by causing a reversal of polarity of one of the magnets. Then dissimilar poles come together in peace and harmony. The more positive magnet will compel the less positive magnet to become receptive to the greater power that dominates it. The lesser magnet may be obliged to be receptive to the overpowering influence. It acknowledges the impelling power that requires it to reverse its polarity. It turns its positive pole away and its negative pole toward the positive pole of the greater magnet, and the two meet in harmonious relation. The negative magnet may, however, have the higher knowledge and may not desire to dominate. Possessing greater wisdom, it may disdain the use of force. Perhaps it prefers to conciliate or wishes to receive rather than give, instead of forcibly obliging the lesser magnet to accommodate itself to impose conditions. The greater magnet may voluntarily reverse its own polarity. If you are a great soul, you will know intuitively whether to exercise coercion or non-resistance. Where coercion is used, the resultant harmony is an involuntary and temporary submission. The non-resistant method binds because of the sense of freedom that it confers. The coercive method is distinctly intellectual, while that of non-resistance is essentially spiritual. If you are highly developed spiritually and similarly endowed with intellectual power, you can use the latter to the greatest advantage. In this case, you will neither discard reason nor logic because in your understanding of life's mathematics, you will make application of spiritual geometry, mental algebra, and physical arithmetic according to the requirements of your problem. You will find that existence involves every recurrent occasion for accommodation, compromise and reversal of polarities. You may escape compulsion through acquiescent submission and avoid the use of force by inviting pleasurable acquiescence. You may command an exact unwilling obedience or you may invite and receive voluntary cooperation. You may induce harmonies and create friendships or you may plant hatreds that will react as obligations that must eventually be satisfied. An understanding of the properties of the human magnet will enable you to solve many of the problems of life. Conflict and opposition have their place, but ordinarily they constitute obstacles and pitfalls to be avoided. You will find that you can always avoid useless opposition and unprofitable conflict by reversing your polarity or impelling its reversal in your would-be opponent. You are indeed in the loving care of principles that are immutable and that are designed solely for your benefit. You may place yourself in harmony with them and thus express a life of comparative peace and happiness, or you may put yourself in opposition to the inevitable with necessarily unpleasant results. You determine your conscious relation to all that is. You express the exact degree of happiness or the reverse that you have earned through the association that you have permitted to come into your life. You may from one experience learn the spiritual lesson it is intended to convey or you may make necessary many similar experiences. You may gather wisdom from experience rapidly and with ease or you may do it slowly and with difficulty. You are able to consciously control your conditions as you come to sense the purposes of what you attract and are able to extract from each experience that which you require for further growth. When you possess this faculty to a higher degree, you may grow rapidly and reach planes of thought where opportunities for greater service await you. It remains for you on each successive plane to learn how to express the greater harmonies that your higher growth has placed within your reach. For it is only through expression that you may appropriate what is for your use or benefit. You have now entered upon the borderland of the basic, the fundamental, 
the active principle of life. Little did you realize a few years ago the innumerable vibrations that surround you, such as electric, magnetic, heat, actinic, the control and the use of which are now keeping you busy. Suppose that what you term electrons should be active centers of intelligence connected with the infinite mind, which is all-wise and all-knowing, that marvelous mind that thinks with design and sees ends from beginning. Suppose that electrons should not be centers of force and energy only, but centers of intelligence, and that mankind will finally discover that the brain is an organized center of millions of these intelligent electrons, and that they are in contact with all other electrons from which the universe is composed. The universe is in effect a system of vibration. The cosmos is organized by the action of energy vibrating in accordance with certain rates that express themselves in form. The universe could, therefore, in no case be any wise different than it is, unless the vibratory influence that organized it had been different, the universe being the expression and form of those vibratory influences that have organized it out of the cosmic energy or ether. Sir William Crookes took some very fine sand and scattered it over the head of a drum. Then, by taking a tuning fork and sounding different notes just above the drum head, so that the vibrations set in motion by this particular key would vibrate upon the drum head, the sand was seen to shift and assume a definite geometrical figure corresponding to the particular note that was sounded. When another note was sounded, the sand shifted and assumed another figure, demonstrating that the notes of a musical scale will produce a corresponding form in any substance sufficiently plastic to assume form under their direction. This proves that vibration is the origin of form with which each particular vibration giving rise to a corresponding form. Vibration, then, is at the foundation of physics. Form, as well as heat, light, color, and sound are inseparably connected with vibratory activities. Each vibration expresses itself in the form corresponding to that particular rate of vibration. Form, then, is the organized result of energy at certain rates of vibration. Vibrations express themselves in corresponding geometrical figures, and in this way build up crystals that are the expression of vibration, with a number of these crystals collectively forming a body of the particular elements that is the outgrowth of that particular vibration. Study the beautiful forms of snowflakes falling on cold winter days. You will find that one day the forms are quite different from those of the day before or the day after, although the conditions may differ but in the very slightest degree. Nevertheless, this minute difference has sufficed to evolve these very different forms, each which is the exact expression of a special, complex relation between moisture, motion, pressure temperature, rarity, electrical tension, and chemical composition of the air that prevailed during their formation. When a thread is introduced into a bowl of saline solution and then lifted out of it, there will gather over the entire length of the submerged string a mass of mathematically perfect crystals of salt. It has been observed by the students of nature that the crystals were never exactly alike. Not only is this true of the different chemical elements, but we know that each individual crystal is a little different. Now, knowing that this crystallization is due to vibration and all differences in the form of the crystals are, therefore, due to differences in the rate of vibration, we can recognize the fact that the individuality of any object is due to the corresponding individuality in the vibration that gave expression to it. It is the law of vibration that brings to maturity the fruit of every thought, whether wholesome or unwholesome desirable or undesirable. It is this law that causes the things that we see to take form. It is this law that gives sparkles to the diamond, luster to the amethyst, color to the grape, fragrance to the rose, and beauty to the lily. And it is through the operation of this law that each of us is attracting to ourselves the associates, experiences, circumstances, conditions, and environment by which we are related to the objects and purposes that we seek. Existence is like the output of a loom. 
The pattern and the design are there, but whereas our looms are merely machines, once the guiding cords have been fed into them, the loom of time is complicated by a multitude of free agents who can modify the web, making the product more beautiful or more ugly according as they are in the harmony or disharmony with the general scheme. With the Arabic numerals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 0, any conceivable number may be expressed. With the 26 letters of the alphabet, any conceivable thought may be expressed. With the 14 primary elements, any conceivable thing may be organized. What is true in the inorganic world is likewise true in the organic. Certain conscious processes will invariably be followed by the same consequence. Clearly, then, it requires an intelligent force to direct the activities of these electrons and cause them to unite with regular mathematical precision and thus bring into being matter of any conceivable form. Mind is then the source of all things, in the sense that the activity of mind is the initial cause of all things coming into being. This is because the primal source of all things is a corresponding thought in the universal mind. It is the essence of a thing that constitutes its being, and the activity of mind is the cause by which the essence takes form. An idea is a thought conceived in the mind, and this rational form of the thought is the root of form, in the sense that this form of thought is the initial formal expression that acting upon substance causing it to form. There can be nothing except as there is an idea, or ideal form, engendered in the mind. Such ideas acting upon the universal engender corresponding forms. Matter being cosmic mind and physical manifestation, we perceive that everything is possessed of intelligence directing its development and manifestation. This is the intelligence that causes rocks to cohere and crystallize, while plants manifest life in an entirely different manner. Plant life divides its cells rapidly and absorbs moisture, air, and light readily, while the rock expels them. But they both combine and transform elements in just the right proportion to reproduce, perpetuate, and color their species. The one purpose in life for centuries was as simple as that of the lower animals and plants the simple aim of self-preservation and of the production of descendants. Human beings were contented with the simplest organic function, nutrition and reproduction. Hunger and love were their only motives for action. For a long period they must have aimed at the one single object of self-preservation. In the root of our ancestry specific lines were traveled and specific characters established. We lose neither the one nor the other, for both lines and character are projected from generation to generation. The lines, although invisible, are never broken, nor are they ever abruptly changed to other type expressions. Neither are the characteristics ever lost, though they continue to project from generation to generation down through the ages. We may distill, analyze and compound all the elements that are used as conveyors or vehicles in the process of constructive energy and we will not find the element that will produce a nut a plum or even as much as a mustard seed unless we send the energy into condensation over character lines as constructive molds that must first be established character lines are invisible tracks over which and through which nature is ever pressing into constructiveness every element and thing of creation from the plane of the fungi to that of the intellectual and spiritual man. In the highest form of expression the principle of attraction is expressed in love. It is the one universal principle that equally governs the seemingly involuntary affinities of minerals and vegetable substances, the passions of animals and the loves of men. The law of love is a piece of pure science and the oldest and simplest form of love is the elective affinity of two differing cells. Above all laws is the law of love, for love is life. Progress being the object of nature, and altruism the object of process, the book of life is found to be a love story. End of part 28